Final Fantasy is many different things to many different people. With 16 widely varied mainline games, this alone makes it one of the longest running, highest selling, most critically acclaimed, and most heavily discussed video game series of all time. And Final Fantasy is not just 16 games. With countless spin-offs, sequels, and other multimedia entities, the world of Final Fantasy is vast. It is a true behemoth of the gaming landscape, and it has been for quite a few years now. Yet, amidst so many games, so much history, and so many memories, I think it's easy to overlook just how much this series has achieved, and how much it's changed. Final Fantasy has come a long way, and that, more than anything else, is what I want to talk about. These 16 games say a lot about how video games have evolved, how the gaming industry has changed, how the Japanese role-playing genre was shaped, how it flourished, and how it declined. And I love this series. The flaws of these games are abundant, and sometimes surprisingly consistent, but within them are so many highs, so much innovation, and so much originality, that I do wholeheartedly believe that not only is Final Fantasy worthy of being considered as one of the greatest series in gaming, but that it might even be deserving of more praise than it already receives. This video is an entire series retrospective, covering all 16 mainline entries. I have played most of these games multiple times. Some of them I have played four or five times, one of these games I have played for somewhat more than that, but most importantly, I have recently played each of these games consecutively over the last two months. And while a lot of people have talked about this series already, I don't think many people have ever played all of these games back to back over such a short time frame. So it may come as no surprise then that I have a lot to say about Final Fantasy, particularly how the series has changed, what each game manages to accomplish, and what was lost or sacrificed along the long and still ongoing 36 year journey this series spans. This video will mostly avoid spoilers, but there is some discussion of plot points, so if you want a completely unspoiled and blind experience for any of these games, you may want to skip over those parts of the videos. Also, I do occasionally get noticeably vague about certain plot points, but that's because I'm trying to avoid spoiling things. Anyway, on to the 80s. There is an oft-told story about how Final Fantasy was created that frames it as a last-ditch effort of a struggling company who put all their hopes, dreams, and remaining money on this one final game. Hence the name. Unfortunately, as poetic as this telling of events might be, it's not entirely truthful. Square was a Japanese software developer established in 1983 who created a number of early PC and Famicom titles spanning a diverse range of genres. One of the company's early hires was a young programmer and university student by the name of Hironobu Sakaguchi, whose work and work ethics impressed those in the company, leading him to become one of their four project leads in 1986, the same year that a certain landmark RPG from developer Enix first released. Dragon Quest took inspiration from a number of PC games, particularly the Western RPG series Wizardry and Ultima, to create a more accessible and console-focused take on the genre. In doing so, Dragon Quest helped to create the Japanese console role-playing genre, more commonly referred to as the JRPG. As a result of its daring and innovation, Dragon Quest saw slow initial sales from an audience unsure what to make of this new type of game. But in time, its sales picked up, and then exploded, with 1.5 million copies being sold in Japan alone, making it one of the highest selling Famicom games not published by Nintendo. Meanwhile, Sakaguchi, who was also a fan of Wizardry and Ultima, used the success of Dragon Quest to persuade Square to greenlight an RPG of their own, 
that he would take the lead on. Despite this, Square remained skeptical of the project and limited its development team to initially just five people. And yet for Sakaguchi, this was finally an opportunity to work on the genre he most wanted to, where he could focus on the aspect of game design he was most passionate about, storytelling. And one year later, in December of 1987, Final Fantasy was released. For Sakaguchi, this may well have been his final game, as he made preparations to quit game development and return to university in the event that the game was a failure. But this wasn't how the series came to be named. In fact, the original title was meant to be Fighting Fantasy, which was only changed due to copyright concerns, with Final being chosen as a replacement, primarily because Sakaguchi wanted to maintain the abbreviated name of FF. Meanwhile for Square, the success of Final Fantasy would forever change the company's trajectory, and they were experiencing severe financial difficulties at the time of its release. Yet whether Final Fantasy ever had the potential to be Square's final game remains unclear, and it wasn't their only commercial success of the year. Still, in the end, Final Fantasy was far from a failure, and came to represent more of a beginning than an ending for Sakaguchi and Square both. Final Fantasy begins with a short text crawl, explaining that the world is in peril, and that a prophecy has foretold of the arrival of four warriors. This leads directly into character creation, where you create your party of four. Once the game begins in earnest, you find yourself in the town of Corneria, where you're soon tasked with rescuing a princess from the Night Garland at the Temple of Fiends to the north. This is only the beginning of your grand adventure, but it is indicative of the level of storytelling found in Final Fantasy's first entry. The game's various NPCs do provide a little more detail, and help explain the problems each town is experiencing. Yet the primary purpose of an NPC in Final Fantasy 1 is not to enhance the narrative, but rather to provide the player with hints and reminders of where to go and what to do. For a console game of this era, this still presented more story than most games had, but the main reason for this narrative brevity was mostly the data limitations of NES games at the time, which limited the amount of text that could be stored on a game's cartridge. This was one of the largest problems early JRPGs faced, and was a major contributor for the streamlined approach pioneered by Dragon Quest that ended up setting Japanese RPGs on a different path from their Western inspirations. Final Fantasy I was a more complicated game than the first Dragon Quest, however, with a significantly longer runtime, party members and multiple enemies instead of 1v1 fights, and more spells, equipment, and items. As a result of this complexity, combined with the NES's technical limitations, Final Fantasy I put a lot of important information in its manual. Manuals were important to many older games, in a way that younger generations may not realise. Forget floppy disks and VHS tapes, kids don't really need to know what they were, but the same cannot be said about manuals, as they were often a part of the intended experience and provided incredibly helpful information, as Final Fantasy I demonstrates. This manual is over 80 pages long and provides a complete tutorial of all the game's important mechanics, from creating your party to fighting enemies, saving the game, navigating menus, and much more. Still, it also provides crucial tips that even experienced JRPG players might overlook, like buy potions and run away from dangerous encounters, as well as a complete world map, an enemy chart including enemy stats, weaknesses and special attacks, explanations of what each spell does, something not told to players in-game, statistics for each piece of equipment, something else not displayed in-game, dungeon maps for the game's first four dungeons, and finally, a complete walkthrough for the entire first half of the game, right up to getting the airship. This is a lot of information, perhaps even too much, as this is the manual created for the American release, which is noticeably twice the length of the Japanese one, and really went above and beyond with providing players with as much helpful information as possible. This is because in the late 80s, console players weren't used to games like this, or games with an equivalent amount of complexity, 
and Final Fantasy 1 clearly wanted to be an accessible experience that could be enjoyed by players new to the RPG genre. And for the most part, it succeeded, even if its over-reliance on its manual is far from ideal. I feel a little bad for any 80s or early 90s kids who lost some of these inserts or maybe borrowed this game from a friend and had to play it without knowing things like what each spell does or how much attack each weapon has. Still, for as much as Final Fantasy 1 wants to be accessible and tries to help players, make no mistake, this is not an easy game. Combat in Final Fantasy 1 is turn-based, with random encounters found on the overworld and in dungeons. And right outside the very first town, you can run into monsters who can one-shot your party members. Also, monsters in this game like to travel in packs, have a fondness for inflicting status effects, and sometimes ambush you. This combination can be particularly deadly, and the world of Final Fantasy 1 feels dangerous, far more so than in later games in the series. This is mostly because you can only save the game at an inn, or with an expensive tent on the overworld. Healing is also limited as spells have limited charges, and for much of the game, you won't have enough money to buy all the spells and equipment you want, limiting your supply of gold and, by extension, restorative items. This means that with every step you take further away from the safety of the inn, danger increases, healing and hit points diminish, and the tension gradually ramps up as dying becomes more and more likely at the same time that the loss of progress from death becomes more and more costly. One of the most important lessons players can learn in this game is knowing when to turn around so you can make it back safely to the inn before disaster. The other vital lesson players must learn is the importance of the run option. Some combat encounters are too dangerous, or simply take too many resources to overcome, meaning fleeing is the best option. This goes against the convention of modern game design, where the option to flee exists for the player's convenience, and enemy encounters are deliberately designed to be an appropriate and beatable difficulty. Meanwhile in Final Fantasy 1, encounter difficulty is more varied, and some combinations are meant to be overly difficult, with fleeing existing to provide a necessary strategic option. And when you've gained the wisdom to know when to turn back, and the humility to know to run, then, and only then, are you ready for Marsh Cave. AKA, the hardest dungeon in the game, and one of the hardest in the entire 16 game series. Marsh Cave is the first dungeon in the game, if that wasn't clear, and while it takes a while to get here, this is where the difficulty of the game peaks. Final Fantasy 1 basically has an inverse difficulty curve, where you struggle a lot and feel weak early on, and then grow in power at a faster rate than your enemies do, making you feel very powerful later in the game. This can be quite satisfying, provided you make it through Marsh Cave, aka the hardest dungeon in the game. There are people who will tell you that Final Fantasy 1 is a game where you are meant to grind, and these people aren't wrong, but they aren't entirely correct either. Final Fantasy 1 is a game where you can, and many people do, grind. This allows you to bypass much of the risk inherent in the game's rather punishing design by killing monsters in the relative safety that comes with staying close to a town where you're never far from the ability to save and heal, and then only heading to the next dungeon when you feel sufficiently prepared and powerful. Still, there is an alternative to this, which feels more like the way the game is intended to be played, where you head off to your objective, whatever that may be, and then turn back when you first start to run low on resources. In doing this, you'll still gain experience points, like when grinding, while also learning the ins and outs of dungeons, memorizing the floor layouts, picking up treasure from side paths, and gaining familiarity with the enemies you encounter so you know things like when to run or when to use your limited AoE spells. For a bull-bustingly difficult dungeon like Marsh Cave, where your resources are pitifully limited and you can't even use magic yet to quickly teleport to a dungeon's exit, 
you'll probably have to run back many times before clearing the dungeon, and the risk is so high that you may just be better off killing enemies outside of town, at least to get you started. For the remaining dungeons in the game though, grinding near a town usually feels like a slower, less efficient, and less enjoyable way to play. Attempting dungeons without grinding allows your limited resources to act as a natural difficulty check, where if you're strong enough you'll make quick progress, and if you're not, the repeated trips back to town will lead you to naturally acquiring more gold and experience points until you are. This structure of reaching a town, struggling to overcome the next dungeon before eventually beating it, leading to the next town and the next dungeon where there's better equipment and more powerful enemies, shows the heart of what Final Fantasy 1 is really like, and reveals an important fact that isn't often acknowledged, which is that Final Fantasy 1 is basically a dungeon crawler. It might not resemble more modern examples, and it doesn't take long for the Final Fantasy series to move away from this, but dungeons are the main focus of this game. They are where you spend the vast majority of your time, they are why there is such a large emphasis on resource management, and they are why this game is still enjoyable 36 years later. And Final Fantasy 1, the NES version, is still enjoyable. Unlike so many JRPGs, including most of the Final Fantasy series, and especially some of its best entries, in Final Fantasy 1, normal combat encounters are strategically engaging. This is largely because you can't just spam auto attacks to overcome every basic encounter, as Final Fantasy 1 lacks auto targeting. This means that if you tell all your party members to attack one enemy, and the first party member kills them, then the next three party members will waste their turns doing nothing rather than automatically targeting the next available enemy. And if your party members waste their turn, you will kill enemies more slowly, meaning enemies get more opportunities to attack you, causing you to run out of resources faster and have to retreat back to town. Therefore, it becomes crucial to spread your attacks out while trying to understand how many hit points each enemy has and how much damage you're likely to do so you can do this as efficiently as possible. There is an element of risk and reward to this too. If you fail to kill an enemy because you didn't assign enough people to attack them, they will survive and get to attack you, but assign too many people and you waste characters' turns through overkill, and so you're forced to think carefully about who you tell your characters to attack, even in basic encounters. The combination of managing auto-attacks using your limited spells at key moments, knowing when to turn back or flee, and prioritizing dangerous or low health enemies, all comes together to make an engaging and enjoyable combat system, where the more you understand your enemies, the better you'll do, and where every combat encounter feels meaningful as your limited resources ensure you want to prevent as much damage as possible. I'm not going to say Final Fantasy 1 has the best combat in the series, because it doesn't, but it is one of the more strategic games in the series, and for a game from 1987, it might surprise you. Still, being such an old game, from a time where the genre was still young, it also has its share of problems, and some are significant. Like the prevalence of bugs, which is not too surprising considering the game's age, but several spells simply don't work, and the intelligence stat is bugged so it doesn't affect spell damage, making magic less impactful the further into the game you get. This leads on to another problem, which is class balance. Final Fantasy allows you to create your own party out of six different classes, and this helps create strong replayability and is one of the game's most unique features. However, magic users, and particularly the Black Mage, feel rather weak, and for physical damage dealers, the fighter is far superior to the thief and monk, and as there are no unique class abilities, this means there's little reason to take a thief or monk. Fighters are expensive to buy equipment for, so there is at least one downside to them, but overall the high imbalance is quite noticeable and a bit disappointing. And when it comes to balance, Certain ambushes can feel downright unfair, 
with enemies capable of inflicting one-hit KO style status effects before you even get a chance to act. And as it may be a long time since you've last saved, this can be pretty frustrating. Still, the biggest problem Final Fantasy 1 has might just be that it's rather slow. From the combat, which can have a lot of enemies and a lot of individually appearing text boxes describing every action, to the sedate walk speed of your character, or certain annoying design choices like having to buy and use potions individually, which ends up being a surprisingly substantial time sink. Final Fantasy 1 is just not a fast-paced game, and it's here it shows its age more so than in its actual game design. In other ways though, Final Fantasy was ahead of the curve, and if it looks old by today's standards, it certainly didn't at its time of release. JRPGs which came before Final Fantasy, like Dragon Quest, Digital Devil Story, Megami Tensei, and Fantasy Star, all featured front-on first-person combat screens showing only your enemy. Final Fantasy, however, was the first game to use a side-on perspective, showing not only a vast array of detailed enemy sprites, but also the player's characters, who had animations for attacks and spells, and altered appearances to reflect being injured, suffering from status effects, or being knocked unconscious. This, in many ways, marked the beginning of the Final Fantasy series' heavy emphasis on presentation, and its long-running desire to one-up its competition in visuals. And compared to other RPGs of its time, Final Fantasy's side-on view does make it seem more visually engaging. Another thing that began here was many of the series' most iconic pieces of music. From the instantly recognisable Victory Fanfare, to the calm, inviting prelude, or the still heavily used series' main theme, Long-running and widely celebrated series composer Nobuo Uematsu's soundtrack did much to bring Final Fantasy's world to life. By later game standards, Final Fantasy 1's soundtrack is short, with just 19 tracks, meaning certain pieces will be heard many times. But certain tracks, like the Chaos Shrine, still stand out even with the NES's more rudimentary sound limitations. In other ways, however, this is not the Final Fantasy later fans would come to expect. The story does involve four elemental crystals, which were localized as orbs, that the player is tasked with restoring, but there are no chocobos or moogles or summons, and much of the world and its inhabitants have more in common with Dungeons and Dragons than Final Fantasy, and feel slightly generic as a result. For example, the three friendly non-human races you can encounter are dwarves, elves, and dragons, while enemy encounters feature a lot of commonly seen western fantasy foes, like goblins, ogres, skeletons, and vampires. One series tradition that is present is the player gaining an airship, which provides one of the game's best moments and most unique features. Before this, the player progresses through the overworld in a largely linear fashion, and while you do gain a normal ship and a canoe to aid with traversal before this, the airship allows you to travel the entire world at high speeds with no random encounters. The freedom this provides is liberating, and it's an exciting moment even today, let alone in 1987. Through various modes of transport, the player's adventure has them traveling the world to restore the four elemental orbs and defeat the four elemental fiends, who are causing so many of the world's problems. And this tends to feel rather standard and a bit forgettable. Still, Final Fantasy does have one last surprise in store for the player that in many ways feels like a sign of what is to come from the series, as after restoring the orbs, the party must travel through time 2,000 years into the past to fight Chaos the one who was responsible for sending the four fiends forward in time to the present. This involves a time loop paradox the player has to close 
and involves you journeying into a floating sci-fi inspired fortress. And there's even a surprise twist over Chaos's true identity. And after such a rudimentary story in such a generic setting, this is a bold departure into unexpected territory, which shows that the storytelling ambitions of the series were alive and present, even in its first entry. Defining what makes a Final Fantasy game a Final Fantasy game is no easy task in a series that has changed so heavily, but one of the most essential factors seems to be a desire to go beyond traditional fantasy and what is normally expected, whether through setting, storytelling, or specific plot elements. This is a point I'll return to, but I think it's significant that even here, in this first game, which at times feels so much like a run-of-the-mill D&D clone, there is still something deeply Final Fantasy about its story and setting by the ending. And that is Final Fantasy 1. It was a fantastic effort for its time, and it's still an enjoyable game to this day, if more as a result of its challenging and strategic gameplay than its somewhat shallow story. Final Fantasy 1 would be very successful, particularly in North America where it did much to establish the JRPG genre, and it wouldn't take long before Square and Sakaguchi would create a sequel. Before that, however, I think I need to at least address the issue of remakes and remasters. Almost every Final Fantasy game has been released multiple times, and there are often significant changes between versions, particularly in regards to difficulty and translation, two massively important factors. I have so much to go over in this video already that I'm only going to talk about different versions of these games when it seems really important, but it does have to be said that different versions of these games are different. When it comes to Final Fantasy 1, for example, a new version was made for the Wonderswan Color in 2000, which was more of a complete remake than a port, and it was this version that would serve as the basis for almost every version released after. The changes this version made were huge, and go far beyond visuals, with more story scenes, a lower difficulty, and the addition of auto-targeting, and in later versions an empty system for spells and a new localization. In short, these completely changed the heart of the experience, and whether this is a change for the better is debatable and mostly down to individual preference, but it's important to understand that it is a change. Also, for every game in this video, I am talking about the original version exclusively, unless otherwise specified, and certain design elements that I will both criticize and praise can sometimes end up being changed in later versions of these games. So, moving on to Final Fantasy II, the Famicom version, that is. Final Fantasy I's success almost guaranteed a sequel, but rather than continuing the story or setting of the first game, as most series do, the team decided to create something entirely new instead, beginning Final Fantasy's most important tradition. For this second game, Sakaguchi wanted to place more emphasis on story, and many of its design decisions would be informed by this focus. And in December 1988, Final Fantasy II would be released, just one year after its predecessor. Still, unlike the first game, this time there would be no English or NES version, as the localization of the first game took so long that Square decided to skip ahead to focus on localizing Final Fantasy IV for the next generation Super Nintendo instead. As a result, Final Fantasy II wasn't released outside of Japan until it received a PlayStation 1 version in 2003, which is a very late time to be releasing a PS1 game. This meant its legacy and reputation in the West is rather different than the first game, but we'll get to that in time. Final Fantasy II begins once more with a familiar white on blue text crawl, but even from this first screen, there are signs that the story will be a little more interesting this time. You're told that the world has been plunged into war as the Empire of Palamecia seeks to conquer all with monsters summoned from hell, 
You are part of a resistance force that has recently fled from their home kingdom of Finn, with the four main characters each having lost their parents to the war with the Empire. Then, after naming these four characters, the game begins with you on the run, being pursued by the Empire's Black Knights, who waste little time in cutting you down in battle. You then awaken in a nearby town after being rescued by the rebels, or at least three of you do, with the last being presumed to have not made it. From here, you try to join the rebels, who initially turn you down as a result of your youth and inexperience. Still, after discovering that one of the rebel generals has betrayed them and defected to the Empire, you join the resistance forces officially and then spend the rest of the game assisting the war effort. This is one of Final Fantasy II's greatest improvements. In the first game, your objective of restoring the four orbs and defeating the four fiends felt generic and little more than an excuse to send you to different dungeons in different parts of the world. Meanwhile in Final Fantasy II, what you do shapes the story and often has a tangible impact on the world itself. One early objective has you travelling to the far north in search of Mithril, which you ultimately find and bring back to the rebels. This then updates all of the rebel shops, allowing you to purchase powerful, albeit expensive, Mithril weapons and armour. You also infiltrate enemy towns, sneak on board and sabotage a colossal enemy warship called the Dreadnought, try to enlist the aid of the Dragoons of Deist and the Sages of Mycidia, and storm the Castle of Finn to take back your kingdom, which leads to the rebel forces permanently changing position. Some of these objectives can be surprisingly creative and exciting, like when the rebel princess is captured and replaced with a fake, with the rescue effort taking you to a coliseum where you get caught and forced to fight in. Or how when you approach the Mycidian Tower, you find your ship is swallowed by the great sea beast Leviathan, leading to a dungeon inside Leviathan's stomach as you search for a way to escape. Still, the player isn't the only actor on this stage, and just as your actions sometimes change the world, so too does the Emperor's, as many of the towns you journey through will end up destroyed by the Empire in retaliation, killing most of the NPCs you meet in the process. In fact, a lot of people die in this game, from numerous party members, to helpful allies, to entire populations. Final Fantasy II's story is about war, and in it, war is bleak, it destroys and it corrupts. Through the course of a narrative you must continually struggle, and everything comes at a cost. And then, even after your ultimate triumph, there's still no such thing as a happy ending for our party, as the scars left behind by these events are shown to remain. And there's a sense of thematic cohesion to all of this. This is a story about sacrifice and tragedy, and the nature of war. Basically, that war is hell, and so it seems fitting that the game concludes with you having to descend into the depths of hell to defeat the one responsible for all this destruction all over again. And I think this is quite impressive. This game released in 1988, and I can't think of many other console games from that period that deal with subject matter like this anywhere near as effectively. Still, as impressive for its time as it might be, this story is notably brief, once more likely as a result of text limitations, and when it comes to characters in particular, it struggles to make a strong impression. For the first time, your party members have default names and in-game artwork to help bring them to life, but they don't have much by way of personality, and party dialogue is very rare. I mean, Guy does speak Beaver. And that is definitely better than nothing, but other than speaking to Beavers and telling you he speaks to Beavers, I don't remember Guy ever saying anything else. And while this is enough to make him more likeable than some Final Fantasy characters, overall, characters, both NPCs and party members alike, still feel very lacking here compared to later entries. Nevertheless, compared to the first game, 2's story is a major step in the right direction, and this is not the only improvement this game makes. Presentation has seen numerous upgrades, from the more detailed towns that now have actual shop interiors, 
to the animation in the overworld with rippling water and flying overhead airships, or the improved combat screen that removes a lot of the borders and text boxes to create something much more visually appealing. NPCs can also move about during dialogue now, and there's lots of great new enemy sprites, although I do think it's a bit disappointing that the main character reuses the same warrior sprite from the first game, when this is arguably the most important sprite in both of these games, and even a simple colour change could have done a lot to differentiate them. Alongside the visuals, Uematsu's soundtrack also feels improved, with a few really memorable tracks, like the hopeful and rousing Rebel Army theme, the sombre Game Over theme that's also used during character deaths, and the series' best dungeon music yet in Castle Pandemonium. Final Fantasy II is also the first game to feature numerous series staples that help make the setting feel more like its own thing than a copy of Dungeons & Dragons. Amongst these are the main series mascot, Chocobos, the first helpful engineer named Sid, the spell Ultima, Dragoons and the name Highwind, and numerous classic enemies like Malabros, Bombs, Flans, Behemoths, Iron Giants and more, which also brings some appreciated diversity to the gameplay in normal enemy encounters. And gameplay has also seen other upgrades. Final Fantasy II introduces the row system to combat, something that would go on to become a series staple. This allows you to position more vulnerable characters in the back row for a defensive boost at the cost of attack. But it also adds to the tactical side of combat, as enemies behind the first two rows are now untargetable by melee attacks, creating a new benefit to having access to magic or ranged weapons to focus fire back rows, while also increasing the element of risk and reward that comes with no auto-targeting, as it becomes more important than ever to not leave enemies alive in the front rows, as they will prevent you from targeting enemies behind them, potentially creating wasted turns. The inventory system is also much better this time around, as having limited spaces solves the time-consuming potion span problem of the first game, while having a shared inventory is far less restrictive when it comes to equipment. In one, equipment was separate to normal items, and you only had enough spaces for equipment as could be equipped on each character meaning to pick up new equipment later in the game, you had to destroy something you're already using first. And as you can't be sure what you're picking up, you either have to risk ending up with a downgrade, or risk leaving behind new equipment. Which is truly terrible design. By contrast, two system is much more functional and user-friendly, although the lack of stacking forces you to sell items continuously, and key items annoyingly take up one of your limited inventory slots permanently. Final Fantasy II also introduces an MP system for the first time, and allows you to save anywhere on the overworld without needing a specific item. Finally, one of 2's more underappreciated improvements might be its overworld. There is something appealing about the gradual linear progression you make in the first game, which ultimately culminates in finding the airship and gaining complete freedom. Yet this is something that becomes very standardised as the series goes on. Final Fantasy II's overworld, on the other hand, might arguably be described as a genuine open world, where most locations are accessible even very early on, and the only thing standing in the player's way are the numerous dangerous enemy encounters that surround these locations. This means you can skip ahead to many later locations, sometimes getting powerful equipment upgrades in the process, as long as you can survive the perilous journey to get to them. This general openness provides a much stronger sense of exploration, while the dangerous enemies make it feel more alive and exciting, and the less linear and more natural structure make it a bit more immersive and believable. It may lack the interesting late game elements of games like Final Fantasy V, VI, or even the first game, but overall, it's definitely one of the most unique overworlds in the series, and makes me wish that this open structure was attempted again in the future.
In other ways though, this is a similar game to its predecessor, as once more the main bulk of the experience is spent dungeon crawling, and once more, dungeons are large, punishing, and feature elaborate layouts that are difficult to get through in a single attempt. The difficulty curve is rather different this time however, as while 1 starts hard and gets easier, 2 starts much easier, thanks in part to the more generous MP system and the magic of an early guest party member, but then gets progressively harder, as dungeon length starts to increase, eventually extending far beyond anything seen in the first game, with the final dungeon featuring a total of 14 floors without any opportunity to save. And just as in the first game, status effects and ambushes can still be deadly, making actually completing Final Fantasy II a much more challenging and potentially frustrating endeavour than the previous game. By NES standards, the difficulty of Final Fantasy II doesn't seem that out of place, as this was an era where players didn't expect to easily complete every game they bought. By modern standards, however, Final Fantasy II can easily be seen as being overly punishing and unfair, even more so than the first game. To top things off, a complete overhaul of the progression system means grinding to get stronger is a lot less straightforward this time, and it's here we get to Final Fantasy II's most controversial feature. Unlike so many RPGs, Final Fantasy II doesn't have experience points, with advancement instead coming through skill use and what happens in battle, in a system a bit like the Elder Scrolls series. To understand this, it's best to divide this system into two parts, weapons and spells, and then stats. Weapons and spells are quite simple, in that they increase with use. For example, the more you attack with a sword, the higher your sword skill becomes, and the more you cast individual spells, like fire, the higher level that individual spell becomes, making it more effective while also costing more MP. This works reasonably well, and follows a believable set of logic, as people do tend to get better at something the more they practice it. That said, this can be very restrictive for magic users, as while spells you gain access to early on will level naturally through use over your playthrough, many spells won't be found until later, and yet these still start at level 1, making them completely ineffective until time is spent leveling them up, and that takes a long time. This forces players to either use only a very small selection of spells, which makes combat less interesting as you'll always rely on the same options, or to spend a long time grinding spell levels just to be able to use late game magic. And overall, this feels like a downgrade from the previous game's magic system. Still, the most controversial element of Final Fantasy II is how it handles stat advancement. Stats have a chance to increase after fights based on certain events that happen in combat. For example, physical attacks provide a chance to increase strength whereas defensive stats increase through taking damage. As a result, many players try to manipulate this system to gain more stat increases, and this seems to often lead to people hating the game as a result of the slow and tedious gameplay this introduces. Some players might also be put off by the complexity of the system, or dislike feeling like they need to understand something so atypical. Luckily though, there is a secret solution that not many people know about, which is just play the game normally and everything should be fine. Really, the best way to understand Final Fantasy II's stat system is to think of it almost as an anti-grinding system. Enemies each have a hidden rank based on their difficulty, and the higher the enemy rank is compared to the party's perceived level, the more likely stat increases are. Also, the formulas which determine stat growth ensure that stat increases become more likely the more actions are repeated in a single encounter. This means long fights against difficult opponents provide much faster stat growth. Meanwhile, grinding against easy enemies does very little. In this way, the system is somewhat realistic, as it makes sense for characters to improve most by fighting challenging enemies. And as a result of this system, it means that the more you fall behind, the more you'll struggle in fights, 
and so the more your stats will increase. Whereas the more you grind or manipulate the system, the less natural stat increases you'll end up getting. Except it's actually even worse than this, because one of the main ways people try to grind in Final Fantasy 2 is by attacking themselves. This can lead to big HP increases very quickly. However, max HP isn't particularly useful, and in fact there are several important attacks in the late game which damage you for a percentage of your max health, making high HP bad as you'll take more damage and have a harder time healing yourself. Still, the real problem with attacking yourself is that it can never lead to stat increases for the most important stat in the game, evasion. And as you'll then spend less time in normal fights, you'll be attacked less overall, and your evasion will end up lower than average, making you more susceptible to the most dangerous attacks in the game. If all this sounds confusing, then it is, and clearly that in itself is the real problem. Final Fantasy II's progression system has plenty of rough edges, and pretty awful balance, but it fundamentally works, and the main reason people hate it so much is because they try to manipulate the system, often without truly understanding it, in a way that's often tedious and possibly not even helpful. There is a lesson here though, which is that complexity in games can be dangerous as it leads to player confusion, unintended manipulation, and resentment from people for being different to what they expect. Meanwhile, gaining experience points and levelling up works pretty well. Players get to make constant progress, level ups feel rewarding when they happen, and the familiarity of this system means players don't have to worry about understanding its intricacies, or anything really, you just kill enemies and get stronger, just as the Lord intended. And despite the fact that Final Fantasy II is not nearly as broken as some people try to make it out to be, its progression system also doesn't bring many advantages. It is open-ended, but rather than creating numerous unique character builds, you really only have a choice of characters being physical damage dealers, magic users, or some hybrid of the two. Also, while any character can learn any spell, the spell advancement system still discourages both variety and experimentation. And while there are lots of spells and weapons to choose from, some are just far better than others, as balance is still all over the place, with swords being by far the most useful weapon, shields being amazing compared to dual wielding, heavy armor being weaker than other armor, leveled instant death spells being far too strong, and other spells not even working. Much like Final Fantasy 1. Still, while Final Fantasy 2 might not be some hidden masterpiece of RPG design, it does feel incredibly unlucky in just how harshly it's been received by fans. The reality was that unlike Final Fantasy 1, there was no nostalgia to help win this game acclaim in the West, and after the meme of attacking yourself in combat to level up faster spread in the early 2000s, thousands and thousands of Final Fantasy fans simply played the game wrong and hated it as a result. And I guess you can't blame them. Still, with time, this negative appraisal seemed to grow, until the meme stopped being about the progression system and started being about the game itself, with people who hadn't even played this game still repeating and spreading this idea that it was the worst in the series, while rankings and game websites would always list it in last place as it was the only game that you could put last without offending anyone. I guess what I'm saying here is that Final Fantasy II deserves better. Even if you do hate the progression system, this game still makes numerous improvements over its predecessor, with much improved presentation, a stronger soundtrack, improvements to combat, needed quality of life enhancements, and more. And as for its story, this is where the idea of Final Fantasy being a story-focused series began, and if Final Fantasy VII deserves so much credit for what it achieved by the standards of 1997, or Final Fantasy VI for the standards of 1994, or Final Fantasy IV for the standards of 1991, can people truly claim that Final Fantasy II doesn't deserve at least a little credit for what it achieved with its story as a game 
from 1988. But that's the thing with Final Fantasy 1 and 2. Both stand apart from the rest of the series for their emphasis on dungeons and difficulty. Both are old games. Both have a lot of rough edges. Both rely on having access to the game manual to explain things. Both feature numerous bugs, poor balance and overly punishing design. And yet Final Fantasy 1's problems always seem to be forgiven as a result of its age. And yet the same courtesy never seems to be given to 2. As if 1 is a game judged by the standards of 1987, whereas 2 is doomed to always be judged as a game that people first played in 2003. I guess I should admit, Final Fantasy 2 is my favourite of the NES trilogy, and to me the exaggerated hate is somewhat representative of the problem with Final Fantasy discourse overall. Still, as much as I like this game, I can't quite claim it is the best of the NES Final Fantasies. In Japan, Final Fantasy II sold more copies and received better reviews than the first game, ensuring a sequel was inevitable, and after a somewhat rocky development, Final Fantasy III released in April 1990 at the very end of the NES's life cycle. Just like Final Fantasy II before it, it would be many years before this game would see a release outside Japan, but unlike the previous games, Final Fantasy's third entry came on a larger 512 kilobyte cartridge, which was almost double the size of the last two games and would allow a number of visual upgrades, like an opening credit sequence. The first thing you see however is still the now familiar text crawl, which this time tells once more of a world of crystals recently hit by an earthquake and four warriors of light who must stand against the coming darkness. In many ways, Final Fantasy 3 is a sequel to Final Fantasy 1, not 2. This can be seen in the similarities between its premise and setting, in the return to a class or job system, in certain gameplay elements like the use of limited spell charges and tiers rather than MP, in the more linear and vehicle-gated design of its overworld, and in its less serious story that is more of a whimsical fantasy adventure than the dour war epic of the last game. That said, Final Fantasy III does have some new features of its own, the biggest being undoubtedly auto-targeting. This means that you can order all characters to attack a single target, and if that target dies, the remaining party members will attack the next available enemy instead of skipping their turn. Auto-targeting is a massive quality of life improvement, and something expected by most JRPG players, and yet with this addition, combat is fundamentally changed from something where you have to think about what to do, even in normal enemy encounters, to something where you usually don't. Over the years, I have seen plenty of people say they dislike turn-based games and or JRPGs because they're filled with easy encounters where all you do is spam the attack command without any semblance of strategy, making such encounters boring. For the Final Fantasy series, this game is where that criticism starts being true, as with auto-targeting, most normal encounters just come down to spamming attack where this is not only a viable strategy, but often the optimal one, as it's better to focus your attacks on a single target to kill them quicker, and as long as you don't take so much damage you need to emergency heal in combat, it's also better to wait to heal until after combat's finished. This is of course a somewhat reductive description of Final Fantasy III's battles, just as it is for later Final Fantasy games, or other JRPGs, or turn-based games. There are still moments here where you might need to do more than just have everyone attack the same target. There are other in-battle commands, as well as magic, and times you might prioritise different targets to the first available. There are also times when things go wrong and you need to react. There are ambushes and back attacks. There can be dungeon-specific or enemy-specific mechanics to deal with, and so on. But on the other hand, for most battles, and by that I really do mean the vast majority, you can just switch your brain off and spam the A button until combat's over. So the question is, was this a good change? The answer to this question probably depends on how you ask it. Ask whether simple combat where you just spam A is good game design, and people would say no, 
But if you ask someone whether auto-targeting was a good addition, they'd probably say yes. And even though these answers seem to contradict each other, people aren't really wrong. Quality of life improvements do generally improve the user experience, it's just that they also tend to leave holes in that experience by reducing what the player is being asked to do. In the case of Final Fantasy III, auto-targeting was a good addition because for most players, seeing their characters lose their turn is frustrating, particularly if it's something you're not used to. However, where this game fails somewhat is by not adding enough new strategic elements to make up for what auto-targeting takes away. Having to think carefully about who to attack and how many hit points enemies have isn't the best way to add strategy to combat, and it's certainly not the only way, but that was something it achieved, and without it, something is lost. Some people may not care about that loss, and that's fine. There are people that just want to switch their brains off a bit in normal fights and only pay attention in boss fights, and prefer this more relaxing experience and there's nothing wrong with having that preference. It isn't what I prefer, but the reason I'm focusing on this is not to try to imply that this is a terrible change, but just to draw attention to the fact that by adding auto-targeting, there is a change here, and it's a surprisingly significant one. Still, even if the strategic side of normal combat is largely diminished in much of the series from here on out, there are two other areas that will see massive improvements boss fights, and progression systems. And Final Fantasy III is the first game to really show this. In 1 and 2, bosses tend to come across as just normal enemies with higher stats, and while some might have certain elemental weaknesses or higher physical or magical resistance, that's about as in-depth as boss strategies ever got. Final Fantasy III, on the other hand, feels like the first real attempt at making bosses that are unique and require specific actions from the player. For some bosses, like Garuda, this can seem overly specific, as the strategy just comes down to using the one class the game wants you to use to counter them. But some other bosses are better. Hein has a mechanic where he absorbs all elemental attacks except for one that he's weak to, and then he switches his elemental weakness over time. Odin is structured as a DPS check and race against time, and many of the late game bosses hit hard and hit in different patterns to keep you on your toes as you try to outheal their attacks. By the standards of later games, this still might not seem that impressive, but it is a clear improvement for its time, and the same can be said for the progression system. Final Fantasy III allows you to change a character's class to any of the jobs you've unlocked. At the beginning of the game, you only have access to some familiar jobs from the first game, Fighter, Monk, Black Mage, White Mage, and Red Mage, but more jobs become available as you progress through the game, and by its conclusion, there is a grand total of 22. This provides a lot of different combinations and player freedom, and a similar system to this will be used to great effect in later Final Fantasies. With that said, the job system in Final Fantasy III is much closer to that seen in Final Fantasy I than the widely praised version in Final Fantasy V. In one, you undertake an optional challenge after gaining the airship, which unlocks advanced, more powerful versions of each job. Meanwhile in three, you basically just unlock advanced versions multiple times, while always having the option to change your original choice. Unlike in later games, there's no benefit provided from leveling up one job which can be transferred to any other, and there's no way to customize individual jobs. Also, while different jobs do have some different in-battle commands, including series staples like Guard and Jump, these don't tend to have much impact, and many later jobs just feel like better versions of earlier ones. For example, the Knight is a better fighter, the Black Belt is a better monk, the Devout is a better white mage, and the Magus is a better black mage. Other jobs like the Geomancer, Scholar, or Bard do feel more unique, but they also feel rather weak and are often outclassed by pure physical or magic users. What's more, while the game provides a lot of openness through the job system, it's not anywhere near as generous with its provided equipment, and for many classes, equipment is everything. As a result, your choice of job ends up being determined by what equipment is currently available, 
rather than the player's choice. For example, the Water Crystal unlocks four new physical focus jobs, the Viking, the Black Belt, the Dragoon, and the Mystic Knight. Yet, both recent equipment shops and the next couple of dungeons only contain equipment for Vikings and Black Belts. For Dragoons and Mystic Knights, you find neither weapons nor armor for them until several hours later when you reach specific sections where the game wants you to use these classes to kill Garuda for Dragoons and to kill Dividing Enemies for Mystic Knights. And it's not only new classes that sometimes don't get any new equipment, as Final Fantasy III also tends to stop providing gear for older classes, forcing you to abandon them whether you want to or not. The Knight does provide one exception to this rule, and magic users are less equipment dependent, but for a game seemingly designed around player freedom, it's amazing just how restrictive the provided equipment ends up actually being. Still, while this is a far cry from the job system of Final Fantasy V, it is still more open and exciting than what was seen in the previous games, and this job system did a lot to make Final Fantasy III stand out for its time. The final area of significant change in III is its dungeon design. Final Fantasy I and II feature long, sprawling, and at time labyrinthian dungeon layouts that are actively hostile to players, with trap tiles or trap rooms. By contrast, Final Fantasy III's dungeons feature far simpler layouts, with short and often linear floors that have minimal branching paths and obviously placed treasure chests. What's more, while dungeons in 1 and 2 could take multiple attempts and several hours to overcome, dungeons in 3 can usually be completed in a single attempt in around half or even a quarter of the time of last games, right up until the final dungeon, which increases the difficulty dramatically in a sequence that feels like it's been ripped from the end of the previous games. Still, except for this fiendish finale, this creates a very different player experience that feels like an important step for the series. If Final Fantasy 1 and 2 were dungeon crawlers, Final Fantasy 3 is something new. It's a classic JRPG adventure, where dungeons may still be a part of the experience, but are no longer the point of the experience. In time, this would come to be standard for Final Fantasy and JRPGs alike, with Japanese dungeon crawlers continuing to exist as a more niche and hardcore subset of the genre. Still, for Final Fantasy III, this creates an easier and much more forgiving player experience that could be seen as less interesting, but after 1 and 2, also feels refreshing and enjoyably fast-paced. You race through dungeon after dungeon as you move through this story, seeing more of the world and always feeling like you're accomplishing things. This increased pace also applies to the combat, as encounters feature fewer enemies, and damage numbers now appear on screen rather than in text boxes, ensuring battles take less time. And yet, despite Final Fantasy III being faster than the last games, it's not a shorter game, because this time, there's just way more of it. As with Final Fantasy I, III's best moment comes after acquiring the airship, but this time, instead of just gaining the freedom to travel the overworld, you can now travel beyond it as it turns out that the world in which this game has up until this point taken place in is actually a continent floating in the sky, and there is a second, just as large world waiting to be discovered somewhere beneath it. I can only imagine how exciting and surprising this must have been to players when this game first released, and this type of second overworld is a feature seen again in several future games. Still, it's through this second overworld that you can really start to see the big advantage this game has over its predecessors. I have mentioned it already, but Final Fantasy's third installment was developed for the 512 kilobyte game cartridges that had started to be used at the end of the NES's life. This meant it was twice as large as the previous games, and the greatest challenge early JRPGs faced were the strict data limitations. But now those limitations had been expanded, and Final Fantasy III makes sure you know it. There is far more text in this game, less information is left to the manual, the soundtrack is just as high quality as 2's and yet twice as long, the dungeons feature far more visual diversity and look much more appealing, and of course, the overworld and the amount of locations are basically just doubled.
It's a bit like getting a next-gen Final Fantasy, just without the next-gen part, but it does make 3 feel very impressive for an NES game. Still, if there is one area that didn't benefit much from this increased file size, it is the story. After being chosen by the crystal to restore balance to the world, our four heroes journey through the floating continent, getting into mishaps and helping its inhabitants, usually with problems related to the recent earthquake mentioned in the prologue. After your adventure takes you to the world below, you discover that a powerful mage named Zand is the one responsible for many of the world's current problems, and that he is seeking to use the power of the crystals to create a flood of darkness. For the most part, this is familiar stuff, taking the concept of the four elemental crystals from the first game, while focusing on an almost cosmic balance between light, dark, and the void. Where Final Fantasy III feels stronger is in its episodic narratives, which make up for their lack of depth or believability with their light-hearted sense of adventure. Really, Final Fantasy III is a game which doesn't take itself that seriously and doesn't want the player to do so either. And while there's nothing wrong with this in itself, it does contrast sharply with the last game. I think this is best shown through each game's NPCs, because if there is one thing NPCs love doing in Final Fantasy III, it's dancing. Whereas in Final Fantasy II, NPCs were a lot more focused on dying. But changing from what came before is a very Final Fantasy thing to do. Overall, 3 is a remarkably solid game. The first and second Final Fantasies are in some ways more interesting. They combine aspects from older PC RPGs with aspects that would come to define the JRPG genre. They offer excitement and challenge, but also frustration and tedium. And while each is similar to the other, it's much harder to find other JRPGs that are similar to them. Final Fantasy III, on the other hand, feels like it lays the foundations for so much of what is to come, and feels like many of the games which will follow in its footsteps. Because of this, you could make an argument that this is the single most important and influential game in the entire series, and the point where Final Fantasy, as most people know it today, was born. It is a little strange then that of all mainline Final Fantasy games, this is probably the one that is the least played and least talked about outside Japan, which is because of its localization. While 2 had to wait until 2003, Final Fantasy 3 wouldn't see an English release until even later, and when it did, it was by way of a full 3D remake for the Nintendo DS in 2006 that made many changes. This means that non-Japanese players didn't get any official way to play something resembling the original version of this game until the Pixel Remaster in 2021, which is remarkable considering this game's importance. Still, better late than never, I guess, and at least fans wouldn't have to wait anywhere near as long for the next instalment. After the success of Final Fantasy III, development began on both Final Fantasies IV and V simultaneously, with IV being designed once more for the Famicom. However, following the launch of the Super Famicom, alongside financial constraints at Square, the original Famicom Final Fantasy IV ended up cancelled, as all focus shifted towards creating the first next-gen Final Fantasy. And in July of 1991, it was complete. For the first time in the series, Final Fantasy IV begins with an opening cutscene featuring airships flying over the world. New Super Nintendo Mode 7 graphics are used here to give an impression of depth, and this is far from the only way that Final Fantasy IV takes advantage of its generational jump. From more detailed sprites that feature a wider colour palette, alongside a lot more animations to make characters more unique and expressive, to improved visuals in dungeons, which now include curved lines, areas of different elevation, and advanced background effects, to improved battle visuals that now feature fully drawn backgrounds, or just the many benefits that come from a further increase in data limits, Final Fantasy IV lives up to its 16-bit expectations and feels like a massive step for the series. <laughs> 
When it comes to the actual game design, however, improvements aren't quite as clear-cut, with this being best exemplified by 4's most impactful addition, ATB. Active Time Battle replaces the turn-based combat of the previous games, but a better name might have been Active Turn-Based, because the characters still take turns, and many people might still view this as a turn-based game. This combat system was intended to be a hybrid between action combat and turn-based, with the designers wanting to move towards a more action focus for the series, but feeling that full action combat would be too big a departure. As a result, ATB keeps the same foundations of the battle system, but features an invisible gauge that fills over time to determine when characters can act. This brings several benefits. There's a sense of novelty to this new system. It gives battles a more engaging presentation, making things a bit more alive and cinematic as characters act continuously without waiting around for the player's commands, and it adds an element of timing which can be used in a number of creative ways to facilitate specific boss strategies, while adding a further constraint for the player as you must now decide each character's actions as quickly as possible. Because of this, ATB is more challenging than a conventional turn-based system, in much the same way that a game of chess is more challenging when played with a clock. With all that said however, what ATB doesn't do is help fill the lack of strategic depth that came from Free's introduction of auto-targeting, because most battles still boil down to just having everyone attack the first available target. And when you do deviate from just auto-attacking, the challenge is rarely strategic, as it's less about making the best decisions, and more in executing your decision quickly by navigating the game's often cumbersome menus. What's more, a lot of strategy games function through giving players more information so they can use this information in their decision making. This is why some games will display things like hit and crit chance, or even enemy intentions. However, ATB is a system that removes information from the player, as it becomes much harder to know when enemy attacks will happen, or when spells will be cast, or which party member will act next. This problem isn't as bad in future games, but in Final Fantasy IV, actions don't really occur when you select them because the game needs to wait for animations to play out, meaning both player and enemy actions end up becoming queued and delayed. Spells in IV also have a cast time, but rather than this timer being consistent, it seems that spells have been designed around a priority system where normal attacks trigger before spells, which also applies to enemy attacks. This means that sometimes you might choose to use a healing spell and it happens almost straight away, but other times it gets continually delayed behind other player and enemy actions until it might be too late. The net result of all this is a lot more unpredictability to combat, which sometimes feels a little random and messy, and going straight from Final Fantasy 3 to 4 makes 4's combat feel more dated than 3's was. You may think then that Final Fantasy IV must be a more frustrating game than its predecessor due to this new challenging dimension to combat, but perhaps luckily this isn't the case, because the overall difficulty of IV is quite a bit lower, particularly in the original English version, meaning the consequences of ATB-induced problems are quite small. This was of course the first attempt at this combat system, and some growing pains are understandable. However, for many years now, I have seen people describe ATB as an objective upgrade to conventional turn-based combat, and while some games do a better job at implementing ATB than others, and people are entitled to have a preference for one system over the other, claiming that this is an objective improvement just seems wrong. I think this idea came about because Final Fantasy moved from turn-based to ATB, and then kept using ATB for a long time, meaning that many people's favourite Final Fantasy games use this system, and if these games moved from turn-based to ATB, how could ATB not be better? However, if ATB really is the superior system, I have to ask, how come JRPGs made over the last 20 years don't use it? Because one thing you never hear people say is, Persona 5 is a good game and all, but what it really needs is ATB. Or insert any other highly regarded turn-based JRPG there instead. In fact, even throwback JRPGs inspired by games of this era 
don't seem to use ATB anymore. And that's true both for those made by indie developers and those made by Square Enix themselves. I sometimes think the greatest trick that Final Fantasy ever pulled was convincing the world that ATB is a better version of turn-based combat. Anyway, that's enough about ATB. For now at least. Even if Final Fantasy IV's active combat is really more of a mixed edition than a clear upgrade, there are still other changes that are better. IV's bosses continue the trend started by three, but go much further, making use of both the intricacies of the ATB system alongside many more unique mechanics that can make boss encounters feel like puzzles the player has to work out. Some examples include the Mist Dragon, who changes between its dragon and mist form and then counterattacks if you hit it in its mist form, Kagnazo, who needs to be interrupted with lightning based attacks when he surrounds himself with water, the three sisters who need to be killed in the correct order to prevent them from resurrecting each other, or the iconic Demon Wall, who moves slowly towards you and kills the party when it reaches them to create a full on DPS race that can be made a lot easier by using the slow spell. Overall, Four's bosses are much better than previous games and set a standard that is often matched but rarely surpassed even by later games. Four also begins the tradition of providing save points before bosses, which helps reduce tedium from dying while helping to facilitate this more difficult and strategic boss design. Dungeons have also received attention to more than just visuals, as while they're a similar difficulty to threes, their more open and branching layouts make them a lot more interesting to play through. One of Four's most improved areas is the soundtrack, which is still by Uematsu, yet is more than twice as long as Final Fantasy III's and packed with memorable tracks, that are also able to benefit from the much more advanced sound chip of the Super Nintendo. Standouts can be hard to pick amongst such a stacked selection, but it's the character themes that are the first to come to my mind when I think Final Fantasy IV. Rosa's well-known theme of love. Or the upbeat optimism of Sid's theme. Or the innocence of Rydia's. or the dark foreboding of Golbez's. And on the subject of characters, this is where Final Fantasy IV makes its biggest improvements. Up until this point, even the named and portraited characters of two were still largely left as blanks to be filled in by the player's imagination, and one and three offered even less. But 4 is the first game to give every party member a defined and clearly expressed personality, and seeing these characters interact adds a lot to the enjoyment of the story and how invested most players will feel. If this alone was the only noteworthy thing about 4's cast, it would already be an impressive step for the series, but 4 goes far beyond just giving its characters personalities by also creating some strong character arcs, introducing a greater focus on narrative set pieces, creating the first memorable villain of the series, and skillfully communicating parts of its story and characters through the use of gameplay. The best known example of all this comes from Four's main protagonist. At the start of the game, Cecil is a dark knight in the service of the Kingdom of Baron, who is returning from a mission to steal the elemental crystal of the neighbouring kingdom of Mycidia. At the game's opening, Cecil is conflicted and we see him questioning the morality and consequences of his recent actions. On his next mission, he's sent to deliver a ring to a nearby village, but upon reaching it, the ring is revealed to summon a number of monsters who kill the village's inhabitants, leaving a young girl named Rydia as the only survivor. Upon seeing this, Cecil decides to turn against his own kingdom, vowing to stop them while taking Rydia into his protection. However, where Sissel's story truly shines is when he finds himself having to return to Mycidia, the kingdom he attacked before the start of the game, where he finds himself hated by its inhabitants for his earlier actions. 
It's here Cecil seeks to grow and find the strength needed to do good in the world, and so he climbs the nearby mountain of ordeals to cast off the darkness within himself and become a paladin. And atop the mountain, Cecil does find the power of paladins, but he also finds a dark reflection of himself, who steps from the mirror to initiate a boss fight, which can only be won if the player truly embraces the way of the paladin by doing nothing. You only win this fight if you don't attack the enemy, because Cecil can only become a paladin if he accepts his guilt over his past actions and the darkness that resides within him. And this is a great moment that uses gameplay to communicate both character and themes. This is Final Fantasy IV's best known character moment, but it's not the only one. Rydia joins the party as a child and is only level 1, meaning she knows no useful spells and is incredibly vulnerable in combat. And so, just as Cecil is trying to protect her in the story, so too must the player protect her during gameplay. Eventually, Rydia grows stronger, learning a useful range of black magic, but one spell she doesn't learn is fire, which is revealed to be because of a hate of fire she developed after seeing her village burn to the ground. And later, we see her learn to overcome this to help the rest of the party. And then there is Tella, an elderly sage who has started to forget some of his spells in his old age. Tella's arc centers around the forbidden magic, Meteo, which he wishes to use to defeat Golbez, yet can't remember how to cast. And Meteo exists within Teller's in-game spell list, yet it requires 99 MP, while Teller's max MP never rises above 98, leaving it always just out of reach, frustrating the player just as it frustrates Teller. Until the moment where he finally confronts his nemesis. And speaking of Golbez, this is the first good villain of the series. The Emperor from Final Fantasy II was an important character, unquestionably evil and somewhat intimidating, and yet you never see or interact with him until you finally confront him near the end of the game, where he still only has a few lines of dialogue. Still, you never feel like you know much about the Emperor, and between you and me, I'm not even sure Emperor is his real name. Golbez, on the other hand, is present and has presence. You interact with him frequently, and you're not just told that he's a villain, you see this for yourself. He also has a great character design and theme, which for JRPG villains is sometimes all you need. Finally, one last area of improvement for makes is how its story is integrated into the overall experience. Before, dungeons were dungeons, and as a result, all story moments either occurred at the end of a dungeon or outside of them. Now, however, there can be story segments and character interaction during dungeons, making the story feel more seamless and improving pacing. Final Fantasy IV also includes some gameplay segments outside of dungeons or the overworld, like the defense of the Kingdom of the Ball, which can be seen as an early attempt to create narrative and action set pieces, something future titles would focus heavily on. Still, while IV makes many improvements in its story, and does offer the best narrative in the series up until this point, it is still an old game, and it does have some obvious problems. The most egregious being the actual translation. This is a game from a time before translation was taken seriously by the gaming industry, and as such, its original English translation wasn't done by a professional translator. However, unlike so many other Japanese games of this era, including the earlier Final Fantasy I, this was a game where story, and by extension, the translation, are vital to the overall experience. One of the main problems the translator for this game faced was needing to convert the game to English without going over data limits, as English uses notably more characters per word than Japanese does. This means the script had to be greatly reduced, but there are further problems than this, including a number of translation errors and many lines that just read awkwardly, and this poor writing does pull the overall story down quite a lot. The localization changes don't just apply to the English script, however, 
as Square also wanted to lower the difficulty and complexity for non-Japanese audiences who had no chance to play Final Fantasy 2 or 3 and were likely less experienced with RPGs. As a result, the enemy damage was significantly reduced, several character abilities were fully removed, and hidden passages aren't quite so hidden in this version. Throughout the Final Fantasy series, you can find examples of questionable localization and translation decisions, but Final Fantasy IV is easily the worst affected. Of course, this isn't really IV's fault, but there are further story problems that are. Firstly, some plot points still feel overly cliché or contrived, like when Rosa suddenly becomes ill and you need to find a specific pearl from a nearby dungeon to heal her. Meanwhile, towards the end of the game, the story starts feeling a bit… convoluted. Final Fantasy IV has a lot of twists, revelations and dramatic moments, particularly over character deaths and betrayals, where it often turns out that things aren't as you initially thought. Yet this happens again and again and again. I will admit that I do love the unexpected trip to the moon, which is just fun, and stands out as such a quintessential Final Fantasy moment. Still, in its totality, this story does probably take things a little too far with the drama and revelations, beginning another series tradition of somewhat convoluted endings. Still, Final Fantasy IV does get a lot of things right, so much so that it can be easy to forget just how old this game is and how much of its narrative problems often simply reflect or are still ahead of the standards of the era. Final Fantasy IV's storytelling was an important step for the series, and its better aspects, like its characters, still hold up strongly today. But for Final Fantasy on the Super Nintendo, this was just the beginning. Final Fantasy IV had relatively modest sales in Japan, in part because of the Super Famicom's smaller install base, but it did perform solidly outside Japan, where it was the first Final Fantasy since the original, leading it to be renamed Final Fantasy II, in a move to avoid player confusion that would later backfire spectacularly. Still, the next Final Fantasy would be even less fortunate, as while it released soon after 4 in Japan, in December of 1992, it would once more not receive an international release until much later. And I've always felt this was a great shame, because to me, Final Fantasy V is the first truly great game in the series. At first glance, V looks a lot like its predecessor, as it lacks the major jumping visuals seen in certain other installments. There are also similarities between the two games in terms of world structure, pacing, and the combat system. Final Fantasy V does make some subtle improvements in presentation though, like in how it uses a range of different out-of-combat animations and expressions, which make its story scenes more dynamic, or in its improved menus and interface, which finally include more detailed item descriptions and the full stats for equipment. Still, if improvements to visuals are small, the same can't be said about the gameplay, thanks in large part to the triumphant return of the job system. One of the best things about the Final Fantasy series is its willingness to experiment and innovate, but Final Fantasy V presents a compelling counter-argument. Much of V's job system is the same as it was in 3. There are more jobs this time, but once more you unlock them in groups as you progress through the game, and many of them are just the same as before. This time though, equipment is less job specific and much more readily available, preventing 3's heavy railroading. Each job has also been expanded with more unique abilities, including some that are out of combat, like the Thief's ability to see hidden passages or sprint, or the Geomancer's ability to spot or avoid traps. What's more, later game jobs are no longer designed to be stronger versions of earlier ones, with each job feeling like it has its own distinct and viable role. Still, the biggest change to the job system is how you can now equip a single ability from any other job you've previously leveled. For example, if you level up a black mage and then switch to a white mage, you could equip the black magic ability to have access to both types of magic while you continue to level as a white mage. <laughs> 
Jobs still level up for a system of ability points that you gain in addition to XP, but now jobs gain more abilities as they level up. And in the late game, you can switch back to the Freelancer, which is the game's starter job, and equip any two abilities of your choice while getting the passive bonuses for every class you've reached the max level in. This means not only can you freely experiment between the game's 23 different jobs, but you can also experiment with different combinations of job abilities. And then in the late game, you can utilize abilities from every job you've maxed, providing you with even more options. This system is deep and rewarding and creates great replayability, and this has benefits to all sorts of other areas of gameplay. Progression is more interesting as you gain job levels and new abilities in addition to normal level ups. Combat is more interesting because you have double the number of options in battle, and you can customize what those options are. And boss fights are more interesting because if you reach a difficult encounter, you have the option to customize your party's jobs to try to overcome it. For some examples of all this in practice, I think it's helpful to look at a white mage in Final Fantasy 3 compared to 5. White mages are a classic and almost necessary class in many Final Fantasy games, as you usually need healing. Therefore, in Final Fantasy 3, I switched one character to a white mage early on, and then stayed a white mage for the rest of the game, because I always needed healing, right up until the final group of jobs were unlocked where they switched to a devout, which is just a better white mage, and the only exception to this was switching to a Dragoon for the Garuda boss fight. So not only did this character almost never change job throughout the game, but they were also boring to play. A white mage exists to provide emergency healing in combat, and to top the party off outside of combat. In boss fights they're usually essential, but outside of boss fights, i.e. for 99% of combat, they do almost nothing. Their auto attacks are virtually worthless, and even if they do eventually get some non-healing spells, these usually aren't worth using because MP needs to be saved for healing. Meanwhile in Final Fantasy V, my designated main healer once more began their career as a white mage, but then when I reached the second set of jobs, they switched to the much more interesting summoner, while still keeping access to all of their white magic. Then after maxing summoner, they switched back to finish leveling white mage, but instead of using the summon ability to retain access to summon magic, I instead used the cool summoner ability, which casts a summon spell at random for no MP cost. This meant they could still contribute in battles using cool, while still dedicating all of their MP to healing. Then when I came to a challenging section or boss, I swapped cool for summon, as conserving MP became less important than being able to control which summon I actually used. Then when White Mage was maxed as well, they swapped to the hybrid Red Mage for its strong final passive ability, equipping white magic for boss fights and summoning magic during normal dungeon sections. Finally they finished their illustrious career as their chosen endgame class, having full access to all white magic, all summon magic, and the powerful Red Mage skill double cast. And of my four party members, this is the character that changed job the least. Overall though, this is such a big difference to the average experience of Final Fantasy 3, and it's a much more enjoyable one. Meanwhile for boss fights, anytime you struggle you have the option of changing jobs or abilities, which provides a lot more depth to the strategy involved. For example one of the early game bosses, Garula, was destroying my fairly standard party of a knight, thief, white mage and black mage with its strong damage output. Maybe this was because I was doing something wrong or was just slightly underleveled, but rather than being forced to grind to overcome this as I would need to do in previous games, I simply swapped my black mage to a second white mage and tried the fight with two dedicated healers, which is what I like to call the MMO strategy and then suddenly the fight went from impossible to easy. And that's a great feeling. A lot of the gameplay in Final Fantasy games from this point onwards are at their best when they give the player lots of different tools, 
and then leave it to the player to try to work out which of these tools are good, or what ones might help them when they get stuck. And different games do this in different ways, but 5 is one of the best. And 5's gameplay improvements don't stop here. While the English version of 4 was fairly easy, 5 isn't. In fact, this must be the hardest Final Fantasy game outside of the NES trilogy, and the NES games were mostly hard due to a lack of save points. 5 on the other hand gives you the same amount of save points as 4 or later games, but then just doesn't pull its punches in normal encounters or boss fights. And this overall higher difficulty forces the player to fully engage with the job system, while making dungeons feel much more exciting because they're actually dangerous this time around. 5 isn't on the same level as 1 or 2, where running out of resources occurred constantly, but it is a step closer to that, making even normal encounters feel like they have meaning because the threat of running out of MP makes you want to win battles as efficiently as possible. And this is a threat that you feel regularly, as you never know where the next save point will be, meaning that even if you won't actually come close to running out of MP, you don't know that until you find that save point and can breathe a sigh of relief. This was also true in 4 to some extent, but the higher difficulty of 5 makes it much more effective. And 5's dungeons don't just bring difficulty. This game easily has some of the most varied dungeons in the series, with almost every one having their own distinctive visual design and most having some type of unique mechanic or challenge. From the classic damaging floor tiles, to puzzle-like navigation mechanics, floors you can fall through, timers putting you under extra pressure, enemies that chase you, sections where your party gets split into two groups, or just really nice visuals, every dungeon seems to have at least something making it unique. And this is such a step above both games that come before and after. That is partly because the series will soon move away from dungeons in general, but regardless, Final Fantasy V is still the Dungeon King, and it deserves its crown. And as if things couldn't get any better, V also makes two massive improvements to the ATB system. The first is the addition of bars showing each character's turn progress, which provides the player with useful information to plan their actions around, and will come to be included in every future Final Fantasy game with ATB, including every future version of IV. The second improvement is that the ATB gauge now pauses during character actions, while removing spellcast times entirely, meaning that the delay seen in 4's system is removed, making combat more responsive, predictable, and fair. And to go alongside all these gameplay improvements, 5 is also the first game in the series to feature a more fleshed out endgame, with plenty of optional dungeons and content that can be found in its very open third overworld. It also includes what I consider to be the first optional super bosses in the series, which are encounters designed to be much more difficult than any boss in the main game to truly test dedicated players' abilities. Warmech from Final Fantasy 1 might disagree with this claim, but sorry Warmech, you'll have to make your own video because I don't think you really count. Still, 5 doesn't do everything right, and its story in particular doesn't really reach the same heights as its gameplay. After somewhat reluctantly answering the call to adventure, our protagonist, Bart, is joined by three other characters, with the group soon investigating and then trying to save four elemental crystals after the crystals choose them as their protectors. Along their journey, you see how these crystals are harnessed and even exploited as sources of power by humanity, as well as the problems caused by their destruction. Still, the group is ultimately unsuccessful at saving the crystals, which leads to a powerful sorcerer from another world named Xdef being freed from his prison. Xdef then defeats the group and returns to his original world, but the group pursue, learning more about Xdef, the crystals, and the nature of these two worlds in the process. That was a rather brief synopsis and Final Fantasy V is notable for being around twice as long in runtime than 3 or 4, with about twice as much dialogue and story scenes. However, hopefully from just that limited synopsis, you might start to see what V's main problem is.
Once more, this is a story about elemental crystals. Once more, our party of four are chosen by the crystals. Once more, most of the world's problems are caused by the crystals being in trouble. Once more, there is a big powerful villain behind the crystals' destruction. And once more, this eventually leads to a whole other world. Basically, Final Fantasy V shares many plot elements with Final Fantasy I and III, and to some extent, IV. When Final Fantasy III revealed its second overworld, it's a great moment and feels genuinely surprising. IV, however, also had a surprise second overworld, in addition to the moon, and so V's revelation that it too has a surprise second overworld doesn't really feel surprising by this point, so much as it does formulaic and expected. And even some of the more minor elements, like the presence of dwarves saying Lally Ho, just feels like something you've seen before at this point, because you have, in Final Fantasy 1, 3, 4, and now 5. Meanwhile, when it comes to characters, 5 is in many ways a step down from 4. 5's cast are easy to like. Each character has a sympathetic backstory, and is shown to be kind and heroic in nature, and each character gets much more screen time than the average party member did in 4, with Five's cast feeling much more like a group of real friends. However, while they're easy to like, they're also difficult to love, as no character feels particularly unique or shows much character development, making them ultimately a bit forgettable. As for the story beats that drive this narrative, there is arguably a greater sense of ambition here even than in 4, but the execution of this narrative can feel weak. Once more, certain moments come across as rather cliché or contrived, and Five's more light-hearted tone can clash with the story's more serious elements. There are times when the party gets captured, or you take part in a large-scale battle against X-Death's forces, and the game always still feels like the same light-hearted adventure, with no real stakes or tension. This is partly because Five's presentation struggles to do these more serious or action-packed moments justice, and it's partly because neither the setting nor story feels especially grounded or believable. None of this is to say that Final Fantasy V's story is bad, it's just that it fails to go beyond being a fun light-hearted adventure despite clearly wanting to. And as a light-hearted adventure, it all feels a little overly familiar and formulaic this time around. There's nothing wrong with borrowing elements from past games as inspiration, and doing so is a major part of Final Fantasy's identity. But V doesn't seem to have many interesting ideas of its own, and this ultimately seems like the most disappointing thing about it. I think that the second world that you go to shows this quite well. This idea had been done before, but it's still an opportunity to do something unique and surprise people. The second world could be something completely different, both to the first world and to everything else that had been done in the series up until this point. However, when you get there, the second world is basically just the same as the first. The visuals are similar, the inhabitants are similar and still mostly human, the monsters are similar, and even the atmosphere doesn't feel any different. The second world does play an important role in the story, so it's not that there's no point to it, it's just Final Fantasy V leaves me wondering why this story was chosen over any other. Still, any problems with the narrative aren't nearly big enough to stop Final Fantasy V from being a great game and the pinnacle of the Final Fantasy series up until this point. V iterates on one of the most popular aspects of previous games, the job system, while learning countless lessons from every other game that came before it to provide arguably the best classic gameplay experience in the entire series. It doesn't have the best story, the best soundtrack, or one of the biggest jumps in visuals. But good gameplay goes a long way, and Final Fantasy V nails the basics in a way that I'm not sure any other game in this series ever quite manages. And if V did show warning signs that the series might be running out of ideas, getting stale, or just playing things too safe, those fears would be short-lived. Final Fantasy V wouldn't get an English release until a PlayStation port in 1999, 
but the next entry fared better, and Final Fantasy VI ultimately released in both Japan and America in 1994. VI would be the first game not directed by Hironobu Sakaguchi himself, as Sakaguchi had continued to move up within Square, forcing him to take a less hands-on role in development through the position of producer. In his place, the role of director would be split between Yoshinori Kitase and Hiroyuki Ito, both of whom had worked on the series before, and both of whom would go on to direct further future entries. This was only the beginning of what set Six apart from the games that came before it, however. From the very first scene of its opening, it's clear something is different this time. The flashes of lightning against black skies and a darkened land immediately sets a tone that is much more ominous and serious than previous games. The intro continues by providing an overview of the setting, telling of how magic ceased to exist long ago after a terrible war, but now admits new technological advances, some are trying to bring magic back, leading to potentially dire consequences. This opening sequence is drenched in foreboding. More dialogue will introduce our first protagonist, Terra, although her exact circumstances are for now left a mystery, and then the opening credits play as the game flexes the full might of the Super Nintendo's technical capabilities and Final Fantasy VI's new more cinematic focus. The presentation of VI is a significant step up from V. Many environments feel more impressive, combat backgrounds now sometimes include animation, towns look more distinct with much more detailed building interiors, and VI now uses the same character sprites both in and out of battle, improving character visuals out of combat while also allowing for all battle animations to be used outside battles as well as all animations designed for the story to be used when needed in battles. Still, where Six really differentiates itself from previous entries is in its increased focus on story. The easiest way to understand how the Final Fantasy series changes over time is to break it into distinct eras. People usually do this by console, but I think a more helpful method is to divide them by game design. Through this, you get four different groups, which I tend to think of as the Early Era, the Classic Era, the Golden Era, and the Modern Era, but a more descriptive name might be the Dungeon Crawler Era, the Adventure Game Era, the Story Focused Era, and the Experimental Era. You can apply other qualities here as well, like difficulty, where the Dungeon Crawler games are hard, the Adventure games are a medium difficulty, and the story-focused games are easy. Or story, where early games have little, the classic era games have some, and the golden era games have lots. Or in progression and gameplay systems, where early games are more inspired by western RPGs, the classic games focus on classes and job systems, the golden era games have new and unique progression systems, and the modern games have entirely unique gameplay systems. And you can take this even further with things like directors, or composers, and so on. This graphic tells you a lot about how this series has evolved, but it can also be helpful to think of Final Fantasy 3, 6, and 10 as transitional games, where they show some qualities of the previous era, particularly in terms of visuals, while having more in common with the next era in actual game design, although often without going quite as far. Hopefully this visual is helpful, because it probably took me a while to make when editing this video. Despite however it might look, I am not a graphic designer. Still, there is another way you can visualise Final Fantasy's evolution, which is by lineage. Here, Final Fantasy 1 is the grandfather of the series, who has two very different children, Final Fantasy 2 and 3. 3 then became the more successful child, and had two children of its own, Final Fantasy 4 and 5, which both inherited a similar structure, difficulty and tone to their parent, while providing different takes on 3's primary feature, the job system, with 4 adding more characters, each class specific, and 5 staying with 4 characters, but instead adding to the job system. 6 then doesn't seem to be directly related to 3, 4, or 5, 
because it's not. VI is really the child of Final Fantasy II, inheriting its heavier focus on story, its serious tone, its more open and less class-based progression systems, and its rebels fighting against the evil empire story archetype. I don't know if people hate Final Fantasy II so much that they might view this as offensive, but the similarities are clear, and this shows Final Fantasy VI as less of a completely fresh take on the series, and more of a triumphant return to many ideas that were seen before and came to be forgotten after the success of III. And of course, you could extend this graphic further, where seven and eight would be children of six, but then the idea of a family tree seems less ideal, because it forces nine to be a product of incest, and nine doesn't deserve that. Though if you did continue this, Final Fantasy X and onwards would soon stop being direct descendants, but rather nieces, nephews, and first cousins once removed, and it would quickly get very messy. Just like real family trees when there's lots of incest involved. Still, hopefully these two graphics have provided a helpful perspective to view the series. The important part right now, however, is that Final Fantasy VI doesn't just have more story or a better story than previous games, it represents a complete shift in focus towards story being the main point of the game, for developers and fans alike. The single biggest improvement VI makes is probably its setting. Previous games could sometimes be too similar and too cliché, but they also didn't feel like they took their settings all that seriously to begin with. Six's setting, on the other hand, comes across as much more grounded, cohesive, and fleshed out, and its focus on a more industrial era of fantasy made it stand out against other RPGs of the time. Final Fantasy VI also goes to great lengths to integrate its story into the gameplay experience, by featuring more set pieces and further blurring the line between dungeon and story sequences. This helps the pacing while creating many of the game's most memorable moments, like finding the phantom train within a forest that you end up fighting your way through, meeting ghosts who can both help and hinder you along the way as your party members try to work out what's going on before eventually doing battle with the train itself the only way they know how. This ultimately forms its own self-contained mini-story within the broader adventure, rather than simply being just another gameplay obstacle to overcome. Final Fantasy VI also starts trying to be a bit more experimental with some of its gameplay segments, like when you're traveling on a raft down a river and make decisions about which direction to go, or when you participate in several multi-party, real-time strategy-esque segments that try to simulate bigger battles, or when you interrogate soldiers and play diplomacy at the banquet in Vector. And just as VI brings more interactivity, it also brings a sense of style that previous games have lacked. The most famous part of Final Fantasy VI is the opera scene. Here, one of our main characters, Celis, impersonates an opera singer in an elaborate plan for the party to get their hands on an airship. Here, Celis is wrestling with the romantic feeling she's developing for another character, Locke, alongside her conflicted feelings over her past as a general for the Empire and this is somewhat mirrored in the opera she's performing, where the Princess Maria believes that the man she loves has been killed in a war, meaning she has to marry a man she doesn't want to. But beyond that, there isn't too much more going on here. For how famous this scene is, it isn't telling an especially deep or meaningful story. But the level of presentation, on the other hand, is incredible. From the very first note, it makes an impression, and this continues with an almost 10 minute long, four part song that has real singing, or at least as close an approximation as can be achieved on the Super Nintendo, and it sounds phenomenal. Yet this opera isn't just a cutscene. After the first act, the player, as Locke, sneaks off to give Celis some words of encouragement, 
leading to some important character development, and then the player, as Celis now, must read the script ahead of her performance and then make the correct choices during it, before the game moves into an action set piece where the player, now as Locke again, has to stop a giant gate-crashing octopus, first by fighting above the stage, then fighting on it, before the opera concludes with the original plan to steal the airship. It's not the story itself that's so good here, it's how everything works together. Music, visuals, characters and action combined to create a set piece that made thousands of children all over the world feel like they were taking part in a real adventure at a real opera. Simply put, in 1994 this scene was in a league of its own, and it's precisely this type of thing that Final Fantasy would soon come to build its entire identity around. Final Fantasy VI is also the first game to receive a professional translation, courtesy of Ted Woolsey. He was still impeded by text limitations and a very short time frame, leading to several notable errors, but unlike Final Fantasy IV, the script no longer feels awkward, and is instead full of memorable lines that help bring these characters to life. And that's rather important, because characters play an even larger role this time round. Unlike many games in the series, Final Fantasy VI lacks a single main character. The game begins following Terra, who's being mind-controlled by the Empire and has rare magical powers. Terra then joins a group of rebels, where she meets the treasure hunter, Locke, and later the brothers Edgar and Sabin. But then the four get separated, with the game branching into three separate stories. Terra and Edgar continue to their original destination. Locke ends up infiltrating an Empire town and meeting and befriending the imprisoned Empire General Celis, and Sabin goes on a weird and wonderful adventure, making multiple new friends before everyone meets back up again as the focus returns to uncovering Terra's past and stopping the Empire. The group goes on to be joined by even more characters as the game continues, bringing the cast up to a total of 11 main characters and 3 optional ones. This is a lot, and yet each of these 11 characters has a clear personality, a detailed and usually tragic backstory, and for Terra, Locke, Celis, and Cyan, their own character arc and development. For many people, this large cast of characters is one of their favourite things about Final Fantasy VI, although so many characters does cause some problems, particularly in the game's second half. Firstly, it means that many characters simply never get to interact with many of the other characters, as the game can only focus on so many people, and there's only space in the party for four. And later, when the player does have the freedom to choose their party, the game tends to then avoid character dialogue entirely, because trying to account for and create unique lines for 14 different characters was presumably too difficult. And so instead, either no one speaks, or only the party leader speaks with generic, non-character specific lines. This can make the second half of the game feel much lighter on story, and leave several characters feeling underdeveloped. Still, the second half of the game itself brings many benefits, as it provides one of the most open and player driven experiences in the series. As the party continue their efforts to oppose the Empire, a different character, not in your party, experiences his own story. Kefka is introduced at the start of the game, complaining about the mission he's been given by the Emperor and ordering his lackeys to clean the sand off his boots. It turns out he's looking for Terra, but in his first encounter with our heroes, he's decisively outsmarted. Kefka isn't really the cleverest, or most powerful, or charismatic, or even most important of people. But he is persistent, evil, and insane. With time, Kefka's failures and his acts of villainy will grow, until at the climax of the story, where the Emperor seeks to claim an ancient powerful magic that will make his grip on the world absolute, Kefka betrays him, killing the Emperor, seizing his power, and permanently destroying the balance of magic, to plunge the world into ruin. And it is this world of ruin that the player wakes up to one year later, 
The Final Fantasy series had featured many surprise new overworlds up until this point, and 5 even does something similar with the antagonist changing the original world to make it familiar yet new. Still, this was the first time that a new overworld was first and foremost about the story, and here the player, as Celis, must start on their own to rebuild the party, searching the land for your past friends one by one alongside anything else that could help you defeat the now near godlike Kefka. How you do this, however, is left completely up to the player, as the entire world quickly opens up to you. Speaking to NPCs provides plenty of clues pushing you towards different locations, or giving you hints about different party members, but you can do these in whatever order you wish, and this degree of freedom and openness is virtually unmatched in the rest of the series. What's more, working things out for yourself here feels really rewarding. It's just a shame that the game's story and characters seem to take a back seat in this section directly as a result of all this freedom. Still, there are plenty of things that can be praised about Final Fantasy VI's story, and it's the first game in the series that truly feels like a complete package. The setting, the set pieces, the presentation, the characters, and the villain all come together to set a new standard for the series, and in many people's eyes, the entire genre. Final Fantasy VI's grand accomplishments don't extend to its gameplay, however. Maybe it should come as no surprise that focusing more on the story would lead to certain sacrifices, but going directly from 5 to 6 really puts into perspective just how many things 5 did better. Firstly, the job system is no more, and in its place is a more open system where you can teach characters magic through equipping Magicite, which allows them to learn spells over time. Characters also get a stat bonus on level up based on their equipped Magicite, but while this rewards a min-maxing approach, it also introduces a lot of tedium as it encourages you to keep track of your experience points and then equip the Magicite with the best stat bonus just before hitting each level up for the free and quite significant stat boosts this provides. This system is also completely open, meaning you can teach all characters all magic with no downsides, and this doesn't offer much depth as there's few meaningful choices to make here outside of which order to learn spells in. To help compensate for this, each character now has their own unique additional combat ability, and this does help set characters apart from each other. However, few of these abilities add much to strategy, with many just seeming like gimmicks. For example, Sabin's Blitz requires you to input sequences of button prompts to do attacks, while Cyan's Bushido requires you to wait for a bar to charge. Initially, these unique requirements do seem interesting, but these abilities have no MP or other cost and are more effective than just using the attack command, meaning you will be using these same skills every single turn, and waiting for a bar to slowly fill or inputting a long sequence of buttons soon gets repetitive. These abilities do have some great animations, and between different characters there is a ridiculous amount of combat animations in this game, but there's little reason to take advantage of most of these abilities as there's no reason to not just use your best abilities or spells every turn. And the large amount of extra animations also makes the ATB system feel more delayed and unresponsive. In past games, you couldn't just use your best abilities each turn, at least not with magic, because even in Final Fantasy 3, 4 and 5, dungeons still presented a form of overarching challenge where you needed to conserve MP to make it to the next save point. But Final Fantasy VI is the start of that not really being true anymore, because combat sections are shorter, and the game is so generous with MP that you very rarely run out in the first place. To make matters worse, a lot of dungeons in this game are just boring. The set pieces aren't, because they add variety and keep the story moving, but in between these set pieces is a hell of a lot of caves. Final Fantasy V had so much variety to its locations in both visuals and gameplay, but so much of Final Fantasy VI is just caves. If you're thinking, well, every RPG has caves, 
so to single Final Fantasy VI out for this is just being overly harsh, then I don't think you're aware of just how many caves are in this game. So let's go through them in likely order. Narsh Mine, South Figaro Cave, Mount Colt, Narsh Mine a second time, South Figaro Cave a second time, Crescent Mountain, then there is a long stretch of no caves, which is probably the best part of the game, and I don't think that's a coincidence. But then it's back to caves, with the Cave to the Sealed Gate, the Esper's Gathering Place, South Figaro Cave for a third time, Narsh Mine for a third time, the Yeti's Cave, Mount Zozo, the Cave in the Veldt, Ebot's Rock, the Phoenix Cave, the Cave underneath Figaro Castle, and then finally the most egregious of them all, Inside the Zone Eater. The Zone Eater is a giant worm who swallows you, allowing you to explore inside its stomach, where you find a cave. And that doesn't even make sense. This is too many caves, and there are far more cave-based locations than non-cave ones. And just as the visuals to these caves are boring, so too are the mechanics, as while there are some exceptions, most of these caves are just caves. Many caves in 6 also have a strangely high encounter rate, which can make exploring them even more of a chore. To give some credit to Final Fantasy VI, it does provide you with some of the deepest equipment options in the series, thanks to multiple equipment slots in addition to highly impactful relics. And I also think VI is a great example of the toolbox approach that can be seen in this era of Final Fantasy games, where designers basically provide you with loads of different options, through lots of abilities, spells and items, and then it's up to the player to experiment with this vast array of tools to find out which ones are actually effective and work for them. On repeat playthroughs, or when players simply look up online what the best options are, this can be rather boring, but I think the way this game was intended to be played is through a process of experimentation, and so even if different tools are unbalanced, the process of learning for yourself which tools to use still feels rewarding and provides some degree of challenge in itself. For the most part though, Final Fantasy VI is a pretty easy game, although the difficulty does increase a lot towards the end of the game thanks to a few memorable optional areas, as well as the final dungeon, where the player has to create three separate parties who all have their own route to overcome. This forces the player to utilise many characters they've probably been ignoring, while rewarding you for completing optional content in the world of Ruin, and this just feels like a great final test of the player's abilities and helps create one of the most memorable final dungeons in the series. It also creates a lot of tedium as you need to continually swap equipment between parties, but I still think this is worth it to create something this challenging and unique. And that is Final Fantasy VI, a huge step forward in terms of story and a noticeable step back in gameplay which rather sets the standard for the next generation of entries in the series, as while Final Fantasy VI might have pioneered the heavy focus on story, future games would take this even further. It would take three years for the Final Fantasy series to receive its next entry, the longest wait up until this point, and when it arrived in 1997, it brought many changes. A new console generation and moving from Nintendo to Sony, 3D graphics rather than 2D, the first game to feature a non-fantasy setting, character designs from Tetsuya Nomura instead of long-running character designer Yoshitaka Amano, and also many new players. Final Fantasy VII was the fourth Final Fantasy game to release in America, but it was the first to release in Europe, and the first to release on PC. What's more, both Square and Sony committed heavily to marketing the game, and as a result, a lot came to ride on its success as its budget far exceeded previous entries. This reflected a general trend within the gaming industry of games getting more expensive to make, but the Final Fantasy series embodied this to an extreme. Final Fantasy IV had a development team of just 14 people. By Final Fantasy VI, this team had grown to 60, and Final Fantasy VII had over 150 people working on it during its hectic one-year development, which, alongside heavy marketing, 
made it one of the most expensive games ever made. Square took a huge risk by putting so many resources into a single game and by making so many changes within that game. But this did, in the end, pay off. Final Fantasy VII opens with a computer-generated full-motion video cutscene, unlike anything seen in the series before. There are approximately 15 minutes of FMV across Final Fantasy VII's approximately 50-hour playtime. This gives us about one minute of FMV for every one hour of playing. Most of these scenes are short and show moments of action, often involving parts of the environment that the game's static backgrounds aren't able to convey. Some of these though, like the game's opening, show much more than this, like 3D character models, an establishing shot of a city vastly larger than any seen in the series before, and rapid cuts to a fast-moving train, giving a promise of the action that is soon to come. Much can be said about Final Fantasy VII's presentation, but perhaps the most important thing to understand is how much new ground it treads. The sprites of the last six games are gone, replaced by rudimentary 3D models outside of battle, and somewhat more sophisticated models in battle, where there is no longer a fixed side-on view, but rather different dynamically changing camera angles. The 2D pixelated backgrounds of the past are also no more, replaced with pre-rendered images that use a vast range of different perspectives to show different parts of the world. Both these 3D models and pre-renders show their age today, yet both were cutting edge in 1997, and that is the strange thing about Final Fantasy VII's visuals. This is a game famous for looking good by the standards of when it released, and famous for looking bad by the standards of the many years that have followed since. As we will soon see, it wouldn't take long for 3D graphics to move beyond this, yet this was an impressive step for its time, that did much to create a world more visually captivating and immersive than so many games that had come before. The pre-rendered backgrounds in particular added a lot of detail and uniqueness to the game's many locations, although Square's inexperience with this technology can easily be seen, with many backgrounds seeming confusing and at times not making it obvious where the player is meant to go. To help alleviate this problem, a toggle was added that shows the player's location and each background's exit, yet while this is helpful, it does rather detract from the immersion and can make knowing where to go too obvious, harming the sense of exploration. Still, whether someone ultimately prefers the late 2D of Final Fantasy VI or the early 3D of VII is really a matter of preference, with each having their own benefits and a very different feel. But this is still just scratching the surface of this game's differences. Perhaps the next most obvious is the setting. Previous Final Fantasy games had featured both sci-fi elements and more industrial technology, yet each game still felt, first and foremost, like traditional fantasy. Final Fantasy VII setting, on the other hand, can perhaps best be described as alternative modern day with high fantasy elements. Others have described it as cyberpunk or post-industrial science fantasy, but to me, it was never the cyber or sci-fi parts that made this setting stand out so much, but rather it's more normal parts. People going to work on a train and complaining about being fed up with their jobs. Sleazy bars, bright lights, sinister corporations, and the disappointing browns and greys of urban living. Most fantasy games are exciting because they're different to our world, but Final Fantasy VII was exciting because it was similar. This setting is relatable, and in many ways its heavy focus on overly powerful mega corporations and ecological damage to the planet has only increased its relatability in the years since. And yet, in other ways, this is absolutely still a fantasy game. The main character wields a sword bigger than his body, the enemies you go up against include all sorts of weird monsters, alien parasites, and huge skyscraper-sized organic mechs. And the game still takes you on a globe-spanning adventure that culminates in the player stepping up and saving the world. And it's this mix of fantastical and relatable, familiar and fresh, realistic and unrealistic, 
that all came together to make Final Fantasy VII feel like nothing that came before it. It's worth keeping in mind that in the 90s, most people hadn't even heard of anime, and in Europe, this was one of the first JRPGs even released here, which helped this already unique game feel even more remarkable. Still, in other ways, much of Final Fantasy VII's story was similar to previous games. In it, the Shinra Electric Power Company have rose to control much of the world through technology that allows them to drain energy from the planet. The player then takes the role of Cloud, an aloof and mysterious elite Shinra soldier turned mercenary who joins up with a group of eco-terrorists who are trying to bring Shinra down. So this is still a Rebels vs the Evil Empire premise, it's just this time the Empire is a mega corporation and the Rebels are terrorists, which is how you can tell this game was made before 9-11. From here, you meet and are aided by a diverse range of characters, including a girl with mysterious powers that Shinra wants to take advantage of, all while you clash with an evil and insane villain who has an agenda of their own that ends up involving destroying the world, or at least all life on it. This means Final Fantasy VII's story has a lot in common with Six's. Still, tropes are used and reused for a reason, which is that they're often effective, and Seven's wildly different setting helps make its story feel fresh despite any of these similarities. Final Fantasy VII also makes changes in how its story is told, mostly by taking Six's story-focused approach even further. If you were to take all of the game's story sections and remove all gameplay, as people sometimes helpfully do on YouTube, then Final Fantasy VI has about six and a half hours of story to Final Fantasy VII's 10 to 13 hours. Seven's overall runtime is only slightly longer, so this means its story to gameplay ratio has almost been doubled. The main impacts this has on the actual player experience is that Seven features a lot more character interactions, particularly per character, while moving even further away from traditional dungeons to focus on set pieces, and its story also gets a lot more complicated. The best way to describe the difference between Six and Seven's story is that Seven is where things get messy, which is both a strength and weakness. For example, in Six, characters have backstories, personalities, and sometimes character arcs, but these are often contained to short episodic segments, and when a backstory or character arc is over, it ends neatly, rarely being revisited. Meanwhile in Seven, character stories unravel gradually throughout the game, with many plot points being returned to, and characters themselves are more nuanced and flawed. Take Barrett, the leader of our terrorist group, who's introduced as hating Shimra, and in his own words, wants to save the planet. Yet it's soon revealed that Barrett cares little about the consequences of his own actions, and that his terrorism has caused many innocent people to lose their lives, something another party member later directly confronts him over. And while Barrett claims to be motivated by saving the planet, we later learn that he's mostly driven by revenge. Meanwhile, his hatred for Shinra is compared and contrasted to another character from his past, who ends up consumed by hatred, leading Barrett to start re-evaluating his own path, and as the story progresses, his motivations gradually shift from getting revenge to creating a better future for his adoptive daughter, and protecting the people that he cares about. Barrett's character arc is strong, and his flaws and the greater detail Seven provides helps to humanize him. Although Final Fantasy VII does admittedly take a lot more words to achieve this arc than VI would have. Another good example are the villains. Kefka has no backstory, no motivations beyond desiring power, and no nuance. He is evil through and through, and sometimes, if a villain is well executed, you don't need any more than that. Sephiroth, on the other hand, has a detailed backstory, where he's a legendary soldier who discovers dark secrets about Shimra and his own past. This acts as an inciting incident that begins his descent into villainy and madness, where he comes to view himself as the last descendant of an ancient race of people he thinks humanity has betrayed, and so he vows to destroy Shinra and humanity to save the planet and take revenge. And then it gets even more complicated. 
Final Fantasy VI also only has a single antagonistic force, which is the Empire, including Kefka at first, and then just Kefka. Meanwhile in Seven, there are two separate and opposed villains in Sephiroth and Shinra, who both clash with each other as well as the player. All this and more helps move Final Fantasy VII's story into more convoluted territory. There is a lot going on in this narrative, and the way it's presented to the player almost makes it feel like a mystery that you're being asked to put together and solve. The story begins with you fighting against Shinra, but within the first few hours, the president of the company is unexpectedly assassinated, and from this point onwards, it's hard to know where this story is going or what to expect. You chase after Sephiroth, but every time you seem to catch up with him, he disappears, and you're left fighting strange monsters. Cloud repeatedly hears a mysterious voice in his head, but no further information is provided. There are odd, unwell characters in black robes with tattooed numbers who you keep running into, and when you get to Cloud's hometown of Nibelheim, that was meant to have burned to the ground several years earlier, it seems to have been rebuilt. There is a lot going on in this story, and on top of that you have multiple examples of unreliable narration and exposition from characters who don't fully understand things themselves and get certain details wrong, and many out there concepts, to the point where the game even adds in several optional explanatory exposition scenes of one party member asking another to explain what the hell is going on. Final Fantasy VII is a great game to replay because so much of its story is foreshadowed and referenced before the player has the information needed to understand it. But at the same time, you can hardly blame anyone that gets confused on a single playthrough. And this marks another shift for the series. Certain earlier titles had some very out there concepts and lots of dramatic revelations, but this was often combined with quite simple and to the point stories. Final Fantasy VI on the other hand was the first game to add a lot of complexity to its narrative, but its story stayed relatively focused. Whereas Final Fantasy VII expands the complexity and combines it with a more confusing and revelation heavy plot structure. And from this point onwards, that becomes the norm for the series. Whether this is a positive or negative again feels down to preference, and not every game necessarily has the same level of execution. But for a lot of people, this is where Final Fantasy starts to truly be Final Fantasy, with all the positive and negative connotations that entails. And as for Final Fantasy VII's gameplay, it once again has a lot of similarities to VI. The most important new feature is the Materia system, where spells, combat abilities and passive bonuses can be gained through specific Materia, which the player equips to characters through slots on weapons and armour. This is similar to Final Fantasy VI, yet where Magicite would teach characters spells permanently, Materia needs to always be equipped, and it's the Materia itself which levels up as the player gains ability points now. This creates satisfying long-term progression, as you see the Materia you use continue to grow over the course of the game, where your decisions over which Materia to use and prioritise leveling brings benefits later down the line. There's also different materia combinations to consider, where individual materia can be combined with certain others to provide benefits like making a spell AoE, or adding elemental defense to armor, as well as different synergies between materia that can be taken advantage of, like by using long range to put a character in the back row where they have more defense, then giving them cover so they take hits for other party members, as well as counter so they counter attack after covering. This can be rewarding, but Final Fantasy VII doesn't really go far enough with providing a big range of interesting materia to truly take advantage of, or with creating challenging content that requires effective setups. The materia system is well designed, and has plenty of potential, but it feels like the developers were too scared of adding complexity to the game to allow this system to truly shine. The benefit of this, however, is that Final Fantasy VII is a great game for players who either don't want to deal with complicated gameplay systems, or are just new to the genre. Unlike some other games in the series, Materia is easy to understand, doesn't require lots of time spent in menus, feels well balanced, and still regularly involves interesting decisions. For a system so simple, it's surprisingly fun, 
and ultimately I think it is one of the better unique progression systems in the series. Still, the openness of the system does mean there's little to make each character feel unique now, as it's materia rather than the actual character which changes how each party member plays in combat. Perhaps to help alleviate this, there is a new limit break system, where taking damage fills a gauge that allows characters to perform powerful special attacks. A more rudimentary version of this system was also seen in 6, but it triggered so rarely that it's easy to forget it exists. By contrast, in 7, limit breaks happen all the time, and act as a sort of comeback mechanic where the more damage you take, the more damage you can then dish out in return. They're also enjoyably flashy, and yet don't slow combat down too much by forcing you to wait for a lengthy animation every single attack like some of the abilities in 6. Party size has also decreased down to 3 for the first time, which helps keep combat fast paced and prevents the ATB system from feeling overly delayed, although some might miss not having that fourth party member. For the most part however, gameplay seems like even less of a priority for the developers than in 6, with dungeons and unique dungeon mechanics being rare, and set pieces being more common than ever, to the point where it can be hard to differentiate between the two. The first example of anything like a dungeon is the attack on the Shinra headquarters at the end of the Midgar section, where you have choices over how to make your assault, sections where you sneak past patrols, lots of NPCs to talk to, multiple simple puzzle sections, and lots and lots of story. This creates a great sequence that feels much more immersive and exciting than a normal video game style dungeon, and while most future set pieces aren't as impressive or involved as this, 7 does always keep its story moving and features lots of diverse locations. Resource management and overall difficulty is even lower than in 6 though, which while somewhat expected, is still a bit disappointing. To make up for this, there are lots of mini-games this time around. Uh, none of them are actually good mini-games per se, but there is something undeniably charming about the vast range of weird things you find yourself doing in this game, and most don't overstay their welcome and are integrated into the story as a way to keep the experience interactive. Final Fantasy VII is a strange game. Its combination of early 3D technology that Square was still inexperienced with, alongside its massive budget, helps make it stand out not only from games which came before and after, but also other games of the era. There's a real sense of experimentation to some of its stylistic and narrative choices, and a sense that it's not tied down by needing to appear overly realistic with some of its game design choices. The result is a game with a lot of variety, humour, and uniqueness, which felt one of a kind in 1997 and still largely feels that way today, even if it's not always for the right reasons. And yet, while this is a game which treads so much new ground for the series, in other ways it feels like a direct continuation of what was started by Final Fantasy VI, with the heavy focus on story and characters, the serious setting and tone, the groundbreaking presentation, the more open core progression system, and even some very similar story beats. Perhaps it doesn't need to be said, but Final Fantasy VII was ridiculously successful, going on to become one of only two PlayStation 1 games to sell over 10 million copies, a staggering amount for the time, and an unthinkable amount for a JRPG. As a result, it likely single-handedly changed the trajectory for the genre, with many future games taking influence from it, and many more Japanese games being localized following its success, including several of the earlier Final Fantasy games already seen in this video. For Square, this must have been an immense relief after investing so much into one title. But creating a follow-up to one of the most successful games ever made couldn't have been an easy task. Development on the next Final Fantasy began soon after the release of Seven, and involved much of the same team, although for the first time Sakaguchi himself would not be heavily involved due to him focusing on the movie Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. Still, in this period, Final Fantasy Seven continued to sell well as the Final Fantasy brand grew and grew, leading to much anticipation for the next entry, 
which in 1999 was released. The first thing that stands out about Final Fantasy VIII is its visuals. There have been some impressive jumps in presentation before, but VIII is easily the biggest leap within a console generation, and one of the biggest overall. Almost every aspect of visual design has seen significant improvements. Character models are now realistically proportioned and more detailed, FMVs look far higher quality and feature complex animation, they're also better integrated with more scenes combining in-game characters with FMV, and party members now also appear on screen, even outside combat, rather than just disappearing inside the main character's body. Still, the biggest area of improvement has to be in the pre-rendered backgrounds. I will admit here that maybe I'm biased, because I do love a good pre-rendered background. I love them in horror games, I love them in western RPGs, and I love them in adventure games. But in all of gaming's nowhere near long enough pre-rendered history, I don't think there's anything on the level of Final Fantasy VIII. Every single background in this game seems to be filled with detail and style. The lighting is great, the use of varied and creative perspectives is great, the areas of animation are great, and every location just feels like a visual treat. And there are so many locations, so many backgrounds, and so much to see. There's a saying that a picture is worth a thousand words, and goddamn does Final Fantasy VIII have a lot of good pictures. And this really helps to make its world feel alive and believable. Again, maybe I'm biased, because most people don't seem to be passionate about pre-rendered backgrounds in the way I am. But consider this. Pre-renders were only being used in mainstream gaming for a short period, because they were gone to be replaced with more cost-effective and visually cohesive, fully 3D environments. And in that period, most games didn't have a high enough budget to create loads and loads of high-quality artwork, meaning games like this were, and still are, incredibly rare. When I first saw this game on a CRT TV, I could not believe how good it looked. When I first replayed this game several console generations later, I couldn't believe how well the visuals held up. And still, to this day, I am frequently amazed at just how much of this game looks incredible. By the standards of its time, I genuinely think this is one of the best looking games ever made. But again, maybe that's just me, because I love pre-rendered backgrounds, and this game is the pre-rendered king. No offense to Final Fantasy IX or The Legend of Dragoon, of course, they're not that far behind. This does mean, though, that the Final Fantasy VII problem of not knowing where to go and needing icons to show players is a thing of the past. Eight has no toggle and doesn't need one, and this helps create a stronger sense of exploration as you now navigate environments yourself, which, while not overly difficult, does create a more engaging experience than, say, just following arrows or running in a straight line. As for the setting that these backgrounds depict, it is, once again, an alternative modern-day fantasy, yet where Seven was often dark, Eight was instead designed to be deliberately colourful, so the setting would feel fresh and distinctive. Much of the game takes place within these futuristic megastructures called gardens, which are basically military schools focused on training elite mercenaries. These days, school settings aren't anything out of the ordinary, but in 1999, the concept was much rarer and helped give Final Fantasy VIII's setting its own interesting relatability. Many people who played this game would still have been in school themselves, and those who weren't could probably still remember that time, which is why school settings are used so often. Final Fantasy VIII, however, combines this relatable concept with a heavy degree of fantasy wish fulfillment. It is a school, and yet you're an elite mercenary who's sent on dangerous missions all over the world with your friends while using powerful magic summons and a gun blade. Overall, the concept is a lot of fun, and for its time, genuinely novel. Beyond the gardens, Final Fantasy VIII starts off seeming like it will once more be about defeating an evil empire. But then the story goes in a rather different direction, making it ultimately more character-focused. 
one thing I do think 8 deserves credit for is how immersive the experience can feel. There's a lot of downtime in this story, usually between missions, and there are so many details which were added just to draw you further into this world. For example, Balam Garden is huge, with multiple levels and rooms which you can freely explore. You also have your own room which you can sleep in, and sometimes need to return to to change clothes between casual clothing, your student outfit, and formal attire. Also, once you graduate and become a mercenary, you get a salary, which is paid at regular intervals, and there are battle reports based on missions and tests you can take to increase your rank and salary, where the tests function as advanced tutorials quizzing you on game mechanics. There's an almost slice of life feel to some of 8's design aspects, and this approach wasn't really seen before. Even in 7, you always seem to be moving towards an objective, and the game never just slowed down to focus on the player living out their normal life, as it sometimes does in 8. This might make Final Fantasy VIII sound like it's slower paced and features less action, but instead, the focus on set pieces seems to have been taken even further, and outside of these quiet moments, action is constant and the story moves quickly, with a real lack of filler objectives and locations. In past games, you would often have to travel through certain locations to get to the place where the main story continues, but in 8, the story usually feels more constant and active, and a lot of the set pieces in this game are surprisingly ambitious. In the first disc alone, you take part in a large-scale military operation, assist a small group of rebels in trying to kidnap an important official in an occupied city, and lead an assassination attempt against one of the world's most powerful figures. And within these bigger moments are smaller set pieces of chase scenes, train hijackings, and infiltrations. The emphasis on the cinematic has grown ever greater, and certain moments later in the game up the scale and spectacle even further, with massive garden vs garden battles and a whole lot of space shenanigans. Still, the main focus of the story is almost always its protagonist, Squall. JRPGs have a very obvious archetypal main character, someone who is young, optimistic, confident, friendly, idealistic, and usually a little bit naive. And this can be seen in at least half of the Final Fantasy games which have defined characters, as well as a large amount of Japanese media in general. Squall, on the other hand, is almost the exact opposite of this in all ways except age, being portrayed as cynical, insecure, rude, and introverted. What's more, where most video game protagonists happily embrace their main character role, Squall instead struggles with the situation he finds himself in immensely. Squall shows a deep fear over dying, he feels stressed and dislikes responsibility, particularly over other people's lives, he struggles to understand certain events in the story, and he even regularly questions his own competence. We know all of this because 8 shows Squall's inner thoughts extensively during and in between story sections. This places a much heavier focus on the main character than in previous games, and creates an interesting juxtaposition between the way Squall acts and is seen by others, which is cool, calm and professional, and the way we the player knows he truly feels. The irony of this situation is that Squall's problems are largely caused by himself. At the start of the game, he is not chosen for a leadership role, and yet after things go wrong, he steps up, takes charge, and gets the group out of a difficult situation, all while continually maintaining this cool professional facade, which is precisely what leads to him being given more and more responsibility as the story progresses, until he's in charge of almost everything and his emotions erupt out of him in sudden irrational outbursts. You could then see Squall as being a bad main character, or just unlikable, but I think that's a little harsh. Just as bravery is not an absence of fear, but a willingness to act in spite of it, so too is Squall a good main character, not because it comes easy to him, but because he struggles so much and yet still ultimately does the best that he can to live up to the role that's been placed upon him. Likewise, Squall is sometimes criticised as being unrealistic, but he's a teenager who struggles to express emotion, worries about what other people think of him, constantly doubts himself, 
feels scared of dying, and struggles with responsibility. Maybe I'm a bad judge of normality, but that sounds about right for your average 17 year old to me, and gives him a unique relatability, rarely seen in the medium. If anything, what's actually unrealistic is the large amount of protagonists who never struggle with having to save the world or facing numerous life and death situations, and Squall's true sin is being more realistically flawed in a genre where that's rare. Still, by choosing to focus so heavily on a single character, it also means that anyone that doesn't like Squall will be in for a rough time, because so much of this game is dedicated to his thoughts and his development. And to make matters worse, the rest of Final Fantasy VIII's characters don't have much going on. There are hints of depth to each of the other five party members. Quittis is an overachiever struggling with her first taste of failure, professionally and romantically. Irvin can't handle pressure and compensates by trying to play it cool, much like Squall. Zell is overly sensitive and struggles to control his hot-headedness. Renoa feels like she isn't taken seriously as a resistance member and doesn't fit in as a seed. And Selfie just really likes trains. I mean, Selfie is a bubbly extrovert who had to move school and leave behind all her friends, making her probably quite lonely. All of these characters have something going on inside their heads that the game hints at, yet unlike with Squall, we never actually see inside their heads to observe any more than this, leaving them ultimately feeling underdeveloped and shallow, particularly compared to Final Fantasy VI and VII, which both had more characters with more development. The game's secondary protagonist, who is seen through a number of mysterious dream sequences, is admittedly a lot better. Laguna is the stereotypical main character the game was lacking, being initially young, optimistic, confident, friendly, idealistic, and rather naive. Unlike most RPG characters, however, Laguna's story is about life not working out. He doesn't get the girl, he can't save the day, he never gets his dream job, and he ultimately dedicates his life to one thing and misses out on something else incredibly important as a result. Really, this is a tale about how sometimes the storybook narrative doesn't work out, and yet life goes on. Which feels refreshingly adult in contrast to the unashamedly teenage story of Squall. The final aspect of Final Fantasy VIII's plot is romance. Love stories aren't uncommon in games, but as the logo and intro might suggest, VIII places a far larger focus on this than previous titles. In 1999, this was rather unusual, in part because video games were seen more as a medium for guys, and love stories are still overwhelmingly more popular with female audiences, as a quick glance at your local bookstore will make clear. As for the quality of this romance story, it seems to be a subject where opinions differ wildly and likely correlate heavily to how much people like each character to begin with. Sometimes this romance is criticised as being too sudden or out of character, but that seems unfair. On-screen romances are almost always sudden to some degree, in part because we only see a limited part of these characters' lives. But there are still multiple date-like scenes between Squall and Renoa. Also, Squall is scared of showing vulnerability, so it makes sense that he might be slow to outwardly express his feelings, and that he might feel attracted to someone who chases after him, because this way he avoids the vulnerability in dating that comes with risking rejection. And when Squall's emotions are made clear, they coincide with him losing control of his current situation and finally cracking under pressure, and are prompted by the idea of not knowing what you've got until you lose it. Where I think the romance does fall a bit flatter is in Renoa herself, who like most characters in 8 feels underdeveloped, and while it's obvious why Squall might like her, it's less clear what she sees in him. Maybe Squall is just her type, but while that's realistic enough, it doesn't make for a particularly compelling story, and I think the one-sidedness of how this romance is told limits its potential a little. As for the main story, it follows in the footsteps of Final Fantasy VII by being both complex and convoluted, but unlike VII, it doesn't deliver nearly as strong a payoff in return for its complexities.
I think something that all JRPG fans deep down need to admit is that JRPG stories can be a little dumb. Which is not to say that the people who enjoy them are such, or that they should not be enjoyed, but a lot of JRPG stories could be criticised. There are lots of concepts that are unrealistic, an over-reliance on certain tropes, areas of unconvincing writing, and, at times, too much complexity for their own good. In some ways, in fact, realism often seems to be deliberately traded for more fantasy, adventure, and entertaining concepts, and that might be one of the things which draws people to the genre in the first place. Still, the degree to which these problems exist do differ between games, and sometimes those degrees can make all the difference. Where I think the conversation gets misguided, however, is when these problems are framed as being all about plot holes. Most fiction features some amount of contrivance, and if you look for examples, you'll probably find them. To illustrate this, let's pick on Final Fantasy VI for a second, which might be the Final Fantasy most capable of withstanding such criticism. There are things in this story which don't make sense. For example, at Famasa, Kefka defeats the party and kills several people, but leaves all the party members alive. Why would Kefka do this? He has no reason to want to save them, it doesn't fit his character, it doesn't help his plan, and the actual reason is obviously because this is something the writers want to happen. Or for an example of an unrealistic coincidence, Celis is asleep on a small island with Sid for one year, and the day Celis wakes up, Sid immediately gets sick and dies. Also, that seagull wearing Locke's bandana has some pretty incredible timing. Hopefully you don't need an explanation of how improbable this is, but regardless, it's fine. This doesn't mean Final Fantasy VI has serious plot holes that ruin its story. Some degree of contrivance is expected and can be overlooked, and whatever problems VI's narrative has, they don't nearly diminish its positives. But some stories are more contrived than others. The problem I think the Final Fantasy series developed, which by 8 is in full display, is that as the stories grew more complex, they became more convoluted. And in these more convoluted stories, contrivances tend to start stacking up, like a house of cards that's liable to come crashing down in the player's mind. And I think that does happen a little bit, for example, over the course of 8, with the orphanage revelation in particular feeling far too coincidental and completely unnecessary. Still, it's really not the case that some Final Fantasy games have no plot holes, whereas others have massive plot holes, and only idiots enjoy the games with massive plot holes, which is how I think some fans often try to portray things. These stories are, in general, unrealistic in numerous ways, but the difference between games is one of degrees, not absolutes, and even so, there are still usually many things to enjoy, which I think is true for Final Fantasy VIII, even if it does jump the shark a little bit in its second half. As for the gameplay, it is once more an area of some controversy. Eight's big new addition is the junction system, where magic now has limited uses and can be acquired from a range of different sources, and then summons can be equipped by characters to unlock a range of abilities, including the ability to equip magic to different primary stats for a substantial bonus. If that sounds a little confusing, then it is, at least compared to the previous games, and that's one of its downsides. It is a more unique system than anything seen in the series before this though, and allows for a heavy amount of experimentation, with lots of different summon abilities to unlock, lots of magic to boost stats with, and lots of ways to acquire this magic. In this sense, it helps address one of the main problems with the materia system, as this time the developers were clearly not scared by adding complexity, and it results in more options for the player. On the other hand, the junction system does feel a bit like a first draft, and as such shows a number of problems. The first and most obvious being that drawing magic from enemies, which is one of the main ways you'll acquire more spells, is boring and time consuming. There's no limit to how much magic you can draw, so there's nothing to stop players from sitting in combat, not attacking enemies and just drawing spells every turn 
while occasionally healing. In theory, this isn't something you need to do very often, but in practice the player has no way of knowing exactly what spells are good, or what other methods might be available to gain spells, and so may spend a long time just drawing magic. Secondly, Final Fantasy has by now long had a problem of combat just coming down to auto-attacking enemies with no fort involved, and 8 encourages this even further, as now magic has limited charges, meaning players are discouraged from using it in battle. Thirdly, Final Fantasy VIII uses level scaling for the first time in the series. This has a fairly small impact outside of overworld encounters, and fighting enemies is still beneficial as you still unlock more summon abilities, gain more magic, gain access to enemies with higher level magic, and gain item drops from enemies. With that said however, there doesn't seem to be much benefit of adding level scaling in the first place, as this game is no more open in design than previous entries, and so the only thing level scaling really achieves is unfairly punishing players who don't realise it exists and spend a lot of time grinding levels. The fourth problem is just that summons take too long. Unlike magic, summons don't cost any kind of resource this time, and so can be used as frequently as you like, and the animations look absolutely incredible for a PS1 game. But they're also long, and should have absolutely been skippable. The fifth problem, and yes we are still going, is that limit breaks now trigger at low health, rather than through taking damage, and this is more exploitable and less enjoyable. And finally, the last major problem, Final Fantasy VIII is also, once again, a bit too easy. Overall, VIII doesn't have the best gameplay in the series, but the low difficulty of VI and VII already set the bar quite low, and it does provide one of the more unique progression systems that can be fun to learn and experiment with. The junction system is a lot better if you play this game blind and learn how best to take advantage of it on your own, but overall, the junction system also does too little to protect players from themselves, as it can easily lead to people needlessly grinding or spending too much time drawing magic over other alternatives. The frustrating thing about 8's design is that the ideas behind it are interesting, and it feels like it only needs some small and quite obvious changes to solve most of its problems. For example, only allow players to draw once from each enemy while giving more magic per draw, and allow players to use magic without consuming a spell charge, but don't allow players to use magic they have equipped to stats. This way, magic is encouraged in battle, but players still have to make an important choice over whether to equip their best spells or use them, and no more time is wasted through repeatedly drawing spells. Also, copy 7's limit break system, make summons skippable, and remove or limit the level scaling. And that's it, that's all this system really needs to be great. But I guess that is the risk with creating something wholly original over just iterating on what came before. And that is Final Fantasy VIII, a follow-up to one of the most successful games of all time which could have played it safe and copied what was proven to work, but instead decided to take numerous risks across many different aspects of its design. The multiple unique gameplay systems, the heavy focus on romance, the flawed and atypical main character, the emphasis on downtime and immersion in its story and world design, the vastly different setting, and the attempt at realistic visuals are all things Final Fantasy VIII didn't have to do, but it did. And so many of the reasons people dislike this game are tied to those specific risks. Final Fantasy VIII is a game which is original, for better or worse, and that makes it a distinctly likeable game in my eyes, despite some of its more obvious problems. It's also a game which was, for a time, hugely overhated. In fact, in the mid to late 2000s, hating Final Fantasy VIII almost seemed to become a personality trait for many people, in much the same way that hating the prequels was for Star Wars fans, and for much the same reason, which was the existence of a highly critical viral video review from a time before such things were common. As a result, the hate for Final Fantasy VIII has often seemed greatly exaggerated, while its positive qualities have been regularly overlooked, although this has lessened with time as more Final Fantasy games released to give people a greater range of options over which game to obsessively hate 
and blame for all of Final Fantasy's, Square's, and life's problems. And as much as opinions have always been divided over this game, at least there is one thing everyone can agree on to bring people together. Which is that Triple Triad is the best minigame in the series. What a nice little side activity. Who knew collectible card games could be so fun if you just remove the excessive pay to win and high time requirements. Boy, I sure can't wait to see where minigames go from here and how this card game might be improved in the future. Following on from 8, the next Final Fantasy would be released in the year 2000 and turned out to mark the end of an era. Being the last game on PlayStation 1, the last game to have direct involvement from Hironobu Sakaguchi, the last game to use the ATB battle system, and the last game to feature a soundtrack composed entirely by the now legendary Nobuo Uematsu, whose work on the previous games had somehow managed to continue to get better with each installment, despite the bar already having been set ridiculously high. And if one game had to end the era, Final Fantasy IX is a fitting choice. While in some ways Nine continues down the path of more recent entries, with its heavy focus on story and use of high quality pre-rendered backgrounds and FMV, in many other ways it represents a return to the past, featuring a more traditional medieval fantasy setting and a more light-hearted and whimsical style and tone. Its gameplay design also borrows elements from previous titles, and there's even a vast range of homages to past games in Nine's characters, music, and story concepts. And yet, for all its references and similarities, make no mistake, Final Fantasy IX is still very much its own game. It begins as an airship carrying a theatre troupe arrives at the great city of Alexandria. Aboard the airship are a band of thieves, including main character Zidane, who are on a mission to kidnap the princess during the staging of a play. But as their plan is set into motion, it soon starts going wrong when that same princess sneaks on board their airship to request to be kidnapped. Meanwhile, loyal knight Steiner, who is a fan of neither kidnapping nor defying the princess, does his best to try to stop these events anyway, while a young innocent boy named Vivi, who has only journeyed to the city in the hopes of watching the play after getting a free ticket, finds himself getting mugged tricked, chased, and abandoned, only to end up right in the middle of the play as the group try to make their largely unsuccessful escape on the airship, before they all crash land into the not so subtly named Evil Forest, where no one apparently makes it out alive. And so the stage is set for adventure, as the party of four must put aside their many differences to try to work together and survive, before soon stumbling onto a plot that threatens peace on the continent, and maybe even more. There is a lot that could be said about Final Fantasy IX's story, but if there is one single thing that needs to be stressed, and one area where this game excels above all others in the series, it is personality. From its character interactions, to its art style, world design, soundtrack, or writing, this game is overflowing with character and charm. The quality of localizations had been improving with each installment since 4, but 9 is the first game that truly feels like it has great writing. Not in its thematic depth or plot structure, but in its dialogue and its use of wit and levity. So much of these games are spent reading dialogue boxes, and so much of that dialogue in 9 is just entertaining. Once upon a time, I used to think that Queena was a bad character, because I was young and didn't like their character design. Now that I'm older, and wiser, I realise that Queena is a great character, because they not only have many memorable lines of dialogue themselves, but they also play off the rest of the cast to make other characters more likeable by their varied reactions to Queena's singular obsession with eating new things. And it's in these types of interactions that Nine's cast shines strongest. Individually, not all are that impressive, yet this group ends up as much more than the sum of their parts, and unlike in 8, this time every character gets at least some time in the spotlight. <laughs> 
This is thanks in large part to something called active time events, where in the game's many towns and villages, all party members wander off to do their own thing, which you can then view as a sort of optional cutscene. This gives every character a real sense of agency. We see that each has their own thoughts, problems, and their own story that is taking place within the bigger narrative. And those stories can range from something as simple as getting in trouble for trying to eat something they shouldn't have, to questioning the meaning of life, or asking what's the difference between duty and honour. Through this greater attention, many characters see a substantial amount of development, and within this there's a sense of thematic cohesion to how each one of them struggles over questions of identity in their own unique way. Vivi is probably the most famous example of this, as he knows little about his past or the world, and comes to question his origins, what it means to be alive, what it means to die, and how to find meaning and acceptance in the face of his own mortality, reflecting a journey of discovery and maturity many people must walk in life. Overall, I'd say Final Fantasy IX probably has the best characters in the series, combining likability, depth, and diversity, and still managing to give plenty of attention to each despite its relatively large cast. And it's good the characters are so strong, because the main story doesn't really reach the same lofty heights. Final Fantasy IX feels like it's at its best when it's giving its characters an excuse to go on an adventure. And few games in the series come close to matching its own adventurous spirit. And yet its plot still follows in the footsteps of 7 and 8 in upping the stakes continuously, adding in overly confusing elements, and packing its final act with big revelations, and this side of it doesn't always work as well. It is still a hugely enjoyable ride, but it's one that relies on its characters, and would have a lot less to offer without them. It's also a slow-paced story. The downtime that featured so prominently in Final Fantasy VIII is back in force, and this not only benefits the characters, but also shows many sides to this world, while pulling you into the experience. The downside to this is that there are long stretches where little is happening, both in story advancement and gameplay, and there are times when Final Fantasy IX might take its heavy character focus too far, like in some of the active time events focused on the more minor side characters. Still, at least the slow pace of the story does make it consistent with the other half of this experience, because my god does this game have a sluggish battle system. There is at least 7 seconds of black screen when random encounters load in this game, on the original PlayStation 1 version that is. For comparison, 8 had somewhere between 2 and 3 seconds, and 7 had even less. Still, what does a few seconds of loading matter, you might wonder? But that is just the start. When the blackness lifts, you are greeted with multiple camera pans of the battlefield, presumably to provide some additional time for loading, and then, once the battle finally begins, you'll find an ATB system that charges more slowly than ever before, as well as the slowest attack animations in the series. Enemies don't take an especially long time to kill, but everything about this battle system just feels slow. Particularly after playing so many other games so recently, and there is another overly long loading screen at the end of battles too. The party size has been increased back up to 4, but this still isn't much to get excited over, because when combined with the slow animations, and an ATB system that has reverted to no longer pausing during actions, it creates the most delayed and unresponsive battle system in the series. In fact, animations are so slow in this game, that I'm pretty sure the most effective way to play is to skip the turn of your weaker party members, so you don't waste time watching animations from low damage attacks, and can instead fit in more actions with your more powerful characters, particularly if you're using haste. How much this will all negatively impact your experience with the game is going to be subjective, and believe me, this is a problem that feels worse after coming straight off the back of so many other Final Fantasy games, but this has to be one of the most clear-cut, obvious, and objective flaws with any game in the series. Just the time to get into battles is substantial, and there is still plenty of combat in this game. 
Still, it really is a shame that Final Fantasy IX is plagued with this one big glaring problem, because so much else about the gameplay is good, and it probably has the best battles, dungeons and progression system seen since Final Fantasy V. In sticking with its more classical roots, IX returns to characters with defined classes, similar to IV. This makes each character feel unique, and yet it then goes on to combine this with a simple yet hugely enjoyable ability system, where characters can learn different passive and active abilities from the equipment they use, which you then spend ability points to equip. This provides a good amount of choice over which abilities to equip, which abilities to prioritize learning, and whether to use your equipment slots to prioritize the best stats, or focus on learning more abilities. The ability system also allows you to react to what enemies you encounter by taking advantage of bonus damage abilities or status prevention to help deal with random encounters of a certain area. And there is enough depth to your abilities and equipment that if you die to any boss, you can often swap a few things over to give yourself a better chance for next time, maybe by equipping some elemental resistances or just freeing up some additional ability points through unequipping the level and ability up skills and so on. Overall, it's a fun system that provides plenty of choice without being overly complex or time consuming. And it also gives a strong sense of long term progression as you learn more and more abilities over the course of the game. By tying abilities to equipment, it also has the added benefit of making finding new equipment really exciting as they provide new abilities to learn in addition to their normal stat increases. This is all then made even better by the slightly higher difficulty of 9 in comparison to the last three games, which makes battles and boss fights feel that bit more meaningful. For the first time in quite a while, you might actually find yourself running on resources in this game, particularly as 9 has several sections which place limits on your party, sometimes forcing you to deal with not having a white mage, or to tackle dungeons where you can't use magic, or have to make use of all 8 party members. Final Fantasy IX still isn't a dungeon focused game in the way that the first five entries were, but it does combine some of their more interesting dungeon design alongside the frequent action and story set pieces of 7 and 8, in a way that captures some of the effectiveness of both. Final Fantasy IX does once again create a different but worse version of the Limit Break system with trances, which like Final Fantasy VII, trigger after taking a prequisite amount of damage, but unlike Seven you now have no control over when these trances activate, meaning they frequently trigger at inopportune times like when the battles are almost over, and they also now give you a stat boost for several turns instead of featuring unique powerful abilities, which also feels like a downgrade. This is a minor part of the game, but it does seem strange that after 7 created a system that worked so well, both of the next two games would mess that same system up with relatively minor changes. Finally, 9 also probably deserves some criticism for its implementation of stealing, something which has long been a part of the series and takes on an even larger role this time around, but really it's too large a role and can lead to a lot of tedium. In past games, bosses would usually have one or no items that you can steal, which sometimes gave players a nice little bonus. But in 9, every boss has three items, usually powerful equipment that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get until much later in the game. And in 9, equipment is more important than ever before, thanks to it providing abilities as well as stats. This means stealing from bosses is incredibly rewarding, but stealing all three boss items usually takes a long time and forces you to sit around in combat not attacking as you wait for RNG to be on your side. In many ways, Stealing in 9 is surprisingly similar to drawing in 8. They both help a lot with progression, yet can be easily overlooked by the inexperienced. Both cause you to change battle tactics as you wait around not attacking, and both usually only matter in boss fights. They also both have a simple solution, which for stealing, should have been just having one item per boss, like other games do. That way stealing is still useful, but players who don't steal aren't overly punished, and stealing wouldn't be so tediously time consuming. Again, like drawing, you can always just not worry too much about stealing everything, and stealing is still a more minor part of 9 than drawing was in 8, but it is another system where sometimes the less you know about it, the better the player's experience actually is. <laughs>
Still, neither stealing nor trances are major problems, and the load times and slow speed of combat is something you'll get used to eventually. There is a lot to enjoy about 9's simple yet rewarding class and ability system, as well as its return to a slightly higher level of difficulty that feels around the sweet spot for balancing accessibility with engaging gameplay where your actions actually matter. 7, 8 and 9 do all feature their own optional super bosses as well that are substantially more difficult than the base game, but a super boss is no replacement for a well-tuned core game experience. As for the newest iteration of 8's card game, I like Final Fantasy IX, so therefore I just pretend it doesn't even have a card game, and I don't fuck too much with chocobos either, if you know what I mean. In 7, 9 or 10, actually. Knowing the trajectory the series will take from here makes Final Fantasy IX feel like a swan song, designed to celebrate all that has come before it. It features numerous easter eggs and references to older games, with the class system of 4 and the light-hearted fun of 3 and 5, yet it continues to make advancements and learn lessons from the storytelling and presentation of more recent games, while still proudly standing on its own, thanks to an abundance of style, personality and charm. It's a bit of a cop-out any time a reviewer talks about the presence or lack of soul in a game, but if there is one game in this medium's long and vibrant history that does clearly have soul, it is Final Fantasy IX. From here, Final Fantasy would change quickly and continuously, leaving IX as an almost symbolic conclusion to the first nine games, and it was a strong way to end the era. Final Fantasy X, released in Japan in July 2001, just a few weeks after another landmark entry into the series. Final Fantasy The Spirits Within was a fully CG film with a substantial budget produced by series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi and Square, and it became Final Fantasy's greatest failure. With poor reviews and even worse sales, The Spirits Within would come to mark a turning point for Square, and it was the fallout from this failure that would eventually lead to the merger with once rival Enix to create the company most known today, as well as the departure of Sakaguchi, alongside several other veterans of the series. Square wasn't the only thing changing however, because Final Fantasy X once more represents the start of a new era, and by my classification, it's an era that's still ongoing, because compared to what came before, Final Fantasy X is a distinctly modern feeling game. This can be seen in its changes to presentation, as for the first time, X features 3D environments, character models with facial animations and the use of motion capture, more cinematic dialogue with varied camera angles, and perhaps biggest of all, voice acting. Anymore. The jump from the 5th to 6th console generation led to some dramatically improved visuals in gaming, and Final Fantasy X was one of the poster childs for this. And while the lip syncing is sometimes off, characters are sometimes portrayed with lower fidelity models in less important scenes, creating some noticeable inconsistency, some environments are quite lacking in detail compared to the pre-renders of 8 and 9, and not all the voice acting is good, with minor NPCs often sounding stiff and awkward. For its time, this game looked and sounded incredible. And this is all the more impressive when you consider the size of this game. A lot of early Japanese games struggled with English voice acting. Stop it! Don't open that door! But Chris is... And yet Final Fantasy X was not only substantially better than the standard of the time, that it achieved this despite having far more dialogue than most games. Likewise, even if some environments look a little flat, others look fantastic, and as a complete package from 2001, there is so much about this game's presentation that is commendable. That said, I do think something is lost in this transition. <laughs> 
There is an element of charm that older games have, precisely as a result of their limited means to portray things. There's something so memorable about Kefka's laugh, or Cloud's shrug, and there was a lot of expressiveness or even physical comedy that can't really be achieved in the same way after this transition. Likewise, there is something about how older games leave things to the imagination that I don't think is always appreciated in a medium where graphics are always expected to improve over time. It's a bit like comparing a book to a movie, where both might use words, but the movie can also use visuals, acting, music, and so on. And yet, no one would ever say that movies are an objectively better storytelling medium than books. They both bring certain advantages and people have their preferences. And I don't think the situation with older and newer video games is that different. As games modernized, they just added more. More data limits, more pixels, bigger textures, more sound channels, 3D, CGI, voice acting, advanced lighting and post-processing effects, and so on. And while more is usually better, it's not always. All this is not to say that Final Fantasy X doesn't have better presentation than the games which came before it. It does. It's just there is a price that's paid for these advances beyond just development costs. Still, visuals aren't the only obvious change 10 brings, as once more, the series has an entirely new style of setting. I'm not exactly sure how to classify Final Fantasy X's setting, which I think speaks to its originality. It is, as always, fantastical, and yet, rather than having a European influence, it draws heavily from Southeast Asian and Pacific cultures, and rather than being analogous to medieval, early industrial, or even modern day, it's instead more of a post-futuristic setting. In fact, the game begins, in one of the series' more confusing openings, with the main character, Tidus, in a high-tech megacity of the past, before he's brought forward in time a thousand years to the game's actual setting after the attack of some colossal whale-like monster. That monster is called Sin, and it might be the best thing about Final Fantasy X. There has always been a lot of discussion over who is the best Final Fantasy villain, with Kefka and Sephiroth being the two most common choices, but if I had to pick the best antagonist from the series, it would always be Sin. There's a well-known trope in JRPGs that at the end of them you fight God, or someone in the process of becoming a god, and yet for all their supposed divine power, in practice they're really just a powerful guy or monster, who isn't so powerful they can't be defeated by a plucky band of adventurers that believe in each other, and while these gods might try to sound deep, it's usually just cryptic warnings that don't really mean all that much. And it's just not that impressive. Not even the first time you see this trope, and if you play many games, you'll probably see this trope many times. Anyway, Sin is not that. For one thing, it doesn't speak. And for most of the game, you're left barely understanding anything about it. You don't know what it is, how it came to be, or why it does what it does, and that's one of the things which makes it so intimidating. And yet, Sin is one of the only things in any JRPG I've played that truly lives up to this idea of godly power. Because while Sin is not technically a god, it does bring a biblical level of destruction as is seen in the opening when it destroys a massive city, and as is seen in-game when it destroys certain other locations. In fact, sin is such a destructive force that all of humanity has been forced to move backwards, going from advanced high-tech megacities to small collections of huts. What I'm saying here is that sin makes the average JRPG god seem like an angry kitten by comparison. It is a force of nature, unpredictable, unknowable, and completely unstoppable. And that is what Final Fantasy X is all about. Stopping sin. There is one way to do this, of course, 
It's what the world's religion is built around, and it involves a summoner going on a great journey to gather all the summons so they can perform the final summon. This banishes sin, at a cost, and only for a while. And that's the thing about sin. Humanity can band together to defeat it, at a cost, but it always comes back. And so we join Titus, who finds himself transported through time while understanding literally nothing as he then joins a young summoner named Yuna as one of her guardians as she undergoes the pilgrimage needed to perform the final summon. And this is a great premise. Except maybe the time travel part. I mean, I know this is Final Fantasy, but maybe when you're working with material as solid as Sin, you perhaps don't need that much extra for once. Still, much like Amnesia, time travel does at least create a connection between Titus and the player as both learn about this world together. And that connection is important because just as Final Fantasy VIII was the Squall show, this is Titus' story. And as with Squall, you frequently hear Titus' thoughts through narration. This places a heavy focus on this character, which again means that if you don't like them, you might be in for a difficult time. And while in personality, Titus is pretty much the polar opposite of Squall, he is, once more, a relatably flawed teenager. This time as a result of his immaturity and ignorance. For example, soon after arriving in this world, he's told of an important private religious ritual that summoners undergo, and without learning any more about it other than it's sometimes dangerous, he immediately goes and interrupts it. Hey, but what if something happens? What if the summoner dies? The precepts must be obeyed. Like I care. What if interrupting the ritual kills the summoner, Titus? What about then? Would you care then? The best way to summarize Titus is he knows almost nothing about anything due to being transported to another world, and yet he is still convinced that he always knows best. So, I don't particularly like this character, although he does provide me with valuable insight into what playing Final Fantasy VIII must be like for people who don't like Squall. And again like Squall, Titus does grow over the course of this journey, as his narration makes obvious with how different he sounds in it compared to in-game. The rest of Ten's cast also feature quite prominently, particularly Yuna, who acts as a secondary protagonist and is in many ways more important than Titus, while the rest of the cast do also still get a reasonable amount of development of their own. Romance is also quite a big part of this story, with the game now facing the added challenge of needing to show this through voice acting and realistic animation, which it handles surprisingly well. There is one last thing which I think sets Final Fantasy X's story apart from the games which came before it, however, and that is emotion. Final Fantasy X is an emotional game, and while other games in the series have featured plenty of emotional scenes, with multiple prominent character deaths even, I don't think I would ever describe any of them as being really emotional games. X is different, however. There's evidence of this before the game even begins, as the opening is accompanied by the soft, melancholic piano of Tizanakand, with Titus asking the player to... Listen to my story. This may be our last chance. And this sense of sadness permeates much of the experience. It's heard in many songs, it's seen in Titus' narration, in many conversations in the second half of the game, and in the juxtaposition between what Titus often expects and what other characters and maybe the player actually know, and it is centre stage at the game's conclusion. You could say Final Fantasy X is a sad game, but that implies past games weren't sad, and I don't think it's quite that simple. Instead, I think the best way to describe the difference is that in past games, emotion was a byproduct, yet in X, it's the objective. 
It is something that is set up and crafted throughout the entire experience, from the moment the game begins, and maybe even from the moment the story was first written. And for many people who love this game, this might be the main reason why. For me, however, it just doesn't work. I feel like the game is trying so hard to make me feel a certain way, that instead of the emotion resonating more strongly, it resonates less. Almost as if the game is telling me how to feel, and shouting that instruction in my face, and that just ends up pulling me out of the experience. Again, we all have our preferences, but I think there is something to the way previous games handle emotion compared to the way 10 does, which might help explain this as something more than just being about quality. There's a lot of examples I could use to try to illustrate this, but the one I want to talk about is Final Fantasy IX, Disc 2, after meeting Aiko and going back to her village. The rest of the villagers were killed when Aiko was young, or younger, so she was raised by her grandfather, who made her promise to never leave the village before turning 16, to try to keep her safe. Still, eventually he died too, so she lives in the village, alone, except for a bunch of Moogles. Anyway, she meets Zidane and the gang and invites them to dinner, which they accept. There's just one problem, which is that according to the Moogles, Aiko ain't exactly the best cook, and so the player, as Aiko and the Moogles, work together to try to make a nice dinner for everyone. And then, at the end of this light-hearted, often comedic scene, the upbeat music fades, and Aiko looks up at the sky and says, Grandpa, I don't want to be alone anymore. Help me do this right. And for the first time, it really hits you that Aiko is lonely. Because she's a child and she's alone, and the reason she cares about making a nice dinner isn't actually for some childish reason about making Zidane fall in love with her, but because she wants friends. And she's scared that if she messes up dinner, the group won't want to be friends with her. And that is a little bit heartbreaking. Aiko has been dealt a bad hand in life, so much so that she doesn't even realise how unlucky she is, and she doesn't ask for sympathy, she doesn't cry, she doesn't demand that the group be friends with her. All she does is say a quick prayer to her grandpa, the only person she's ever really known, asking for help making dinner. And I think that is sad. But there's no sad music, there's no foreshadowing or building up, there's no further dialogue to extract more from this scene, and the game just goes straight back to its more normal, light-hearted fun. You could easily play through this section without ever really thinking about this too deeply. You could pass it by without ever feeling sad at all. The emotional response is left up to the player, and the cause of the emotion just feels like any other part of the story. Emotion is the byproduct. It's subtle, it's natural, it's effective, and for me, it is what 10 is not. Still, in 10's defense, when you add in voice acting and other areas of realistic presentation, subtlety becomes hard, and sometimes the only option is to just go for it. I do think Final Fantasy X is a game that is designed, perhaps from the ground up, to be emotional. But I also think realistic presentation changes a story, and it's in this change that drama can become melodrama, that sad scenes start to feel like manipulative scenes, and that writing becomes more heavily scrutinised. Realism can bring greater rewards, but there is a greater risk. Regardless, with Final Fantasy X, the series has, whether it truly wanted to or not, plunged headfirst into this new realm of realism, and there is no going back from here. This is in large part why I think of Final Fantasy X as the first modern Final Fantasy. Despite 2001 kinda being a while ago now, uh, 
Anyway, there is more to this game than Sin, Tidus, and Tears, so let's talk gameplay. A. T. B. Is dead, baby! Come on! Rest in piss, you piece of shit! <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, uh, let me try that again. After six games in a row, ATB is no more, and is instead replaced with a normal turn-based battle system. Different and superior to the first three games as now character turns happen one at a time, the turn order is shown on screen, and that order can be manipulated. This is similar to several other future RPGs, and it's a great change. Battles are also fast, with none of Nine's excessive load times, and even the limit break system has been fixed by being more like Seven again. And you don't really need more than this. But there is more. You can now also swap active party members mid-turn to make use of all seven characters, giving you more options in battle and making each character feel important and useful. This is a great addition, but it does introduce a new problem in how experience points are delegated. There are several possible ways the game could handle XP. It could be split between all party members who participate in battle, or all party members could be given equal XP regardless of battle participation, or there could be an uneven split where all party members gain some XP while those who participate gain a larger share. So, three solid options. Which do you think that Final Fantasy X opts for? Correct. Some of you, anyway. The answer is none of the above. The actual system has no XP split, and instead, all characters who participate in battle gain the maximum amount of XP. This means that if you swap characters and take at least one action on each, you'll gain more than double the amount of XP from a battle, making a substantial difference to your level over the course of the game. This system incentivizes you to waste time using each character, often doing nothing of value, instead of just finishing the fight, and this is tedious and feels very artificial. In other ways, Ten's battle system is solid, although it does go too far in giving each character a defined role and then creating enemies around these roles. For example, Auron kills armored enemies, Tidus kills quick enemies, Waka kills flying enemies, Riku kills mechanical enemies, Lulu kills elementally weak enemies, and Yuna heals. Most enemies you encounter are designed around these roles, and while this was clearly meant to make each character feel useful and to add strategic depth, in practice it's just too obvious and too binary. This can make random encounters feel like you're playing with one of those baby toys where you put the shapes in the correct sized holes, and while this does make combat busier than many past games, the implementation is just too basic to be effective. The bosses are better though, and provide enough challenge to incentivize using multiple different party members without resorting to obvious whack-a-mole weaknesses. In fact, Ten's overall difficulty is better than a lot of the previous games, and while the frequency of save points means there are a few sections of the game where you're ever at risk of running out of MP, there are still a lot of useful skills you can use in combat that help to encourage more than just spamming auto-attack in every fight. It also helps that without the ATB system hanging over you anymore, you now have time to think about your options as much as you like and navigate menus in peace, a rare luxury in this era of Final Fantasy. The use of puzzles in this game is less successful though. In previous games, puzzles have always worked well because they were integrated into dungeons or exploration, and because they were short and simple. Final Fantasy X does neither of these things and makes surprisingly lengthy and challenging puzzle sections, which involve a lot of trial and error and just feel like a bad fit in a non-puzzle game. These are easily the least enjoyable parts of Final Fantasy X and provide several of the most frustrating mandatory parts of this entire series. I do kinda dig Blitzball though. Like, I don't know what happened to physics in this universe, but a fantasy underwater sports game is just such a fun concept, 
and anyone who says there's no skill involved hasn't seen me win the opening tournament, which is something I do first try every time I play this game. For the most part though, Final Fantasy X does feel like quite a streamlined game. Equipment has minimal impact, with only one weapon and armor piece per character, and these only provide small bonuses with no base stats. A basic upgrade system is added later, but it still has minimal impact. The main progression system is the Spear Grid, which takes the place of a traditional level system and allows you to move one space each level up to acquire new stats and abilities. This is a popular system that has strong presentation, but for the bulk of the game, it is overwhelmingly linear. There are occasional optional branching paths and eventually it opens up more, but so much of your time on this grid is just going in a straight line, picking up every sphere on the way, with virtually no element of choice involved. The one exception is Kimari, but for most characters their progression is about as linear as... well, the rest of the game. A lot of Final Fantasy X is a straight line, as is made quite obvious by the minimap. You may wonder why you need a minimap if this game is one big straight line, and that's a good question. Why is there a minimap? The answer is presumably because there are one or two sections which are a bit more open and might be confusing without it, and because the nature of transitioning into random battles could make players confused about which direction they were going. Also, this was the PS2 era, an unfortunate time of minimap ascendancy. Still, for 90% of this game, this minimap is so unnecessary, and the other 10% could be solved by other design choices. This game is mostly a straight line, you couldn't get lost if you tried. The minimap also takes up a lot of screen space, it harms immersion, it spoils the location of every chest by signposting them so obviously, and it's just a little bit insulting. I mean, if this minimap could talk, I feel like it would spend the entire game calling the player a moron for needing help walking in a straight line. The linearity of Final Fantasy X is one of the worst things about it, and the minimap makes this quality even worse. Still, even without it, the linearity of this game would be a problem. You may think that older Final Fantasy games are mostly linear anyway, so it's no big deal, but the reality is that in every game before this, you constantly have to work out where to go for yourself, whether that's navigating a pre-rendered background, to navigating branching dungeons, to navigating big open towns, to navigating big overworlds, or just working out where the next quest objective might be. Sometimes these games could be criticised for being too vague, but a lot of the time this was deliberate, with multiple games having sections where you're just told to go out into the world and explore until you find something helpful. But now, all of this is gone as you spend the whole game moving along a linear path where it's always obvious where to go, and the loss of exploration discovery and adventure that comes with this is immense. Some people may dislike having to work things out for themselves to begin with, but I think for most this is a massive downgrade. There might be benefits this linearity brings to story, pacing and ease of design, but something at the heart to be experienced is changed through this. And that is Final Fantasy X. I tend to think of this game as well-made, modern, accessible, and with several design choices that don't really appeal to me personally. It does make several improvements to the battle system, and has some really strong story concepts, with an aesthetic, setting, and soundtrack that all feel very fresh. But there's no getting around the fact that this is a new generation of Final Fantasy, and from this point forward, there's a lot less tying each game in the series together to ensure fans of one game might still enjoy the experience provided by another. Still, anyone that thought Final Fantasy X was a dramatic departure wouldn't have to wait long to get an even greater shock. Final Fantasy was created after Sakaguchi was inspired by several Western RPGs and then persuaded Square to make their own version. And Final Fantasy XI was exactly the same. 
After moving to Hawaii and playing several Western MMOs, like Ultima Online and EverQuest, Sakaguchi tried to find a Japanese MMO and realized there wasn't any. And so he pushed Square to once more make their own and suggested they use Final Fantasy to do it. The single most contentious thing about Final Fantasy XI has to be its name. For years, Final Fantasy fans, who may not even have played XI, have complained that an MMO should not be part of the mainline series and that it should have instead been titled Final Fantasy Online. And I have to admit, as it would make this nightmare of a video shorter, I'm on Team Final Fantasy Online. Still, even if I didn't have ulterior motives, Final Fantasy Online was a sensible name. A precedent had been established for MMOs by the hugely important Ultima Online, and a precedent had been established for good Final Fantasy spin-offs with the higher quality than some mainline games, Final Fantasy Tactics. Still, those in charge didn't agree, which seeing as the same thing would happen with Dragon Quest X has always left me wondering if there's some kind of cultural or language reason for why Series Online might be less popular in Japan. Fantasy Star does somewhat dispute this, but once upon a time, Final Fantasy XI's name really was a big deal to people, and many fans were angry about it, as not everyone wanted to play an MMO, and in 2002, not everyone had the internet access needed to do so. Considering this was already a time when the Final Fantasy series was experiencing significant change, it made the decision to make this game a mainline entry a bold one. And I think it's a decision that reflected how important this game was to Square and its developers, and how much they believed in it. And eventually, they would be proven right, as in 2012, it was declared to be the most profitable game in the series. There are a lot of interesting things about Final Fantasy XI, like its automated translation system and global servers. But for the purpose of this video, I want to focus on it more as a Final Fantasy game than as an MMO, particularly as I've talked about MMOs extensively already in the past. Still, by the standards of modern MMOs, Final Fantasy XI, in its original form, was an incredibly punishing, challenging, and all-round inaccessible experience, where you lost XP on death and could even lose levels, and you had to work together with other players in almost all facets of the game. This makes XI a lot like most other MMOs from its era, although it does seem interesting that despite wanting to appeal to Final Fantasy fans and new MMO players, particularly in Japan, that XI wasn't designed to be a more accessible take on the genre, a bit like World of Warcraft would go on to be a bit later. Instead, its designers sought to embrace the already punishing nature of MMOs to create a unique Final Fantasy experience, which would use this challenge and inaccessibility to bring people together and forge real-life friendships similar to the fictional ones that might be seen between your average Final Fantasy party members. And in this aspect, Eleven succeeded, as one of its most defining and fondly remembered qualities is its highly social nature, which I think has best been described by the saying that in most games you play online with your friends, but in Final Fantasy XI you play online and make friends. In other ways, XI took heavy inspiration from past Final Fantasies, particularly three, which was the last Final Fantasy game that XI's producer, Hiromichi Tanaka, had worked on and served as an inspiration for a lot of its world and gameplay design. To this end, Eleven marks a return to the iconic job system, by not only featuring many of the same jobs, but also retaining the ability to change freely between them whenever players want, all on a single character. This was a unique feature for an MMO, and helped to create a lot of Eleven's depth and long-term progression through the use of a Final Fantasy V-inspired support system where you could use abilities and traits from a secondary job. Eleven was more of a departure in gameplay, as for the first time in the series, there were no more random encounters, and players could move about freely in combat in real time. Combat itself features a lot of waiting around and auto-attacking, which I suppose is quite Final Fantasy. But in a game where you might spend hundreds if not thousands of hours in combat, is not 
very exciting. The battle system is expanded upon when you join a party, as different jobs can perform different roles, and you can also take advantage of a skill chain system to perform combos with other players. By today's standards, combat can seem rather boring, even in a group, and as the main way to level up is to repeatedly kill the same enemies in a single location until you're high enough level to go to the next location, this can lead to a rather tedious experience. I'm sure this was more exciting in 2002, but I still think this is Final Fantasy XI's biggest flaw, alongside its terrible mouse and keyboard support, that is. But there is still one part of this game that stands out above all others, and feels impressive even by the standards of today, and that is the world itself. This game is huge. There are lots of different zones and every one of them is expansive, and to travel from one side of this world to the other is a serious and time-consuming commitment. The sense of scale this creates is incredibly immersive, realistic, and a little bit intimidating. You can get lost in this game, and you might get lost more than you wish. And to go alongside this is the danger from the actual monsters, which can vary a lot, even in early game zones, meaning you always have to be careful not to get too close to dangerous foes, or to take on more than you can handle. There's a sense that this world feels alive, and its layout, enemy placement, and topography all feel somewhat natural as opposed to being designed explicitly for the player's personal enjoyment. You might look at these zones and say they seem bland and empty, and to a degree that is true, but in reality that's how nature often is, and when considered alongside the scale of it all, this was still a visually impressive world back in its day. There are other details that enhance immersion too, like not only a day and night cycle, but a full-on 360 day calendar, where one day in game is about one hour in real life, complete with different seasons and moon phases that have their own impact. When you consider this against the degree of simulation in previous Final Fantasy games, it makes Eleven pretty special in its own way. There's also a story that starts off much more focused on world building than world saving. The setting is diverse with a more traditional fantasy aesthetic and multiple different nations and races. Over time, as more and more expansions released, the story became a larger part of the experience, but that is not something I know too much about, so I won't pretend otherwise. It's easy to overlook Final Fantasy XI's role in the series, or decry it as a misnamed spin-off, but really, XI took one of the single most important concepts in Final Fantasy and expanded upon it like never before. At its heart, Final Fantasy is often about going on a fantastical adventure with a group of friends. In past games, those friends were fictional, whereas in Eleven, they are real people. And while past games tried so hard to create an illusion of a large open world to adventure in, Eleven actually made that illusion a reality. Hiromichi Tanaka has described Final Fantasy XI as the most Final Fantasy game in the series, and whether you agree with that or not, it's not hard to see where he's coming from. Final Fantasy XI was also a statement, however, that the series is not defined by its past or genre, that each entry can be different in more ways than just setting and gameplay, and that games can go against what fans want and still end up successful. For modern Final Fantasy, however, this was still only the beginning. Final Fantasy X was critically and commercially successful, but it would be five whole years before fans would get another single-player entry into the main series. That didn't mean there were no new major Final Fantasy games in this period, however, as in a first for Final Fantasy, X would receive a direct sequel in 2003, followed soon after by the start of the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, which would include multiple new games and a movie. This focus on sequels and spin-offs was something Sakaguchi had long opposed, but by this point, he was no longer at the newly merged Square Enix. It was within this period of change that the next mainline game would be developed, 
Although the original director, Yasumi Matsuno, of Final Fantasy Tactics and Ogre Battle fame, would leave midway through development, with art director Hiroshi Minagawa and Final Fantasy IX director Hiroyuki Ito stepping up to finish the job. Still, after a drawn out development and numerous delays, Final Fantasy XII would release in 2006 at the end of the PlayStation 2's life. XII has the unique honour of being the only game in the mainline series to be set in a pre existing world, Ivalice, which is the same setting in the Final Fantasy Tactics series. And ultimately, this setting is one of its best features. While XII does provide a return to a more medieval esque flavour of fantasy, it draws its inspiration more from Middle Eastern sources than European, to provide something distinctive, diverse, and impressively cohesive. I've always felt there's an intangible quality to Twelve's music, art style, writing, and world design that just makes all these pieces fit together perfectly to create one of the most believable worlds in the series. It's also a setting that feels like it has a real sense of history, and a feeling that there are many locations that exist beyond the game's borders, as well as other stories taking place in the background, which all helps it to avoid the problem of a main story dominating the setting in a way that makes the setting feel lesser, as can perhaps be seen in certain other Final Fantasies. To go alongside this strong setting are further advances in presentation, with perhaps the biggest being a fully controllable camera, this was something that Ten rather needed in its few moments of non-linearity, and it helps make the world feel more immersive and exploring more active. There's just one little problem with this camera, which is that both the X and Y axis are inverted, and there's no way to change them. It's quite easy to forget that third-person camera controls weren't always standardised, Yet, even in the long forgotten distant past of the mid 2000s, most games at least gave you the option to change between inverted and normal controls. Not 12, though, so have fun accidentally looking at the ground while trying to break many years of camera conditioning. Unless you're team inverted, of course, in which case, by all means, enjoy your moment but know that you are on the wrong side of history. Now I'm wondering how many people became Team Inverted directly as a result of playing this game at a formative age. It's probably a reasonable amount. Anyway, 12 now always uses the same character models rather than sometimes switching between higher and lower fidelity versions, improving consistency, and voice acting is also better, as while 10 wasn't bad, 12 is actually good. Except, of course, for the audio quality of certain parts, which can sound strangely compressed. It's been a long time since we did anything together. Too long. 12's world design also feels more impressive because of how open and expansive its zones are after the restrictive linearity of 10. Overall, though, stronger graphics were something most people expected from Square Enix by this point. But for a PlayStation 2 game, Final Fantasy XII really feels like it pushes the system to its absolute limits. It's in story and gameplay where opinions start to get a bit more mixed about this game though, but for me, Final Fantasy XII has always been a game that is a little disappointing, not because it's bad, but because it's so good and yet should have been better. The story starts off with a lot going on, but at its core, it's a return to the Rebels vs Evil Empire premise that's seen so often in the series. Except, this time, the Empire isn't really evil. They're still not good, obviously, they do have Empire in their name after all, and they do invade the much smaller nation of Dalmasca during the game's opening, giving the player and most of the game's characters a strong reason to dislike them. But rather than being depicted in black and white, 12 instead takes a much more nuanced and believable approach. Vane, the Empire's new Dalmascan ruler, for example, comes across as very reasonable, while soldiers and generals are often shown to be just doing their job. This gives the story a sense of subtlety and maturity even, and much of this game's writing and dialogue is similarly strong, being delivered with an almost Shakespearean flair that adds a lot of style 
and possibly alienate some non-English speakers who can't play this game in their native language. Dialogue isn't exactly easy to follow, but it is memorable. The characters also show a lot of potential. Our stereotypical young street urchin Van is joined by childhood friend Pinello, sky pirate duo Balfir and Fran, disgraced knight Barsh, and princess in hiding Ash. And it's a promising cast with lots of room for tension, development, and entertainment as a result of their strong personalities, varied backgrounds, and ideological differences. In fact, everything seems great, and yet by the end of the game, it feels like the story rather loses its way. The premise is interesting precisely because the small band of rebels that the game's characters soon become involved with are hopelessly outmatched against the vastly bigger and highly competent Empire, with the real conflict seeming to be between the Empire and another powerful nation to the south. And yet, as the story goes on, the other nation seems to get forgotten, and the rebels just seem to get upgraded so the story can have a much more conventional Rebels vs Empire finale. This is accompanied by the familiar magical crystals and ancient beings revelations, which don't exactly add much this time around. What's more, throughout the story, the game seems to struggle with providing the player with meaningful objectives. For most of the game, you're either traveling through several locations in a row to get to a destination where the story can continue, or being sent to a tomb of some kind to fetch an item. The exceptions to this usually involve the party getting captured, which happens three times in quick succession in the game's first half and yet every time the party just quickly escapes with ease, which really hurts the story's sense of tension. All of this though isn't that different to many other Final Fantasy games, but the thing which usually helps make up for these kinds of shortcomings is the characters. In 12 however, characters quickly seem to take a back seat. There are examples of development amongst them, but it largely happens off screen, and they do interact with each other yet only in very short sections where they usually just talk about the current objective. This leads to a noticeable pacing problem where in this long and very combat heavy game you might spend hours and hours fighting through multiple locations with only a couple lines of dialogue as you enter a new area by way of story. It also makes these characters feel rather distant. We don't see them interact as friends, we don't get moments of downtime to just see them exist in this world, and we don't see very far inside their heads. In fact, we don't get much from these characters at all after the opening sections. And yet, I don't think this alone would be a big problem, and there are plenty of JRPGs where characters talk too much, so it can be nice to have the opposite. Therefore, I conclude that the real problem isn't the lack of character focus, or that the main story disappoints in its second half, but rather the combination of these two. If a main story delivers, it can easily make up for character problems, and if characters deliver, they can make up for story problems, but Final Fantasy XII excels at the setup, and then just delivers a bit too little. Which sounds a lot like the gameplay. XII removes the random encounters and separate battle screens of the past, to create a real-time system where characters attack automatically and can be issued commands. This has sometimes dismissively been called MMO combat, and it does have similarities to XI, but really it's only transitioning classic Final Fantasy combat into real time. And this is what people once wanted. Maybe times have changed, but in the mid-2000s there was a lot of hate directed at random encounters and turn-based battles, and a lot of people critics and fans both were saying that this type of gameplay is dated and unacceptable in the then modern age. And if there is one thing Final Fantasy has always strived for, it's cutting edge presentation. So random encounters and static battles simply had to go. And this ended up being true for most JRPG series in this period, with those that didn't follow this rule transitioning to handhelds instead, and it wasn't until the likes of Persona 5 and Dragon Quest XI where classic turn-based battles seemed to become acceptable again in big-budget games, possibly as a result of it becoming so much rarer.
Now, I'm not saying this was right, by the way, I'm just telling you how it was. If Final Fantasy wanted to maintain its level of success, it had to move beyond its classic gameplay, and the system scene in Final Fantasy XII was a logical step. The presentation feels modern, the ability to issue commands is maintained, and attacks are automated because why slow combat down by forcing players to repeatedly issue standard attack commands? The thing is, attacks weren't the only thing that was automated. The developers of this system were clearly faced with a problem over what to do with the other party members, and so rather than forcing players to rely on AI, or forcing players to slow down to issue every command, they created a highly customizable way to control your party through the Gambit system. This is a bit like very simplified programming, where you can set actions for characters to perform automatically on the basis of certain conditions. For example, if party member health drops below 70%, cast Cure. You can then have multiple of these gambits, and the order they're in determines their priority. And this is a great replacement for AI, as the player can customize their party members however they want, and it creates a rewarding, almost mini-game of tweaking your gambits to try to optimize them, where you might want to change around small details like at what percentage health loss to start healing. You can then watch how things play out and see if you need to make further enhancements to create some really effective gambit setups. And that's really the problem. Gambits can soon become too effective, to the point where gameplay is basically entirely automated, and the player just watches. Which makes it a bit like an idle game, or an auto-battler. Or, if you'd prefer a more crude metaphor, uh, the Gambit system basically cucks you. I mean, it can play with your characters better than you can, because it reacts so fast, so it takes over and you just sit on your chair, watching. Tweaking your gambits is fun though, but you do quickly move into set and forget territory, and in classic Final Fantasy fashion, auto-attacking and curing can handle almost anything. The one exception is status effects, so they become the main thing you take over for, but eventually you can just automate them too. There are two things that I think need to be said about this. The first is that the original Final Fantasy XII is a challenging game, maybe the hardest in the series since V. The more recent Zodiac remaster that a lot of people might be familiar with, however, is far easier, as enemies have had a major stat reduction and you also get an extra license board to make your characters more powerful. Some people say Final Fantasy XII just plays itself, and for the Zodiac remaster that seems fair, but for the original it's not. You have to be careful not to pull too many enemies or you'll die, you're way more likely to need to tweak your gambits to succeed, and boss fights hit really hard, meaning the gambits that have been carrying you through basic encounters are usually not enough to cope with the increased damage and whatever other problems bosses throw at you, forcing you to heavily intervene or create some boss-specific gambits. In this way, 12 is a lot like most Final Fantasies, where normal combat is simple and things only get more involved in boss fights and on rare occasions where things go wrong. It's just that this time the simple combat is even simpler, even if in other ways Final Fantasy 12 is a harder game than most, particularly in its substantial endgame content. The second thing that needs to be said is that the solution to this problem seems obvious. Just create more active elements to combat, like positioning to hit multiple enemies with AoE attacks, or positioning to avoid enemy attacks, or having a simple combo system where a spell becomes more effective if used quickly after another character's spell, or just have more situational abilities to take advantage of. There are ways this system can be improved, Gambits aren't the problem, and nor is the real-time combat, it just needs a little more on top of what's here to stop it from becoming over-automated and too hands-off. Less normal encounters would also help, as this game is dense with combat, to the point where it often feels repetitive. Also, if we're being greedy now, uh, maybe some better dungeons would help too.
you know, a few more unique mechanics, maybe things that might impact Gambit, like a dungeon where spells cast slowly to mess with the player's health thresholds, that sort of thing. At the moment, it's like the game has one trick up its sleeve, which is status effects, and I'm just saying, maybe some more tricks could help shake things up a bit. Also, the option to save and have multiple Gambit setups would be really helpful as well, as that way you could really lean into those bosses and dungeons that try to cause the player to change their gambits. And really, there are many things which could be done, but the point is, the actual idea is good. The foundation is perfect, and it just needed a few enhancements to truly shine. Still, for a first draft of something so new, it is a great attempt. For the combat system of a 90 plus hour game though, it is a lot of sitting in your chair and watching the Gambit system play with your characters for you. The license board also exists, and it's a fun progression system. The openness provides lots of choice about what to prioritize getting, you can build very different characters, and there's an addictive quality to acquiring and spending points while planning out what to get next. That said, there's no reason for what's on the board to have been hidden to players, Needing a license to use equipment in addition to the actual item can be annoying, and the openness that makes it so enjoyable early on ends up being a double-edged blade, as in the late game you start running out of licenses to buy, leading to your characters becoming increasingly homogenized until you reach a point where everyone can do everything. Overall though, I think the license board is one of the better systems in the series, but in classic 12 fashion, there is plenty of room for improvement. Final Fantasy XII is even more different to earlier titles than X was, and it's also a vastly different experience to X itself, to the point where the two games can sometimes feel like polar opposites. Open vs linear, understated storytelling vs overstated, a return to classic turn-based vs something modern and innovative, one of the most character-driven games vs one of the least, and so on. And this contrast really highlights the changing nature of the series in this era. Yet for me, Final Fantasy XII will always be the game with so much promise that still managed to be really good. The new combat system, the gambit system, the story and characters all don't meet their potential, but all have positives. And in other ways, there's so much about this game that is high quality and its setting is easily one of the best in Final Fantasy. It seems a great shame sometimes that some of the best ideas in this series don't always get that second chance to do things better. The job system is one of the most popular and iconic parts of Final Fantasy, and the second attempt brought such drastic improvements with fairly minor changes. I do love the changing nature of this series, and even more importantly, I respect it. But sometimes, it is hard not to wonder what could have been if things didn't change so much, and promising ideas did get a second attempt. In the end though, instead of another game following in the footsteps of 12, the series would once more go in a wildly different direction. Development for the next Final Fantasy would begin several years before 12's release, with it originally intended to be for the PlayStation 2. This time, Matomu Toriyama would step up to the director's seat after being a key designer on 10 and directing 10 2. And there are plenty of similarities between these games in staff and design choices. Like Final Fantasy XII, however, development would not go smoothly, and after a number of delays, Final Fantasy XIII would eventually release at the end of 2009 on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. If there is one single thing that does manage to stay consistent throughout this series, it has to be strong presentation, and Final Fantasy XIII is no exception. It's easy to forget this game will soon be 14 years old, as much of its visuals still hold up today. Some environments in particular look stunning, but from character models to animations, monster designs, lighting effects, menu designs, CGI sequences and more, this game does much to impress on a technical level, and this is all supported by the game's distinct visual style and soundtrack that is more futuristic, vibrant and energetic than any of the previous games in the series. The setting also feels unique, being neither traditional fantasy nor alternate modern day 
but something more futuristic and strange. In it, humans live on Cocoon, a large artificial sphere which was created by strange powerful beings called Falsi, and floats above the much larger world of Pulse. Final Fantasy XIII can be a confusing game. It has a much more in-media res opening than any of the games before it, with the story actually starting several days earlier, as you will come to see in a large number of flashbacks. To go alongside this, there's heavy use of fictional terms like Fallacy, Lussy, Seif, Pulse, Cocoon, Sanctum, Psycom, The Vestige, and so on, none of which initially mean much to the player. As a result of this, the story is forced to lean heavily on exposition as the game attempts to explain what is going on and what all these different terms and concepts mean. But one thing that seems missing this time around is anything to establish the setting. I've always found it hard to imagine what normal life is like in 13's world, and that's after having played this game twice. During the opening, you have no idea. The world seems to be a vast, dark metropolis of green lights and floating towers, and combined with all the fighting, it gives the impression of a bleak, harsh cyberpunk dystopia where people's lives are ruled by violence and fear. But pretty soon, you see other places that are bright and colourful with people living seemingly completely carefree. Some places on Cocoon are large, open expanses of untouched nature, but others are very urban. Many areas seem to be filled with monsters, and even in cities there can be monsters around. And overall, I struggle to visualise all this as some kind of cohesive whole. I'm not even sure what the scale is meant to be. You can see Cocoon in the sky later on, but without knowing the distance, that doesn't tell you much. I also struggle to imagine what the average day is like for the average person in this world, or whether most people even have jobs, or if the world is more run by a combination of foul sea and automation, or even what most of our main characters were up to before the events of the game. The point is, Final Fantasy XIII's setting is even more out there than usual, Therefore, it's even more important to communicate what this setting is like to players. Past games were full of normal people doing normal things, with lots of moments of downtime, but in 13 this doesn't happen, and instead, the story's main focus seems to be all about… drama. As you fight through the opening level, you're introduced to five characters. Lightning, Sars, Snow, Vanille, and Hope who are all caught up in the middle of a purge, which is where humans are removed from Cocoon and sent to Pulse, the world below, for coming into contact with a Pulse Falsi, which are considered dangerous because it can turn people into Lussi, which are basically Falsi chosen ones who are given a mission they have to complete or they turn into Seif, which are basically zombies. Did that make sense? If not, there's a data log in game if you want to know more. Anyway, during the purge, they accidentally stumble into the Pulse Falsi itself, which does turn them all into Lussi, meaning they have to complete a mission it gives them or die. Except they have no idea what their mission is, as the Falsi doesn't communicate, and if they do succeed their mission, they get turned into a crystal instead of a zombie, which is what happens to Lightning's sister Sarah, although this basically means they die either way. And now that they're Pulse Lussi, it means they're the enemies of Cocoon, because Cocoon has its own Cocoon Falsi, and there was once a war between Cocoon and Pulse, so everyone hates everything to do with Pulse. So, they're now all guaranteed to die and are hated by everyone. And this is a stressful situation. Lightning's also lost her sister, Hope's lost his mum, Snow's lost his fiancée, Vanille's lost several brain cells, and Sars is worried about his child. And so, at the start of our story, everyone's a little… irritable. Hope gets angry at Snow, Lightning gets angry and pushes Sars, then Lightning gets angry at Snow, then she gets angry at Snow again, pushes Sars again, what did he do, and then punches Snow after he says he'll save Sarah, then Snow shouts at Sars, then Hope gets angry at everyone because he became a lassie, then Snow gets angry at Hope for being angry, then Lightning gets angry at Snow again, and threatens him with a blade at his throat, 
then a bit later Lightning punches Snow again, and then Snow decides to split from the group, supposedly because he disagrees with them and wants to try to save Sarah, but possibly as a way to avoid the constant physical abuse from Lightning. Then Benil, whose main personality trait is being easygoing and upbeat, gets angry at Hope, and then Sars and Lightning argue, causing the group to split up. And that is the first three to four hours. A nice even blend between exposition dumps and anger, and not much else. Anyway, I'm sure it was a long day for all involved, so while this much rage and arguing is excessive, at least it must soon stop, if only because everyone splits up. But it doesn't, it just evolves. Hope starts obsessing over getting the chance to murder Snow, while Sars starts obsessing over how much he hates Pulse and everyone from there, in part because his child became a cocoon lassie. What Sars doesn't know is that Benil is from Pulse, so this makes her feel guilty and she cries. Then the group starts slowly meeting back up. Lightning meets the sixth and final party member Fang and tries to welcome her to the group. We messed up. Sorry. <laughs> Meanwhile, the SARS and Vanil situation continues to escalate, with SARS finally learning she's from Pulse, culminating in SARS threatening to shoot her, and then Vanil asking SARS to shoot her. Shoot me! For your son! Don't you even! You think you die? And that's that? Mm -hmm. You think you die and everything will be sugar and rainbows? Then what can I do? What do you want from me? If I can't live or die, what do you want me to do? Don't ask me. You figure it out. Then, after some boss fights and character development, Sars instead decides to just shoot himself. Enough. Is enough. Meanwhile, Hope and Snow are reunited after Snow jumps in and saves Hope from some soldiers. Now, this part, I think, requires some additional context. You see, at the start of the game, Hope's mum joined the resistance force Snow was leading during the purge, and then later, Snow and her fell, where Snow tried to save her but failed, which Hope watched. From then on, Hope blames her death on Snow, but Snow has no idea this person was Hope's mum. So now, when Snow and Hope finally meet again, this is how it culminates. How do you pay for what you've done? I can't! All right. There is nothing that can make something like that right again. When someone's dead, when someone's gone, words are useless. So that's it? People die and you just run away? I know! It's all my fault. I don't know how to fix it. Where do you start? What do you say? can do is go forward. Keep fighting and surviving until I find the answers I need. There are no answers! You're running from what you deserve! Well, why don't you tell me what I deserve? The same fate! Nora Estheim. She was my mother. And she died because of you! You? You're the one she meant! I think Final Fantasy XIII can be described as aggressively melodramatic. 
One thing I hate about this is how much of it's based on misunderstandings. For one thing, Snow didn't do anything wrong regarding Hope's mom. He actually tried to save her, so it doesn't make sense why Hope blames him, let alone to the point of wanting to kill him. But also, this scene only escalates in the way it does, as for the entire section, Snow doesn't know what Hope's talking about, leading him to say the wrong things over and over, and this goes on for about an hour, as the writers try to extract as much drama from the situation as possible. Meanwhile, with Sars and Vanille, it's basically the same, as Sars doesn't realize Vanille is from Pulse, leading him to constantly say the worst thing, and then Vanille gets blamed for turning Sars' son into a lessee, even though that wasn't really her fault either. As for the arguing and lightning, I think it's worth noting that there has been plenty of tension between party members before. Cyan and Celis, Barrett and Cloud, Squall being rude, Zidane and Steiner, Waka and anyone he can be racist towards, Barsh and Barn. There have been arguments and misunderstandings and people blaming each other for someone's death, and so on. But it has never been anywhere near this relentless and constant, and it's never involved physicality. Lightning hits Sars, and Fang, and Snow twice, and threatens to kill Snow? And Lightning's upset because of her sister, I get that, but none of these people have done or even said anything wrong. Snow's optimism is annoying, he is an annoying character, but that's his only sin, and it's not an acceptable reason to hit him. Lashing out at people whenever you lose your temper doesn't make you a cool character, and it certainly doesn't make them a badass, strong female lead. It just makes them a bit pathetic. Lightning's personality is meant to be inspired by Cloud, but could you imagine if Cloud hit people whenever he got angry? Could you imagine Cloud backhanding Aerith for being too optimistic in the face of a hopeless situation? Because I couldn't. From here, the characters get a lot better as they come together and grow a bit, but I don't think the same can be said for the main story, which I don't want to spoil, but to me feels rather contrived, particularly surrounding the main villain, their motivation, and the party's actions. In 13's defense though, there are things about its story that are good. The voice acting, some of the dialogue, the cinematic quality of cutscenes, and the use of music are all often well done, and some of the concepts seen in this story are interesting. But overall, I do find it a bit difficult to enjoy when none of the things that I really care about, like levity, charm, or a strong setting, ever seem to be a priority. Still, I wish I could say that the story is the worst thing about Final Fantasy XIII, but unfortunately, it's not, because just as this game is aggressively melodramatic, it's also aggressively linear. In this way, it's a lot like Final Fantasy X, but unlike X, there are no real cities, no NPCs to talk to, no real shops, no mini-games, no puzzle sections, and no other variety. There are three things you do in this game. Walk forward, fight enemies, and watch cutscenes. This makes the experience feel overly repetitive, but it also makes this world less believable. A world of hallways is artificial, and that's about the only thing used to represent this world for most of its runtime, which makes the world feel lifeless. Unlike 10, however, you can actually turn the minimap off this time, which I find to be a much more immersive and enjoyable way to play that also feels a lot less linear. It's not perfect, as you can get turned around through the transition to battles, and it stops every chest from being obvious, putting you at a disadvantage, but it's also a more engaging way to play that really helps you appreciate the great visuals as you spend your time actually looking at the world around you rather than fixating on the minimap. The linearity of Final Fantasy XIII is sometimes defended through the existence of Grand Pulse, a very large and open area found towards the end of the game. But while this is enjoyable after what comes before it, in much the same way that a glass of water is enjoyable after spending many hours feeling thirsty, it's still too little too late, and the side quests are disappointingly basic and repetitive. It's also annoying that the side quests have to be completed in a linear order, 
and Grand Pole still feels like a missed opportunity to me. You hear so much about it throughout the story, and it could have been a chance to create something really different, yet when you arrive you find the exact same slugs and flan type enemies that you've fought many times before in a similar looking hallway, and on Cocoon you see plenty of areas of nature, while Pulse still has signs of civilization. I'm not sure why Cocoon wasn't entirely urban and Pulse entirely natural, with distinct monsters found in each location, so that Pulse could feel like a completely new experience. Regardless, to criticize 13 for its linearity without criticizing Final Fantasy X as well is unfair, but that doesn't mean that both shouldn't be criticized or that the problem in 13 isn't considerably worse. When it comes to combat, however, I do think 13 is a bit more successful, although that success still comes with heavy caveats. Final Fantasy 13 represents a second attempt at modernizing the classic gameplay of the series in a way that creates more immersive visuals while retaining older tactical elements, and it is quite a unique system. The first problem you run into though is how slowly gameplay elements are introduced. At the start of the game, there is nothing to do in combat other than press A to attack, and this lasts for two and a half hours. After this, the gang get La Cid, which, in a return to the more diegetic gameplay systems of 6, 7 and 8, explains where all your power comes from, as it is through becoming a La Cid that you gain the ability to use magic or spend points to level up. Here, you also gain access to the main part of combat, Paradigm Shifting, which involves changing the roles of party members in combat between different setups. These roles are dealing damage, increasing stagger, buffing, debuffing, healing and tanking, and through this combat becomes about regularly switching between different offensive, defensive or supporting combinations of these roles. Generally you'll want to start offensive while switching to something defensive whenever you need healing and adding in support as needed for more challenging foes. The stagger meter becomes the main thing to add complexity to this, as you want to manage these setups while trying to charge or maintain stagger to eventually gain bonus damage and increase your efficiency. And this is okay. There's a fine line to discover between being overly safe and overly aggressive. Buffs and debuffs can both be useful, with the trade-off being they take time to set up, and there is some variety between different enemies to encourage different approaches. Except, Shortly after all this is introduced, the game bumps you down from three party members to two, meaning your different combinations of roles becomes much more limited, and combat becomes boring. And then the game stays with two party members for hours and hours and hours. You do get a few brief respites on occasion just to give you a taste of what combat is meant to be like, but then it's back to two party members again and you don't fully gain the ability to change your party members and always have three people in combat until about 16 hours in. That's how long it takes before the game is willing to fully remove the training wheels and just let you play. After this, the gameplay gets better, and 13 is a reasonably challenging game, particularly in its normal combat encounters, although you now heal after every fight, meaning any sense of resource management or consequence to battles has been completely removed. Considering how poorly many past games had handled this aspect, this doesn't seem like the biggest loss by this stage, but it is still a loss. Still, there is one final problem with 13's combat, which is that much like Final Fantasy XII, auto battle is just too good. 13's combat is basically the same ATB system seen in so many earlier games, just sped up and with a visual upgrade. Encounters are no longer random, but you still transition into a separate battle screen, and once you're in battle, you now only control a single character, with other characters being controlled by AI and acting simultaneously. This may seem like a strange change to make, but the increased speed creates battles that look like characters are actually fighting, rather than just standing around waiting for their turn, and this seems to be the main priority of this combat system, with the developers being on record saying that their goal was to create combat that looked like the movie Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. However, because the ATB bar charges so fast, and characters perform multiple actions in a row, it means trying to manually select what to do in time becomes really challenging, 
hence the auto battle option, which is the default option in combat. Auto battle will react instantly and automatically check if enemies have a strength or weakness when selecting what to do, as well as switching between single target or AoE while queuing only the correct amount of heals and so on, and it's really effective. Basically, it's just better than the player in almost every way, with the two exceptions being buffs and debuffs, where your priority might differ from the AI's. And so combat becomes auto-battling and paradigm shifting, and while the paradigm shift system is okay on its own and does force you to pay attention, it's still not really enough to keep combat engaging when there's so much of it and a single encounter can take over 5 minutes. And honestly, from a gameplay perspective, auto battle is clearly a mistake, and yet it was necessary because of the speed of combat, which was necessary to create flashy visuals, which was the most important part for the developers. So basically, Final Fantasy XIII automates a large part of its combat system just to make it look more impressive. The only thing necessary to remove this need for auto battle is to slow combat down and have players choose one action at a time rather than five, which would then make players more involved. This could then be improved further by allowing players to switch freely between characters, perhaps during paradigm shifts, so you have complete control over things your AI teammates might get wrong, like buffs and debuffs, or healing the wrong target. Instead though, Final Fantasy XIII chooses to make visuals the highest priority, and while I guess combat does look pretty flashy in this game, it's amazing how quickly the visuals stop feeling impressive, and how much more combat will still be ahead of you afterwards. Lastly, Final Fantasy XIII's main progression system is the Crystarium, which is often described as a streamlined and linear sphere grid. There is some degree of prioritization going on when deciding which order to acquire levels here, and people seem to overestimate how non-linear the sphere grid actually was, so this doesn't seem like much of a downgrade from 10, even if it is one. That said, the sphere grid at least felt like an original idea, whereas the Crystarium is just a slightly worse version of it, making it boring as well as basic. Also, the process of upgrading equipment in this game is tedious and makes acquiring new equipment feel a little pointless. Overall, Final Fantasy XIII feels like an experiment in streamlining. It's as if the developers looked at Final Fantasy games of the past and decided to focus on what they felt were the most important aspects, while disregarding most others. For the story, this meant a focus on high stakes and high drama, while humour, downtime and natural world building were overlooked. For the world design, this meant visually impressive backgrounds, with no more exploration, cities, NPCs or unnecessary smaller details. For the combat, this meant impressive visuals and intermittent strategic intervention, with the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay and resource management removed. And overall, this meant cutscenes, combat and moving forward, with nothing else deemed to be that necessary. The result is a game that in many ways feels like a step in the wrong direction, and yet Final Fantasy XIII was highly original, with a strong and distinct sense of style, a fresh setting, and a genuinely innovative combat system. Still, the feeling of moving backwards might help explain why the fan reaction was so negative for XIII, because for all this game's fault, it did receive more hate than it deserved. When judged as a product of its time, I do think Final Fantasy XIII is the worst game in the main series, but I still think it's not that bad. It's not great, admittedly, but the soundtrack and visuals alone do some serious heavy lifting, and as a complete package, it was better than many made it out to be. In fact, Final Fantasy XII and XIII both received a lot of pushback for being different, and while this is something you can see all across the series, XII and XIII were two of the most heavily affected, because they released at a time when no one knew where Final Fantasy or JRPGs were going. And so, once upon a time, Final Fantasy XII and XIII each represented a possible future. They could have been the games which all others would copy that might forever change gaming as we know it. In the end, that didn't happen, but back then, 
No one knew that, and so everyone who didn't like the direction these two games took the series had an even greater incentive to make their displeasure known, and I think that did unfairly damage their reputations. And so, Final Fantasy XIII was the most heavily criticised game in the series up until this point, and that can't have been an easy thing to see for those in charge. But, as it turned out, things were about to get a whole lot worse. Final Fantasy XIV first released in September 2010 and marked a spectacular fall from grace for what was once considered one of the most critically acclaimed series in gaming. With a 49 out of 100 on Metacritic and an even worse user score, Final Fantasy XIV was described as shallow, slow, broken, incomplete, and quote, woefully inferior in every important way to almost every MMO ever released. And it wasn't just words. In the months following its release, Square Enix would slash their projected yearly profit by 90%. This would coincide with the more negative than expected reception to Final Fantasy XIII, as well as several major delays to other highly anticipated games, making this, without doubt, the lowest point for the Final Fantasy series, and it came at a time when bigger budget JRPGs were getting noticeably rarer and worse reviewed, while the Japanese gaming industry as a whole was experiencing a bit of an identity crisis as it struggled to keep up with Western developers after the move to the HD era. The original Final Fantasy XIV was intended to be a spiritual successor to Final Fantasy XI, featuring a familiar aesthetic and similar design philosophy. Its problems resulted from a mixture of poor execution and outdated design, with the user interface and limitations on experience point gain being particularly criticised, and the impressive graphics being marred by frequent bugs, long load times, and poor frame rates. And so, two years after its release, its discontinuation was announced, with a meteor being summoned as a part of the game's story, which appeared in the game world and fell from the sky to destroy the world, all of its players, and the entirety of the game which, in the long history of online gaming, has got to be the most impressive way a game has ever been shut down. And so, Final Fantasy XIV was rebuilt from the ground up, under the guidance of new director and producer Naoki Yoshida, with an entirely new engine, improved server infrastructure, revamped gameplay, and a new design philosophy that would look more to the highly successful World of Warcraft than the now often considered dated Final Fantasy XI. The story would involve the same world of the original game, which was now entering into a new astral era after the calamity that had ended its last iteration. And in August 2013, Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn was released to a much warmer critical and fan reception. As an MMO, Final Fantasy XIV is known for its heavy focus on story, its accessibility, its inclusive endgame design, and its passionate fanbase. But I have talked about this game at length before, so as with Eleven, I'd like to focus on it specifically as a Final Fantasy game. Fourteen is set in the world of Eorzea, which is a much more traditional medieval fantasy setting than any of the other modern games in the series. Once more, it is a racially and geographically diverse location, and while its zones can feel smaller than a lot of other MMOs, in particular Final Fantasy XI, its world still feels vast and detailed. The constant danger of Final Fantasy XI is also missing, but XIV tries to make up for this with a more relaxed atmosphere, creating a world that's enjoyable to be a part of and spend time in. Final Fantasy XI's use of distance and travel to build immersion is also forgotten, with XIV instead opting for a convenient teleportation system to allow players to get around quickly. The classic Final Fantasy job system does return, and is supported by tab-targeting based combat that has a bit more of the visual style the series is known for, but still feels much more MMO than Final Fantasy. Still, if Eleven was deep down all about its world, Fourteen is instead about the story. In it, you take the role of an inexperienced adventurer, chosen by the world's Mother Crystal, who will once again set about doing a number of not all that important tasks designed to establish the setting, 
as you join the Adventurers Guild and learn your way around. From there, however, 14 proceeds into much more traditional Final Fantasy territory. There is an evil empire you repeatedly clash with, a small group of reoccurring characters who don't usually join your party but still fulfill the narrative role of party members, and an action-packed main story that raises the stakes and layers revelations and complexity in a similar way to so many other games in the series. Unlike other Final Fantasy games, however, 14 then keeps going. With four current expansions, it might be best to think of Final Fantasy XIV as five normal Final Fantasy stories all directly connected, where each has a clear beginning and ending that could be experienced as a more traditional single-player experience, while also working together to create an overarching narrative that is in many ways greater than the sum of its parts. One of the defining aspects of the Final Fantasy series is the lack of continuity between mainline games, with each one being something entirely new. But if you've ever played a Final Fantasy game and wished that the story would continue after the ending, or that you could go on more adventures in the same world, then Final Fantasy XIV delivers on this spectacularly, and this unique quality of being always ongoing and always expanding, let alone the sheer scale of it, makes it completely unmatched in this specific way. And yet, as a story-focused experience, Final Fantasy XIV does have some problems. Firstly, it starts slowly, and often proceeds slowly, with long sections of dialogue and cutscenes, as well as frequent diversions and sub-stories that aren't always that important. Also, as Final Fantasy XIV is an MMO, its combat is built around group content, with different jobs having long rotations or specific party-based roles that don't translate very well to the simpler, single-player focused gameplay of the main storyline. The result is that what combat there is during the main story is often uninteresting, and many objectives players get sent on in the world involve little more than going from one location to another to do a generic menial task, before getting back to long sections of dialogue. This means the high quality of the story can be let down by the low quality of most of its gameplay, although for players willing to endure this and stick with 14 over its long, long journey, it does develop into a story unlike any other, with some very high highs. Still, while story might be what first comes to mind when many people think about Final Fantasy XIV, as a Final Fantasy game, there might be something else that is even more important about it, which is the way it celebrates the rest of the series. Final Fantasy IX is a game which tried to incorporate many elements of the series' past to create a unique homage to all that came before it, and 14 does the same, but on a vastly expanded scale. Sometimes this is in the way of very in-your-face fan service, like outfits of popular characters or limited events that tie in with new games, but often it's much more integrated and meaningful. The game's first 24-man raid was the Crystal Tower, the same highly memorable Crystal Tower from the end of Final Fantasy III, and this is something which exists within 14's world, provides an interesting interpretation of what the inside of this tower might look like in high definition, features many remixed Final Fantasy III songs, as well as familiar bosses and story elements, and yet for all this, the Crystal Tower in Final Fantasy XIV is first and foremost its own thing. It has its own important story, unique to Final Fantasy XIV, that connects with the world's lore and history, and you don't need to have played three to enjoy XIV's Crystal Tower. Basically, it is a reference to Final Fantasy III, but it's treated like much more than this, and that's ultimately why it works so well. There are examples like this from every game. Matoya and her cave from 1, the use of the password Wild Rose from 2, many parts of the moon from 4, the clash between Omega and Shinryu from 5, Magitek Armors from 6, the Gold Saucer from 7, Triple Triad from 8, Moogle Mail from 9, many Aeons from 10, Judges from 12, Enemies and Spells from 13, and so, so much more. Final Fantasy XIV is a genuine attempt to take parts of every other game in the series and craft them into a cohesive and meaningful whole. And considering the unique standalone nature of the rest of the series, where nothing directly ties each game together, this makes XIV feel pretty special. It also means that in this modern era of Final Fantasy, where each game seems so focused on reinvention and taking the series forward, XIV 
that there's still at least one mainline game, lovingly looking back at the past and all the great things which came before it. In many ways, Final Fantasy XIV is a good Final Fantasy game, not in spite of being an MMO like so many people might claim, but because of it. Also, Hironobu Sakaguchi's Twitter feed is almost exclusively images of what he's been up to in-game, and if that's not a good endorsement of XIV as a Final Fantasy game, then I don't know what is. Still, back to reinvention and trying to move the series forward. Final Fantasy XIII was originally intended to be part of a series of Final Fantasy games built around a shared mythos known as Fabula Nova Crystallis. One of these games was Final Fantasy vs. XIII, which was announced in 2006 and was to be directed by Final Fantasy character designer and Kingdom Hearts creator Tetsuya Nomura. However, after numerous delays and development troubles for multiple Final Fantasy games, Versus 13 was cancelled, with the project being rebranded as Final Fantasy 15, and Crisis Core and Final Fantasy Type-0 director Hajime Tabata taking over production. This was accompanied by many changes to the original vision and much speculation from fans, but in the end, 10 years after its original announcement, Final Fantasy XV would release on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One in November 2016. The Final Fantasy series has some great openings, and XV is one of them. After a brief foreboding vision that seems to be of the future, we watch a king seeing off his son and retinue on an important undisclosed mission. The tone here is serious and formal, promising of the epic world-saving adventure that you expect is soon to follow, and yet we then flash forward to a little later to see that the group's car has broken down almost immediately, with Prince Noctis and his companions arguing over how this happened and who's going to push it, while a custom rendition of Stand By Me plays in the background. Final Fantasy XV is one big road trip, and the intro wastes little time in establishing this premise, introducing the personality of our main characters, and cutting through the more dramatic elements of the story with something more low stakes and light-hearted that better represents what most of this game is actually going to be about. For the first time since 8, the series returns to a modern day setting, and it's one of the most relatable ones yet. Final Fantasy XV once more interweaves the grounded realism of everyday life with the high fantasy the series is known for, and yet it manages to stay surprisingly cohesive and believable. For example, a lot of the more out there Final Fantasy monsters are relegated to being demons only seen at night or in dungeons, so that the monsters seen in the open world all look convincingly like real animals this time around. Meanwhile, the world itself features some more spectacular elements while being mostly comprised of the mundane, with a heavy use of motels, diners, gas stations, and lots and lots of concrete, all things you very rarely see in a fantasy game. The setting itself seems to be heavily inspired by rural America, but it's more like rural America through the idealized eyes of a Japanese RPG designer, which helps make it still have a strong identity of its own. And the premise itself feels like a fun twist on how the series began. It's like someone said, what if we have four warriors of light going on a grand adventure traveling around a world of crystals, but we make everything modern day? And so our heroes are four normal looking guys, and their adventure is a car journey, and the crystals are at the heart of global political struggles. Final Fantasy XV also makes a return to the series' beginnings by being open world. What this term signifies has changed with time, but in early Final Fantasies, you spent a lot of time journeying across the overworld, and in Final Fantasy II at least, that overworld had a largely open structure. Of course, Final Fantasy XV wasn't the only game going open world at this time, and the decision to take this approach is surely more a reflection of game design trends in the 2010s rather than some purist desire to return to the series' roots. Still, unlike some other series that made a similar transition, an open world Final Fantasy feels like it makes sense. Overworlds were a part of the first nine games, 
And there's a sense that they only went away because they didn't fit with realistic graphics. And after they did disappear, many fans missed them. Meanwhile, an open world is really just a more zoomed in overworld, which accomplishes the same purpose of housing the game's important locations and allowing for exploration in a way that makes you feel like you're a part of the world. And immersing players in its experience is one of the main things that Final Fantasy XV excels at. The best example of this is resting. Once upon a time, tents were the single most important item in Final Fantasy, and in the first game, they were the only place you could save the game outside of sleeping at an inn. And finally, 29 years later, tents have returned to take back their throne, because camping is a big deal in this game. Many open world games feature a day-night cycle, and 15 is no exception, but in 15 the experience points you acquire while playing are only applied when you stop somewhere to rest, and at night demons come out to play, making completing activities rather impractical. This means every day when it starts getting dark you'll have to find somewhere to rest until morning, and needing to pay attention to the passage of time while actually sleeping each day is really immersive. It's a lot like real life, and it's the sort of thing games usually overlook. And this is what 15 does so well. You can sleep at campsites or other locations, and when you do, one of the party members, Prompto, will show you all the photos he took that day of the things you just got up to, which you can then save to create a record of your journey that you can later look back on. Meanwhile, Ignis cooks that bonus providing food, all of which is realistically rendered, and you can take time out to fish or play arcade games, or race chocobos or customize your car or yourself, or go shopping for new music, and all of this combines to give this world a lot of detail. All of this stuff is largely superfluous, but a lot of it comes with unique lines of dialogue and animations, and it's that same unessential quality that makes the world feel more believable. In many ways, it's the exact opposite of Final Fantasy XIII, where the entire world was represented through only the most necessary parts, which turned out to be combat cutscenes and hallways. In 15 though, you have unneeded open space, and long quiet car journeys, and scenes of the boys hanging out at the campsite, as well as other small random details, all of which exist not to further the story or provide compelling gameplay, but just to make you feel like you are a part of this world. From a technical perspective, Final Fantasy XV looks good, but it isn't the greatest looking open world game out there. There are smaller details it gets wrong, like a noticeable lack of sound effects for passing cars, or too much reuse of certain NPC models, and I also wish more of the UI was hidden outside of combat. But from a design perspective, this game can feel very impressive, and in much the same way that Red Dead Redemption 2 is the best cowboy simulator around, Final Fantasy XV is the best road trip with the boys in a modern yet fantasy setting simulator out there, and that is an inherently appealing concept. Who doesn't want the freedom to just go on adventures with friends in an entirely new world? And of course, a big part of why this works are those friends. Final Fantasy XV has one of the most boring parties in the entire series. There are only four characters, they're all similar aged guys, their personalities aren't particularly unique and could be summarised in a couple words, they have little character development outside of DLC, their backstories are stuck in an anime no one cares about, and this is not Final Fantasy's finest. And yet, at the same time, this is without doubt the most believable group of friends in the series. These characters talk constantly, and their interactions feel realistic. They joke around, they talk about what you're up to, what the weather's like, where you're going, how they're feeling, and sometimes even important things. A lot of this game's exposition and world building happens through this background character dialogue, and this can even be a problem as these characters talk so much that they inevitably get cut off at times, meaning you might miss out. But, as this dialogue all happens in real time, it means you no longer have to pause the game for constant cutscenes anymore, and these regular interactions go a long way towards making whatever you do in-game seem interesting. 
You're not just driving down the same road for the fifth time, you're driving around with the boys. And you're not just doing another boring fetch quest, you're doing another boring fetch quest with the boys. Yeah, it's a good thing these character interactions do often add to what you're up to, because side quests themselves aren't providing much. In both premise and objectives, Final Fantasy XV's side quests are bland and repetitive. It also doesn't make much sense why you're doing most of these tasks in the first place. You're a prince on an important mission, and yet rather than head to your destination, you're off capturing frogs for a local biologist, or looking for materials that can be used to create new types of car paint, and sometimes I'm not even convinced that these quest objectives even matter to the quest givers. It feels a bit like they're all just playing one big game to see who can get the idiot prince to do the most pointless task possible, and it's a game in which everyone's a winner, I guess, except of course, you. The other open world objectives aren't much better. Interacting with key NPCs in road stops unlocks local points of interest, a bit like climbing watchtowers in certain other games, but these points of interest are interesting in name alone, and offer little reward. In fact, most things you can do in this game provide you with very little of substance, as XP itself is plentiful and other upgrades are rare. But at least this means you're not forced into doing any activities you don't want to do, even though good content that is rewarding would still be far better. And yet, for as bad as so much of the side content is in this game, it still provides you with an excuse to spend time with a genuinely enjoyable group of characters while you feel like you're part of this interesting fantasy world. And that is Final Fantasy XV's greatest achievement. In other ways, XV is messy. Final Fantasy XV has action combat, and after 12 and 13 tried so hard to create visually impressive gameplay that they automated half of their combat systems, action combat makes a lot of sense. And while this might have been a first for a mainline Final Fantasy, there were still plenty of other Final Fantasy games that had already used action combat by this point, including several made by 15's director. So action combat itself isn't a problem, and the question that matters is how well does 15 implement it? The answer to that really depends on the specific encounter, as the quality of combat in this game varies. In fact, lots of things vary, and that's one of its positives. There are lots of different enemies, lots of weapons, lots of different special attacks, and vastly different party members you can now switch to freely. This much variety is impressive for an action game, and goes a long way to keeping the gameplay fresh, which considering 15's long length is important. Combat itself is focused on one button to attack, one to dodge, and one to warp to enemies, and yet unlike most games, in 15, you can hold the attack or dodge button to perform these actions continuously. This is a little strange, and makes the player's actions feel slightly disconnected from what their character is actually doing. Pressing one button to perform one action makes it feel like you, the player, are the one doing something, but holding one button while your character acts continuously feels like the character is the one doing the thing, not you. Still, pressing dodge at the right time, rather than holding it, does reduce its MP cost, and there are other active elements, like positioning to avoid enemies, or do blindside attacks, or using directional inputs, or special attacks, or just deciding between attacking, dodging, and warping. Overall, it's still a functional and engaging system that makes the average combat encounter more interesting than in many other Final Fantasy games, and yet there are plenty of below-average combat encounters this time around. There can be camera problems, particularly in more enclosed spaces. Having many enemies attacking you all at once can make keeping track of enemy attacks and finding time to attack yourself overly difficult. And while most attacks are dodgeable through phasing, some are not, and there's no indication to tell you which. This means you often get hit when it doesn't really feel like your fault. And enemies can hit quite hard. Despite this, Final Fantasy XV never feels like a difficult game, as rather than dying when you run out of health, you just go into a down state where you need to use a healing item, and healing items are plentiful, which ultimately means there's little consequence to taking damage.
Difficulty wise, this is fine because Final Fantasy doesn't need to be Dark Souls and combat still challenges you through gameplay. But in terms of how it feels, it's more of a problem as getting hit when it's not your fault isn't very satisfying and there's less sense of mastery over the combat system when you still often take damage cheaply. 15 also struggles with creating great boss fights, something action games usually excel at. The Titan, Leviathan and final boss sequences are incredible in terms of spectacle, but the gameplay in these fights is not and they were clearly designed for spectacle and little else. Finally, this game also has one of the most boring progression systems in the series. It involves earning ability points through various activities and then spending them to unlock different bonuses on a very standard skill tree. And yet, ability points are earned too slowly, meaningful choices are rare after the first few hours, and this is just such a generic system that the fact that it doesn't even have good execution makes it hard not to be disappointed. And so, much like the open world itself, combat is not without its problems, and yet there is still one aspect of this game that manages to be even messier. The story begins as a peace treaty is being agreed between the technologically advanced empire of Niflheim, who have already conquered much of the world, and the kingdom of Lucius, to which Noctus and the boys belong. As a part of this treaty, it's agreed that Noctus will marry Lady Luna Freya, and this is the important mission that marked this journey's start. You are on your way to the more neutral city of Artisia to get married. And yet, merely a few hours into the adventure, Niflheim attacks the capital city of Lucius, killing its king, i.e. Noctis' father, and from here, the story loses direction. You still journey to Altissia, but with constant interruptions that feel like excuses to force you to travel back and forth as much as possible across the now Niflheim-occupied world map. The attack on Lucius also makes the objective of getting married feel a little pointless, as this was meant to be a part of the peace agreement that is now clearly off the table. None of this is helped by the fact that you see almost nothing of the capital city or king of Lucius through which to form an attachment to them, or of Niflheim who receive no in-game introduction and initially seem to be portrayed as the most generic evil empire yet. There's also a clear tonal problem as so much of this game is a light-hearted adventure with the boys, and this is where Final Fantasy XV is at its best. And yet, it only takes a few hours for Noctus to lose his father and kingdom and for the world to be plunged into crisis. And so, the light-hearted half of the game is undermined by the dark and depressing circumstances these characters are meant to be in, while the serious side of this story is undermined by the frequency with which you just hang out in the world and have fun. The first two thirds of the game are set in the open world, but the last third leaves all openness behind and is instead a linear sequence of story events that is sometimes reminiscent of the hallways of Final Fantasy XIII. This last act is where most of the story actually happens, and there's a lot about it that's interesting, with moments of tension and character development between the party, lots of new locations to see, and lots of unpredictability in what will happen next. This then ends with what is one of the better finales in the series, which is still convoluted and hard to follow in story, but otherwise packs a lot of emotion, with some big surprises, impressive set pieces, and clever little details that really make it feel like a strong ending. And yet, for the entire last act of the game, there's a feeling that what you're playing through is unfinished. Even now, after all DLC and improvements. And it's difficult to just enjoy what's there, instead of wondering about what more this game could have been. You travel through the Empire in this section and see locations where it feels like there should be more content and an opportunity to explore, and yet you never can, and some of the story developments feel like they come out of nowhere. I like Final Fantasy XV's story, but it is almost shockingly messy. Some of these problems are caused by the limitations of the open world. In previous Final Fantasy games, if something important happens in the story, you'll tend to be there to witness it. But in 15, you are stuck in the confines of the open world, meaning many of the most important events, like the attack on Lucius, happen off screen, and some of the most important characters, like Luna Freya, are barely seen.
other problems are largely structural. I think if you just changed when Niflheim attacks to being once the party reaches Altissia and then have the party journey back to the capital of Lucius afterwards for story reasons, before going into the linear third act, it would help this game a lot. This way the first act would be journeying to Altissia, where the light-hearted tone and completing side content makes sense. The narrative could still focus on Noctis's coming of age and acquiring the royal arms while meeting Ardyn, all while tension gradually builds as you continue to hear about the peace talks going poorly and the looming threat of war. The marriage would then seem really important as it would be hoped to be the thing which averts disaster. But then, as you finally reach Altissia, everything goes wrong, forcing you to travel back through the same world that's now completely changed by the arrival of Niflheim forces, as the story takes on a darker tone. This would mean the story always has clear direction, and there would be no more tonal problems, and the main world map could be reused in a way that makes it feel fresh. Ideally, the third act would then be expanded as it was surely originally intended to be, but perhaps that is wishing for too much, and once you start wishing for things with this game, it's hard to stop. There is a final cause of narrative problems in Final Fantasy XV, however, and that is the existence of other tie-in media. In the poorly received CGI movie, King's Glaive, the war between Lucius and Niflheim is introduced, the attack on the capital is shown, and characters most notable for their absence in the main game, like Regis, Luna Freya, and Ravus, are all expanded. Meanwhile, a short five-episode anime provides the main party members' backstories, and the DLC provides their character development. This is just scratching the surface of the Final Fantasy XV universe, however, as there's also a fishing game, a retro beat-em-up, an online multiplayer version of the game, a demake of the main game, and more. I think there is a lot that can be criticised here, but I'll limit myself to two things. The first is that the DLC and future updates provided an opportunity to improve the base game, but I think that largely didn't happen because the DLC was designed to fill holes that had been deliberately created for it, rather than addressing already existing problems, and the DLC is not well integrated into the main experience. Meanwhile, many other new features simply serve little point, like having the ability to freely travel in the boat despite there being no content to do with it, with the only big exceptions to this being the improvements made to the game's final dungeon and controlling other party members in combat. It also feels frustrating to see so much additional content being created while the main game itself continues to feel unfinished at times. Still, even worse than this is what the Final Fantasy XV universe seems to represent. I think most people look at what happened here as a story of hubris. It was arrogant to assume people would want to watch an additional movie or anime, and it was foolish to use these tie-ins as a way to deliver important information that isn't in the main game. When people want to play a game, they want to play a game, not watch something else, or take time to research the correct order to view things in, or try to determine what is and isn't worth bothering with. Still, even more than hubris, to me this seems like a betrayal of what Final Fantasy has always been about. There aren't that many things that tie all of these games together, but one aspect which has endured is that each mainline game is designed to be something new that is able to stand on its own. And yet, Final Fantasy XV wasn't designed to stand alone, possibly even from its inception as Final Fantasy vs XIII and undoubtedly in the end product we received in 2016. And I think it paid a heavy price as a result. But I do like Final Fantasy XV. There is so much good here amongst its problems, and it excels in its characters and world, two of the most important things for a Final Fantasy game. It's also the pinnacle of the fantasy road trip with the boys sim genre, and... I'm a fan of this genre, if only there was more than one game in it. Still, it is hard not to view this game through the lens of what it could have been, and I say that as someone who is usually good at not doing that. I like Final Fantasy XV, 
but I would have loved a better Final Fantasy XV. Sometimes though, things don't work out, and sometimes you don't get what you want. And so, after many hours, across many years, we have at last reached the present, where a new Final Fantasy has arrived and history repeats all over again. Final Fantasy XVI, released in June 2023 and features a new combat system, setting, tone, producer, director, composer, and more, just as has come to be expected from a Final Fantasy in the post-PlayStation 1 era. 16 once more returns to a traditional medieval fantasy, but then veers sharply away from the norm by being much darker in tone, subject matter, and often colour palette. This is the first mainline game to get a mature rating, and it features far more sex, violence, and cruelty than any Final Fantasy game that came before, mainline or otherwise. There has been a lot of talk about similarities between Final Fantasy 16 and Game of Thrones, and I think those comparisons make a lot of sense. From the world map, to certain prominent characters, to the heavy focus on politics, or just the more grim depiction of fantasy, this game does feel a lot like Game of Thrones and Final Fantasy had a baby. However, most people make this comparison to imply that it's a negative aspect of Final Fantasy XVI, when I think it's the opposite. There have been 15 Final Fantasy games before this, covering all sorts of different settings and tones, and yet none of them have been like this, and that originality is fresh and exciting. I never thought I'd see the day where a chocobo is graphically beheaded in front of me, and yet, here we are. And while some might say that copying Game of Thrones itself isn't original, there really isn't anything here, apart from maybe the world map design, that actually is copied from Game of Thrones. Of its two parents, this game is clearly more Final Fantasy than Game of Thrones, and those two entities are so wildly different that it's that combination of the two that ends up making 16 feel unique. This game still has all the extravagance, flamboyance and idealism of a JRPG, combined with the setting, subject matter and seriousness so often seen in the modern, cynical grimdark western fantasy that Game of Thrones came out of. And honestly, I struggle to think of any game or piece of media that feels that similar to Final Fantasy XVI. Games like Tactics Ogre and Final Fantasy Tactics are far less Final Fantasy than XVI is, and more War of the Roses than Game of Thrones anyway. Meanwhile, lots of other Japanese dark fantasy is clearly inspired by Berserk, which often puts a heavy focus on horror elements and even surrealism, which 16 doesn't. And other games, including earlier Final Fantasies, simply never commit anywhere near as heavily to the darker elements. And other dark Japanese games never seem to play everything so straight-faced. This game is pretty unique, which doesn't mean that people can't dislike this side of it, everyone has their preferences, but it does at least deserve credit for originality. And yet, many people seem intent to do the opposite. Some have implied that Final Fantasy XVI is selling out by being mature rated, which is a pretty wild claim when games and other media have been desperately trying to avoid higher age ratings for years, not because of artistic reasons, but because it limits sales. Meanwhile, others have said that taking inspiration from Game of Thrones is some kind of betrayal of what Final Fantasy is about, or of its Japanese roots, when this series literally began with an attempt to create a Japanese version of D&D style games, all to differentiate Final Fantasy from the more manga-inspired Dragon Quest. And then Final Fantasy II took incredibly heavy inspiration from Star Wars, and that's just the first two games. Anyway, if Final Fantasy is allowed to copy from Dungeons and & Dragons and Star Wars in the 80s, then I cannot see how taking inspiration from Game of Thrones today is inherently bad or anti-Final Fantasy. There are so many examples of Final Fantasy taking inspiration from other media, 
particularly Western media and culture, that it's basically one of the things that makes this series what it is. Still, to get back to some of the other things that make this series what it is, Final Fantasy XVI is set in a world dominated by huge, towering crystals that provide the populace with magical energy these civilizations have been built upon. Some humans, named bearers, have the ability to cast magic without using crystals, and this ability has led to some prejudice against them, with many being enslaved and used as tools. This is what at least half of Final Fantasy XVI's story is about. The other half focuses on the war between the world's nations, which is driven in large part by a spreading disease known as the Blight that is draining all life from the land, and is often fought through powerful summons that certain individuals can transform into. 16 takes a much harder approach to world building than usual, with concepts like magic, monsters, crystals and summons all having defined explanations and logical impacts on why the world is the way it is, and I think this helps make these elements feel more cohesive and believable while fitting with the game's more serious tone. 16 also has a lot of fun with two of the most prevalent Final Fantasy concepts, summons and crystals. I will admit that I've long thought that crystals are the single most boring reoccurring element in the series, but 16 has shown me the error of my ways. It turns out crystals weren't a problem, they were just always too small. Make them big enough however and they become stunning. The imagery of giant crystals towering over various cities looks phenomenal and there are so many incredible backdrops created by these crystals. This is a good looking game and while its presentation can be noticeably inconsistent, in its bigger moments Final Fantasy XVI delivers on spectacle in a way few games ever have. There was a time when Final Fantasy was regarded as the king of cinematics, but by 15, that wasn't really true anymore. The gap between this series and its competitors decreased, and as graphics became more realistic, the role of high quality cutscenes lessened. Final Fantasy XVI however seems determined to defy industry trends by giving flashy cinematics a starring role again, and it does this with style. What's more, for the first time in the series history, there's finally a combat system that works with this cinematic heavy approach. Like 15 before it, 16 opts for a true action combat system that shows many similarities to games like Devil May Cry. In classic Final Fantasy fashion however, 16 then ups the sense of spectacle by placing a heavy focus on special attacks that all seem to be in competition with each other to see which can create the most particle effects without tanking the frame rate. Occasionally they fail at that last part, but in general combat is fast, fluid and weighty, with attacks that crunch and animations that dazzle. Still, as you unlock more and more special abilities, combat starts to be less about the mechanical side of basic combos and dodging and more about cooldowns and executing specific strategies that rely on the interplay between damaging and staggering enemies. Similar to 13, 16 uses a stagger meter that when charged allows for far higher damage. This means you need to balance your chosen abilities, as you need enough staggering abilities to charge the meter quickly, and enough damaging abilities to be able to capitalize once enemies are staggered. You also need to manage cooldowns so your best abilities are available in stagger windows, while also maybe taking some abilities to help with AoE to quickly clear weaker mobs, and defensive skills to boost your ego in boss fights. There are a lot of abilities in this game, which creates many different combinations, and you can refund your ability points to try out different builds whenever you want. For an action game, Final Fantasy XVI is long, and having so much variety and freedom to experiment helps keep combat engaging, while the stagger system rewards you for using your brain as well as reactions, and overall it's great. I do wish the potion system, which just gets auto refilled any time you die, wasn't so pointless so that successive combat encounters and taking damage had more consequence, and I hate the decision to not allow players to select the harder difficulty from the start. But in many ways, this is a solid combat system. What's more, despite seeming so similar to so many other action games at first, the more you play 16 and unlock more abilities, the more its combat starts to feel like its own thing, which helps it stand out against other action games.
It seems very strange to call this the best combat in the series, when it's so different to most of the other games. But I will say that I have recently played all 16 mainline Final Fantasy games, and this is the only one where I didn't find myself getting bored and zoning out during combat at certain times, and the only one where I still wanted more normal combat even after the credits rolled. And for the record, I say that as someone who loves turn-based games. Still, even more important than all this, might be the way this combat system actually complements the cinematic side of the game. Impressive boss fights have been a part of Final Fantasy's DNA since its NES days, where it was determined to create the most impressive sprites possible. But there was only so much that could be done with a turn-based system, and after Sephiroth used an attack that destroyed the entire solar system before hitting the player, there wasn't really anywhere else to go from there. And even when turn-based games do create very flashy attacks, you still never really feel them. Meanwhile, Final Fantasy XV tried desperately to create a small number of spectacular boss sequences, but the gameplay for these was a mess, which ended up undermining their great visuals. Yet Final Fantasy XVI's combat is completely at home in spectacle-filled boss encounters, and it's here where the game's different strengths combine to create some of the most enjoyable boss sequences I have ever seen in a game. 16 bounces back and forth between ridiculously impressive cinematics and normal combat while using small moments of interactivity as well as gameplay elements like damage numbers to try to blur the line between cutscene and gameplay. But then its boss fights just keep going as both the player and their opposition undergo an almost shonen-esque power-up sequence taking you from human to super saiyan to kaiju vs kaiju extravaganzas and it is so much fun. You feel invested in the story, engaged by the gameplay, and wowed by the visuals, and then to top it all off, there are so many fantastic boss themes. This game has a wealth of different boss tracks, and yet many of these are way longer than they needed to be, with multiple different parts that are often crafted to sync up perfectly with the action, and it all combines into these visual audio narrative set pieces that are an absolute joy. I honestly pity any person who can play through these sequences without feeling that childlike sense of fun and excitement at the obscene totality they provide. So yeah, I think this game is great, and god does it feel good to have a Final Fantasy game that is polished, complete, and stands entirely alone all from day one. I also didn't encounter a single bug when playing this game and I can't remember the last time I played a big budget game at release and experienced that. Like all Final Fantasies though, 16 does have some major problems, and as much as I would like to just end this video here and sleep for a month, that would be a little unfair to all the other games I've already criticised. So, I think 16's problems can best be divided into three main areas. Story, side content, and the world. There is a lot to enjoy about Final Fantasy XVI's story, and its characters in particular feel strong. Clive is a great example of how this game isn't like Game of Thrones, as instead of being some stoic, cynical, world-weary hero you see so often in Western media, he's actually incredibly emotionally open, and shows lots of vulnerability, and is deeply earnest despite all that he goes through, which makes him quite endearing. He's a lot like a loyal golden retriever that's had a really difficult life. Meanwhile, Jill and Joshua are made more interesting by both being gender swapped. In almost every Final Fantasy game, there is a secondary protagonist that is a princess, or something else important, and their innocence is emphasised through the story, while protecting them becomes one of the driving motivations for the main protagonist. This is Terra. Aerith, Renoa, Garnet, Yuna, Ash, Sarah, and Luna Freya. And that character exists in 16 too. It's just they're a prince this time instead of a princess. Jill, on the other hand, takes on the stereotypically male role of best bro that's always at your side, steadfastly supporting you without ever asking for anything in return. And I think all of 16's main characters come across as both likable and believable.
That said, the story's third act feels noticeably weaker than its first two, and its ending also feels far too Final Fantasy, while also failing to create a compelling main antagonist, or reach the same heights as some of the game's earlier moments of spectacle. I also think the story spends too much time on the plight of the bearers and their mistreatment. The awful way bearers are treated in this game is very black and white, and over the top in its depiction, which ultimately means there's little depth to it, and so we just spend our time learning that bearers are treated badly, again and again and again, when I think most people got the message after the first few hours. And this leads into the much bigger problem of side content. Side quests in Final Fantasy XVI are terrible. I know there are some interesting ones at the end of the long, gruelling road, and I did complete every side quest in the game to be thorough, but the average side quest is just a waste of the player's time. The objectives you're asked to do aren't interesting. The stories these side quests tell are very one note, with many just being about how bearers are treated badly, while most of the later quests are overly sentimental and seem to exist just to tell you how amazing the various NPCs in the hideout are. Meanwhile, the actual experience of completing side quests is mostly just sitting around watching people speak, which is something the main story already has more than enough of. And speaking of the main story, the side quests also hurt its pacing by frequently robbing it of momentum. Side quests are so bad in this game that I not only think Final Fantasy XVI would be better if it simply removed at least half of its side quests, preferably the worst half, but I actually think this game would have a higher Metacritic and user score if it just removed most of the side quests, because they don't simply fail to add to the game, they actively hurt its better parts. This is the opposite of Final Fantasy XV, where its bad side quests still helped because they gave you an excuse to spend time in the world just hanging out with the party. In XVI, however, your companions almost never speak outside of main story missions, which is a massive missed opportunity to show the more light-hearted side to these characters and make side content more enjoyable. And it also feels a bit jarring after playing 15. Party members interacting as you run around is such a beneficial thing to add to a game, and I think the only reason 16 neglects this is because there are some sections where companions leave, meaning you might do side content when no one's around, and so most were just designed as if no one else was around to begin with. 16's final major problem is the world and how you interact with it. I have come to believe that there are three main pillars of a Final Fantasy game, which are story, combat, and spending time in the world being immersed in the experience. Final Fantasy XVI neglects this last pillar, and while the story and combat are often great, I spent much of the experience wishing I could just go see more of the world. The open world sections that do exist feel overly small and eventually involve too much backtracking, and I think this game would benefit immensely from expanding each of these areas while providing more incentives and rewards to just get out into the world and explore. More chests, more item upgrades, maybe an actually good crafting system where you have to hunt down specific enemies for materials, side quests that you can discover outside the main hubs, and so on. The main story is very linear, and current side quests just involve watching people speak, so what 16 really needed was more content that is not linear and doesn't involve just listening to people to help round the experience out, particularly if you added in some more companion dialogue to go with it. Still, at least this game doesn't have an unnecessary minimap, which actually makes me wonder if the gaming industry might be finally healing. Overall though, I think this is a great game, and a great Final Fantasy, and some of the backlash it's received for action combat, or Game of Thrones, or no open world, or not enough RPG, would be surprising to me, if I wasn't old enough to have seen this same thing happen again and again for every mainline Final Fantasy that has released since 10. So, I guess it's time to get to the point of this video.
Final Fantasy is many different things to many different people. With 16 wildly varied mainline games, this alone makes it a series unlike almost any other. And this has resulted in something I've come to think of as the Final Fantasy Curse. There are a lot of good things about this series, but its best quality is easily its originality and the differences between these games. This is something that was there from the start. Final Fantasy was designed to be different from its inception, and this was something that was cemented with its first sequel after the decision was made to go against the norm and create an entirely new story, world and progression system. And from then, with perhaps the singular exception of Final Fantasy V, this has been a recurrent part of the series with every new entry. Don't be deceived by the visual similarities in earlier games. Final Fantasy III took the series from a dark, serious story to something light-hearted. It turned huge labyrinthian dungeons into short, linear ones. It lowered the difficulty massively. It took the overworld from open to closed, and it added in auto-targeting, forever changing the core gameplay. This was a massive departure, and yet Final Fantasy IV might have been even more so. Being the first game to add action elements to combat, and the first game to force you to play as a predefined character rather than a custom one, and the first game to greatly streamline the RPG elements and remove all customization of characters, with the only RPG mechanic left being earning XP and gaining levels, something seen in all sorts of games. But if 4 was big, 6 has to be even bigger, as it completely changed the focus from dungeons and gameplay to story and cinematics, creating a game where you spend far longer reading dialogue than before, with gameplay that was more straightforward and prioritised flashy animations rather than strategic depth. So, in modern terminology, Final Fantasy III was a massive casualization of the series, Final Fantasy IV removed all its RPG elements, and Final Fantasy VI turned the series into a movie game where you just watch cutscenes. All huge portrayals of everything Final Fantasy was built on, all changes designed to appeal to new players rather than old, and all changes that sacrificed some element of what made this series work. And yet these were all changes that had incredible upsides, which created entirely new experiences and are the reasons that many people came to be fans of the series. That is how Final Fantasy has always been, and long may it continue. If you look around at the gaming industry, or movies, or TV, or music, or YouTube, or anything where people make money, you will see a whole lot of copying what works and doing the same thing again and again as much as possible. When someone finds something that's successful, they stick with it. When someone else sees something that's successful, they copy it. This is how the world works, because that's what makes the most money. And in gaming in particular, this has come to be more and more evident as times went on. The current industry is choked with remakes, reboots, remasters, and derivative sequels. Even some of the greatest series and greatest developers often create incredibly risk-averse, safe, and formulaic games. They give people exactly what's expected, and often they're praised for doing so. And in many ways, this isn't their fault, it's ours. Society doesn't really value originality. We pretend that we do, but the numbers tell a different story. And the real reason all those sequels and remakes exist is because that's what most people buy or watch or play. It's what's most profitable. And then you have Final Fantasy. This wasn't a series that tried to be some paragon of artistic creation. Really, this is all because Sakaguchi just really hated sequels, in combination with a long-running desire to try to always move the series forward. Still, regardless of the why, the end result is still that Final Fantasy is one of the most innovative, original, and diverse series in all of gaming, and it has repeatedly taken massive risks and made bold departures while often being heavily criticised for doing so. And that is what's happened.
All the way back since 7, people have been vocally and passionately disliking these games for being different to what came before. And if the internet had been around and earlier games were released outside of Japan, I guarantee you this would have started even before this. And in many ways, it's understandable. When people become a fan of something, they don't want to see it change. They are a fan precisely because they like what it is already. And yet not only do these games change continuously, but people also go into new games with expectations derived from previous ones, where they then start to judge them not for what they are, but what they aren't. From 12 onwards, this can be seen so clearly, and everyone who was around on the internet during these games' releases will remember it. Final Fantasy XII was passionately hated for having MMO gameplay. 13 was crucified for its linearity. 15 was called a generic Ubisoft open world game, and 16 is now a sellout Game of Thrones inspired action game, and all of these were considered to be great portrayals of the series, often with the exact same arguments being made. And yet, if we look at these four games in particular, you will see four games that feel incredibly unique, not just within the series, but within all of gaming. Entirely new combat systems, completely different structures, different aesthetics, different vibes helped by each one having an entirely new composer, and cumulatively, they each feel so memorable. And, while they do have their problems, they each have their positives too. Ultimately though, it is their differences that end up making them great. And that's true for the entire series. And yet, these differences are what garner the most criticism. That is the Final Fantasy curse, that its best quality is what it's most criticised for. And that is why I think Final Fantasy might be slightly underrated. People have been overly critical of this series for changing for years, and yet really, there are few things more praiseworthy than originality and innovation. And if you don't agree, well, give it a few more years as the industry lumbers ever forward towards this deluge of remakes and derivative sequels, because I think time might be on my side. I love this series. I remember the first game I played, and how it made me feel. I remember an experience unlike any I'd ever had before. How I was whisked away by this sprawling epic adventure, where I had no idea what to expect, and none of the cynicism brought by age. And it was magical. I can't get that same experience from the newer games. I'm not nine years old anymore. But for every game that has released since, I can easily imagine someone else, someone young, playing their first Final Fantasy with no expectations, just like I did once upon a time, and falling in love. Because they don't care that there's less party focus, or that it's open world, or overly linear, or removed turn-based gameplay, or is an MMO, or has no overworld, or cartoonish character designs, or is too anime, or no longer fantasy, or any of that. They love it for what it is, not what it isn't. And one day, they might become the angry person on the internet forum attacking the series for how it's changed. But there'll be someone else out there, someone young, playing their first Final Fantasy, and everything will repeat all over again. It's the circle of life. I think this series is special. And I find it a little disappointing how many people are so quick to praise the games from their childhood, yet so quick to dismiss those from someone else's. Some of these games might be better than others. But if you ever take the time to play all 16 games in a row, you might be surprised just how flawed every single game here can be and how easy they can be to enjoy regardless. Thank you for watching.